Chapter 14 Chiloé and Concepcion, Great Earthquake San Carlos, Chiloé, Osorna in eruption Contemporaneously with Aconcagua and Cosagina, ride to Tsutsau, impenetrable forests, Valdivia Indians, earthquake, Concepcion, great earthquake, rocks fissured, appearance of the former towns, the sea black and boiling, direction of the vibrations, stones twisted round, great wave, permanent elevation of the land, area of volcanic phenomena, the connection between the elevatory and eruptive forces, cause of earthquakes, slow elevation of mountain chains. On January the 15th we sailed from Lowe's Harbor, and three days afterwards anchored a second time in the Bay of S. Carlos in Chiloé. On the night of the 19th the volcano of Osorna was in action. At midnight the sentry observed something like a large star, which gradually increased in size till about three o'clock, when it presented a very magnificent spectacle. By the aid of a glass, dark objects, in constant succession, were seen, in the midst of a great glare of red light, to be thrown up and to fall down. The light was sufficient to cast on the water a long bright reflection. Large masses of molten matter seem very commonly to be cast out of the craters in this part of the cordillera. I was assured that when the Corcovado is in eruption, great masses are projected upwards and are seen to burst in the air, assuming many fantastical forms, such as trees, their size must be immense. For they can be distinguished from the high land behind S. Carlos, which is no less than 93 miles from the Corcovado. In the morning the volcano became tranquil. I was surprised at hearing afterwards that Aconcagua in Chile, 480 miles northwards, was in action on the same night. And still more surprised to hear that the great eruption of Cosagina, 2,700 miles north of Aconcagua, accompanied by an earthquake felt over a 1,000 miles. Also occurred within six hours of this same time. This coincidence is the more remarkable, as Cosagina had been dormant for 26 years, and Aconcagua most rarely shows any signs of action. It is difficult even to conjecture whether this coincidence was accidental, or shows some subterranean connection. If Vesuvius, Etna, and Hecla in Iceland, all three relatively nearer each other than the corresponding points in South America, suddenly burst forth in eruption on the same night. The coincidence would be thought remarkable. But it is far more remarkable in this case, where the three vents fall on the same great mountain chain, and where the vast plains along the entire eastern coast. And the upraised recent shells along more than 2,000 miles on the western coast, show in how equable and connected a manner the elevatory forces have acted. Captain Fitzroy being anxious that some bearings should be taken on the outer coast of Chiloé, it was planned that Mr. King and myself should ride to Castro, and thence across the island to the Capella de Tsutsau, situated on the west coast. Having hired horses and a guide, we set out on the morning of the 22nd. We had not proceeded far, before we were joined by a woman and two boys, who were bent on the same journey. Everyone on this road acts on a hail-fellow-well-met fashion. And one may here enjoy the privilege, so rare in South America, of traveling without firearms. At first, the country consisted of a succession of hills and valleys, nearer to Castro it became very level. The road itself is a curious affair. It consists in its whole length, with the exception of very few parts, of great logs of wood, which are either broad and laid longitudinally, or narrow and placed transversely. In summer the road is not very bad, but in winter, when the wood is rendered slippery from rain, traveling is exceedingly difficult. At that time of the year, the ground on each side becomes a morass, and is often overflowed, hence it is necessary that the longitudinal logs should be fastened down by transverse poles, which are pegged on each side into the earth. These pegs render a fall from a horse dangerous, as the chance of alighting on one of them is not small. It is remarkable, however, how active custom has made the Killeton horses. In crossing bad parts, where the logs had been displaced, they skipped from one to the other, almost with the quickness and certainty of a dog. On both hands the road is bordered by the lofty forest trees, with their bases matted together by canes. 
When occasionally a long reach of this avenue could be beheld, it presented a curious scene of uniformity, the white line of logs, narrowing in perspective, became hidden by the gloomy forest. Or terminated in a zigzag which ascended some steep hill. Although the distance from S. Carlos to Castro is only twelve leagues in a straight line, the formation of the road must have been a great labor. I was told that several people had formerly lost their lives in attempting to cross the forest. The first who succeeded was an Indian, who cut his way through the canes in eight days, and reached S. Carlos, he was rewarded by the Spanish government with a grant of land. During the summer, many of the Indians wander about the forests, but chiefly in the higher parts. Where the woods are not quite so thick, in search of the half-wild cattle which live on the leaves of the cane and certain trees. It was one of these huntsmen who by chance discovered, a few years since, an English vessel, which had been wrecked on the outer coast. The crew were beginning to fail in provisions, and it is not probable that, without the aid of this man, they would ever have extricated themselves from these scarcely penetrable woods. As it was, one seaman died on the march, from fatigue. The Indians in these excursions steer by the sun, so that if there is a continuance of cloudy weather, they cannot travel. The day was beautiful, and the number of trees which were in full flower perfumed the air, yet even this could hardly dissipate the effects of the gloomy dampness of the forest. Moreover, the many dead trunks that stand like skeletons, never fail to give to these primeval woods a character of solemnity, absent in those of countries long civilized. Shortly after sunset we bivouacked for the night. Our female companion, who was rather good-looking, belonged to one of the most respectable families in Castro, she rode, however, astride, and without shoes or stockings. I was surprised at the total want of pride shown by her and her brother. They brought food with them, but at all our meals sat watching Mr. King and myself whilst eating, till we were fairly shamed into feeding the whole party. The night was cloudless. And while lying in our beds, we enjoyed the sight, and it is a high enjoyment, of the multitude of stars which illumined the darkness of the forest. January 23rd. We rose early in the morning, and reached the pretty quiet town of Castro by two o'clock. The old governor had died since our last visit, and a Chileno was acting in his place. We had a letter of introduction to Don Pedro, whom we found exceedingly hospitable and kind, and more disinterested than is usual on this side of the continent. The next day Don Pedro procured us fresh horses, and offered to accompany us himself. We proceeded to the south, generally following the coast, and passing through several hamlets, each with its large barn-like chapel built of wood. At Villa Pillai, Don Pedro asked the commandant to give us a guide to Tsutsau. The old gentleman offered to come himself. But for a long time nothing would persuade him that two Englishmen really wished to go to such an out-of-the-way place as Tsutsau. We were thus accompanied by the two greatest aristocrats in the country, as was plainly to be seen in the manner of all the poorer Indians towards them. At Chanchi we struck across the island, following intricate winding paths, sometimes passing through magnificent forests, and sometimes through pretty cleared spots. Abounding with corn and potato crops. This undulating woody country, partially cultivated, reminded me of the wilder parts of England, and therefore had to my eye a most fascinating aspect. At Vilinko, which is situated on the borders of the Lake of Tsutsau, only a few fields were cleared, and all the inhabitants appeared to be Indians. This lake is twelve miles long, and runs in an east and west direction. From local circumstances, the sea breeze blows very regularly during the day, and during the night it falls calm, this has given rise to strange exaggerations, for the phenomenon. As described to us at S. Carlos, was quite a prodigy. The road to Tsutsau was so very bad that we determined to embark in a periagua. The commandant, in the most authoritative manner, ordered six Indians to get ready to pull us over, without deigning to tell them whether they would be paid. The periagua is a strange rough boat, but the crew were still stranger, I doubt if six uglier little men ever got into a boat together. They pulled, however, very well and cheerfully. 
The stroke oarsman gabbled Indian and uttered strange cries, much after the fashion of a pig driver driving his pigs. We started with a light breeze against us, but yet reached the Capella de Tsutsau before it was late. The country on each side of the lake was one unbroken forest. In the same periagua with us, a cow was embarked. To get so large an animal into a small boat appears at first a difficulty, but the Indians managed it in a minute. They brought the cow alongside the boat, which was heeled towards her. Then placing two oars under her belly, with their ends resting on the gunwale, by the aid of these levers they fairly tumbled the poor beast heels overhead into the bottom of the boat. And then lashed her down with ropes. At Tsutsa we found an uninhabited hovel, which is the residence of the padre when he pays this capella a visit, where, lighting a fire, we cooked our supper, and were very comfortable. The district of Tsutsao is the only inhabited part on the whole west coast of Chilawe. It contains about thirty or forty Indian families, who are scattered along four or five miles of the shore. They are very much secluded from the rest of Chilawe, and have scarcely any sort of commerce, except sometimes in a little oil, which they get from seal blubber. They are tolerably dressed in clothes of their own manufacture, and they have plenty to eat. They seemed, however, discontented, yet humble to a degree which it was quite painful to witness. These feelings are, I think, chiefly to be attributed to the harsh and authoritative manner in which they are treated by their rulers. Our companions, although so very civil to us, behave to the poor Indians as if they had been slaves, rather than free men. They ordered provisions and the use of their horses, without ever condescending to say how much, or indeed whether the owners should be paid at all. In the morning, being left alone with these poor people, we soon ingratiated ourselves by presents of cigars and mate. A lump of white sugar was divided between all present, and tasted with the greatest curiosity. The Indians ended all their complaints by saying, and it is only because we are poor Indians, and know nothing, but it was not so when we had a king. The next day after breakfast, we rode a few miles northward to Punta Huantamo. The road lay along a very broad beach, on which, even after so many fine days, a terrible surf was breaking. I was assured that after a heavy gale, the roar can be heard at night even at Castro, a distance of no less than twenty-one sea miles across a hilly and wooded country. We had some difficulty in reaching the point, owing to the intolerably bad paths, for everywhere in the shade the ground soon becomes a perfect quagmire. The point itself is a bold rocky hill. It is covered by a plant allied, I believe, to bromelia, and called by the inhabitants chapones. In scrambling through the beds, our hands were very much scratched. I was amused by observing the precaution our Indian guide took, in turning up his trousers, thinking that they were more delicate than his own hard skin. This plant bears a fruit, in shape like an artichoke, in which a number of seed vessels are packed, these contain a pleasant sweet pulp, here much esteemed. I saw at Lowe's Harbor the Kilatans making shishi, or cider, with this fruit, so true is it, as Humboldt remarks. That almost everywhere man finds means of preparing some kind of beverage from the vegetable kingdom. The savages, however, of Tierra del Fuego, and I believe of Australia, have not advanced thus far in the arts. The coast to the north of Punta Huantamo is exceedingly rugged and broken, and is fronted by many breakers, on which the sea is eternally roaring. Mr. King and myself were anxious to return, if it had been possible, on foot along this coast, but even the Indians said it was quite impracticable. We were told that men have crossed by striking directly through the woods from Tsutsao to S. Carlos, but never by the coast. On these expeditions, the Indians carry with them only roasted corn, and of this they eat sparingly twice a day. 26th. Re-embarking in the Periagua, we returned across the lake, and then mounted our horses. The whole of Chilawe took advantage of this week of unusually fine weather, to clear the ground by burning. In every direction volumes of smoke were curling upwards. Although the inhabitants were so assiduous in setting fire to every part of the wood, yet I did not see a single fire which they had succeeded in making extensive. We dined with our friend the commandant, 
and did not reach Castro till after dark. The next morning we started very early. After having ridden for some time, we obtained from the brow of a steep hill an extensive view, and it is a rare thing on this road, of the great forest. Over the horizon of trees, the volcano of Corcovado, and the great flat-topped one to the north, stood out in proud preeminence, scarcely another peak in the long range showed its snowy summit. I hope it will be long before I forget this farewell view of the magnificent cordillera fronting Chiloé. At night we bivouacked under a cloudless sky, and the next morning reached S. Carlos. We arrived on the right day, for before evening heavy rain commenced. February 4 th, sailed from Chiloé. During the last week I made several short excursions. One was to examine a great bed of now existing shells, elevated 350 feet above the level of the sea, from among these shells, large forest trees were growing. Another ride was to P. Huchukyukwi. I had with me a guide who knew the country far too well, for he would pertinaciously tell me endless Indian names for every little point, rivulet, and creek. In the same manner as in Tierra del Fuego, the Indian language appears singularly well adapted for attaching names to the most trivial features of the land. I believe everyone was glad to say farewell to Chilaway, yet if we could forget the gloom and ceaseless rain of winter, Chilaue might pass for a charming island. There is also something very attractive in the simplicity and humble politeness of the poor inhabitants. We steered northward along shore, but owing to thick weather did not reach Valdivia till the night of the 8th. The next morning the boat proceeded to the town, which is distant about 10 miles. We followed the course of the river, occasionally passing a few hovels, and patches of ground cleared out of the otherwise unbroken forest, and sometimes meeting a canoe with an Indian family. The town is situated on the low banks of the stream, and is so completely buried in a wood of apple trees that the streets are merely paths in an orchard. I have never seen any country, where apple trees appeared to thrive so well as in this damp part of South America, on the borders of the roads there were many young trees evidently self-grown. In Chiloé the inhabitants possess a marvelously short method of making an orchard. At the lower part of almost every branch, small, conical, brown, wrinkled points project, these are always ready to change into roots, as may sometimes be seen. Where any mud has been accidentally splashed against the tree. A branch as thick as a man's thigh is chosen in the early spring, and is cut off just beneath a group of these points, all the smaller branches are lopped off. And it is then placed about two feet deep in the ground. During the ensuing summer the stump throws out long shoots, and sometimes even bears fruit, I was shown one which had produced as many as twenty-three apples, but this was thought very unusual. In the third season the stump is changed, as I have myself seen, into a well-wooded tree, loaded with fruit. An old man near Valdivia illustrated his motto, Necesidad es la madre del invention, by giving an account of the several useful things he manufactured from his apples. After making cider, and likewise wine, he extracted from the refuse a white and finely flavored spirit, by another process he procured a sweet treacle, or, as he called it, honey. His children and pigs seemed almost to live, during this season of the year, in his orchard. February 11th. I set out with a guide on a short ride, in which, however, I managed to see singularly little, either of the geology of the country or of its inhabitants. There is not much cleared land near Valdivia, after crossing a river at the distance of a few miles, we entered the forest, and then passed only one miserable hovel. Before reaching our sleeping place for the night. The short difference in latitude, of 150 miles, has given a new aspect to the forest compared with that of Chiloé. This is owing to a slightly different proportion in the kinds of trees. The evergreens do not appear to be quite so numerous, and the forest in consequence has a brighter tint. As in Chiloé, the lower parts are matted together by canes, here also another kind, resembling the bamboo of Brazil and about twenty feet in height, grows in clusters. And ornaments the banks of some of the streams in a very pretty manner. It is with this plant that the Indians make their chuzos, or long tapering spears. 
Our resting house was so dirty that I preferred sleeping outside, on these journeys the first night is generally very uncomfortable. Because one is not accustomed to the tickling and biting of the fleas. I am sure, in the morning, there was not a space on my legs the size of a shilling which had not its little red mark where the flea had feasted. Twelfth. We continued to ride through the uncleared forest, only occasionally meeting an Indian on horseback, or a troop of fine mules bringing alerseplanks and corn from the southern plains. In the afternoon one of the horses knocked up, we were then on a brow of a hill, which commanded a fine view of the Llanos. The view of these open plains was very refreshing, after being hemmed in and buried in the wilderness of trees. The uniformity of a forest soon becomes very wearisome. This west coast makes me remember with pleasure the free, unbounded plains of Patagonia, yet, with the true spirit of contradiction, I cannot forget how sublime is the silence of the forest. The Llanos are the most fertile and thickly peopled parts of the country, as they possess the immense advantage of being nearly free from trees. Before leaving the forest we crossed some flat little lawns, around which single trees stood, as in an English park, I have often noticed with surprise, in wooded undulatory districts. That the quite level parts have been destitute of trees. On account of the tired horse, I determined to stop at the mission of Cutico, to the friar of which I had a letter of introduction. Cutico is an intermediate district between the forest and the Llanos. There are a good many cottages, with patches of corn and potatoes, nearly all belonging to Indians. The tribes dependent on Valdivia are Reducidos y Cristianos. The Indians farther northward, about Araco and Imperial, are still very wild, and not converted. But they have all much intercourse with the Spaniards. The Padre said that the Christian Indians did not much like coming to Mass, but that otherwise they showed respect for religion. The greatest difficulty is in making them observe the ceremonies of marriage. The wild Indians take as many wives as they can support, and a cacique will sometimes have more than ten, on entering his house, the number may be told by that of the separate fires. Each wife lives a week in turn with the cacique, but all are employed in weaving ponchos, etc., for his profit. To be the wife of a cacique, is an honor much sought after by the Indian women. The men of all these tribes wear a coarse woolen poncho, those south of Valdivia wear short trousers, and those north of it a petticoat, like the chilipa of the gauchos. All have their long hair bound by a scarlet fillet, but with no other covering on their heads. These Indians are good-sized men. Their cheekbones are prominent, and in general appearance they resemble the great American family to which they belong. But their physiognomy seemed to me to be slightly different from that of any other tribe which I had before seen. Their expression is generally grave, and even austere, and possesses much character, this may pass either for honest bluntness or fierce determination. The long black hair, the grave and much-lined features, and the dark complexion, called to my mind old portraits of James I. On the road we met with none of that humble politeness so universal in Chile Some gave their Mari Mari, good morning, with promptness, but the greater number did not seem inclined to offer any salute. This independence of manners is probably a consequence of their long wars, and the repeated victories which they alone, of all the tribes in America, have gained over the Spaniards. I spent the evening very pleasantly, talking with the Padre. He was exceedingly kind and hospitable, and coming from Santiago, had contrived to surround himself with some few comforts. Being a man of some little education, he bitterly complained of the total want of society. With no particular zeal for religion, no business or pursuit, how completely must this man's life be wasted. The next day, on our return, we met seven very wild-looking Indians. Of whom some were caciques that had just received from the Chilean government their yearly small stipend for having long remained faithful. They were fine-looking men, and they rode one after the other, with most gloomy faces. An old cacique, who headed them, had been, I suppose, more excessively drunk than the rest, for he seemed extremely grave and very crabbed. Shortly before this, two Indians joined us, who were traveling from a distant mission to Valdivia concerning some lawsuit. One was a good-humored old man, 
but from his wrinkled beardless face looked more like an old woman than a man. I frequently presented both of them with cigars. And though ready to receive them, and I dare say grateful, they would hardly condescend to thank me. A Killeton Indian would have taken off his hat, and given his, Dios le page. The traveling was very tedious, both from the badness of the roads, and from the number of great fallen trees, which it was necessary either to leap over or to avoid by making long circuits. We slept on the road, and next morning reached Valdivia, whence I proceeded on board. A few days afterwards I crossed the bay with a party of officers, and landed near the fort called Nibla. The buildings were in a most ruinous state, and the gun carriages quite rotten. Mr. Wickham remarked to the commanding officer, that with one discharge they would certainly all fall to pieces. The poor man, trying to put a good face upon it, gravely replied, No, I am sure, sir, they would stand too. The Spaniards must have intended to have made this place impregnable. There is now lying in the middle of the courtyard a little mountain of mortar, which rivals in hardness the rock on which it is placed. It was brought from Chile, and cost seven thousand dollars. The revolution having broken out, prevented its being applied to any purpose, and now it remains a monument of the fallen greatness of Spain. I wanted to go to a house about a mile and a half distant, but my guide said it was quite impossible to penetrate the wood in a straight line. He offered, however, to lead me, by following obscure cattle tracks, the shortest way, the walk, nevertheless, took no less than three hours. This man is employed in hunting strayed cattle. Yet, well as he must know the woods, he was not long since lost for two whole days, and had nothing to eat. These facts convey a good idea of the impracticability of the forests of these countries. A question often occurred to me, how long does any vestige of a fallen tree remain? This man showed me one which a party of fugitive royalists had cut down fourteen years ago. And taking this as a criterion, I should think a bowl a foot and a half in diameter would in thirty years be changed into a heap of mold. February 20th. This day has been memorable in the annals of Valdivia, for the most severe earthquake experienced by the oldest inhabitant. I happened to be on shore, and was lying down in the wood to rest myself. It came on suddenly, and lasted two minutes, but the time appeared much longer. The rocking of the ground was very sensible. The undulations appeared to my companion and myself to come from due east. Whilst others thought they proceeded from southwest, this shows how difficult it sometimes is to perceive the directions of the vibrations. There was no difficulty in standing upright, but the motion made me almost giddy, it was something like the movement of a vessel in a little cross ripple. Or still more like that felt by a person skating over thin ice, which bends under the weight of his body. A bad earthquake at once destroys our oldest associations, the earth, the very emblem of solidity, has moved beneath our feet like a thin crust over a fluid. One second of time has created in the mind a strange idea of insecurity, which hours of reflection would not have produced. In the forest, as a breeze moved the trees, I felt only the earth tremble, but saw no other effect. Captain Fitzroy and some officers were at the town during the shock, and there the scene was more striking. For although the houses, from being built of wood, did not fall, they were violently shaken, and the boards creaked and rattled together. The people rushed out of doors in the greatest alarm. It is these accompaniments that create that perfect horror of earthquakes, experienced by all who have thus seen, as well as felt, their effects. Within the forest it was a deeply interesting, but by no means an awe-exciting phenomenon. The tides were very curiously affected. The great shock took place at the time of low water. And an old woman who was on the beach told me that the water flowed very quickly, but not in great waves, to high water mark, and then as quickly returned to its proper level. This was also evident by the line of wet sand. The same kind of quick but quiet movement in the tide happened a few years since at Chiloé, during a slight earthquake, and created much causeless alarm. In the course of the evening there were many weaker shocks, which seemed to produce in the harbour the most complicated currents, and some of great strength. March 4th. 
we entered the harbor of Concepcion. While the ship was beating up to the anchorage, I landed on the island of Quiriquina. The mayor domo of the estate quickly rode down to tell me the terrible news of the great earthquake of the 20th, that not a house in Concepcion or Talcahuano, the port, was standing. That seventy villages were destroyed, and that a great wave had almost washed away the ruins of Talcahuano. Of this latter statement I soon saw abundant proofs, the whole coast being strewed over with timber and furniture as if a thousand ships had been wrecked. Besides chairs, tables, bookshelves, etc. In great numbers, there were several roofs of cottages, which had been transported almost whole. The storehouses at Talcahuano had been burst open, and great bags of cotton, yerba, and other valuable merchandise were scattered on the shore. During my walk round the island, I observed that numerous fragments of rock, which, from the marine productions adhering to them, must recently have been lying in deep water, had been cast up high on the beach. One of these was six feet long, three broad, and two thick. The island itself as plainly showed the overwhelming power of the earthquake, as the beach did that of the consequent great wave. The ground in many parts was fissured in north and south lines, perhaps caused by the yielding of the parallel and steep sides of this narrow island. Some of the fissures near the cliffs were a yard wide. Many enormous masses had already fallen on the beach, and the inhabitants thought that when the rains commenced far greater slips would happen. The effect of the vibration on the hard primary slate, which composes the foundation of the island, was still more curious, the superficial parts of some narrow ridges were as completely shivered as if they had been blasted by gunpowder. This effect, which was rendered conspicuous by the fresh fractures and displaced soil, must be confined to near the surface. For otherwise there would not exist a block of solid rock throughout Chile. Nor is this improbable, as it is known that the surface of a vibrating body is affected differently from the central part. It is, perhaps, owing to this same reason, that earthquakes do not cause quite such terrific havoc within deep mines as would be expected. I believe this convulsion has been more effectual in lessening the size of the island of Quiriquina, than the ordinary wear and tear of the sea and weather during the course of a whole century. The next day I landed at Talcahuano, and afterwards rode to Concepcion. Both towns presented the most awful yet interesting spectacle I ever beheld. To a person who had formerly known them, it possibly might have been still more impressive. For the ruins were so mingled together, and the whole scene possessed so little the air of a habitable place, that it was scarcely possible to imagine its former condition. The earthquake commenced at half-past eleven o'clock in the forenoon. If it had happened in the middle of the night, the greater number of the inhabitants, which in this one province must amount to many thousands, must have perished. Instead of less than a hundred, as it was, the invariable practice of running out of doors at the first trembling of the ground, alone saved them. In Concepcion each house, or row of houses, stood by itself, a heap or line of ruins. But in Talcahuano, owing to the great wave, little more than one layer of bricks, tiles, and timber with here and there part of a wall left standing, could be distinguished. From this circumstance Concepcion, although not so completely desolated, was a more terrible, and if I may so call it, picturesque sight. The first shock was very sudden. The mayor domo at Quiriquina told me, that the first notice he received of it, was finding both the horse he rode and himself, rolling together on the ground. Rising up, he was again thrown down. He also told me that some cows which were standing on the steep side of the island were rolled into the sea. The great wave caused the destruction of many cattle. On one low island near the head of the bay, seventy animals were washed off and drowned. It is generally thought that this has been the worst earthquake ever recorded in Chile. But as the very severe ones occur only after long intervals, this cannot easily be known, nor indeed would a much worse shock have made any difference, for the ruin was now complete. Innumerable small tremblings followed the great earthquake, and within the first twelve days no less than three hundred were counted. After viewing Concepcion, I cannot understand how the greater number of inhabitants escaped unhurt. The houses in many parts fell outwards. 
thus forming in the middle of the streets little hillocks of brickwork and rubbish. Mr. Rouse, the English consul, told us that he was at breakfast when the first movement warned him to run out. He had scarcely reached the middle of the courtyard, when one side of his house came thundering down. He retained presence of mind to remember, that if he once got on the top of that part which had already fallen, he would be safe. Not being able from the motion of the ground to stand, he crawled up on his hands and knees. And no sooner had he ascended this little eminence, than the other side of the house fell in, the great beam sweeping close in front of his head. With his eyes blinded, and his mouth choked with the cloud of dust which darkened the sky, at last he gained the street. As shock succeeded shock, at the interval of a few minutes, no one dared approach the shattered ruins. And no one knew whether his dearest friends and relations were not perishing from the want of help. Those who had saved any property were obliged to keep a constant watch, for thieves prowled about, and at each little trembling of the ground. With one hand they beat their breasts and cried, Misericordia! And then with the other filched what they could from the ruins. The thatched roofs fell over the fires, and flames burst forth in all parts. Hundreds knew themselves ruined, and few had the means of providing food for the day. Earthquakes alone are sufficient to destroy the prosperity of any country. If beneath England the now inert subterranean forces should exert those powers, which most assuredly in former geological ages they have exerted, how completely would the entire condition of the country be changed? What would become of the lofty houses, thickly packed cities, great manufactories, the beautiful public and private edifices? If the new period of disturbance were first to commence by some great earthquake in the dead of the night, how terrific would be the carnage! England would at once be bankrupt. All papers, records, and accounts would from that moment be lost. Government being unable to collect the taxes, and failing to maintain its authority, the hand of violence and rapine would remain uncontrolled. In every large town famine would go forth, pestilence and death following in its train. Shortly after the shock, a great wave was seen from the distance of three or four miles, approaching in the middle of the bay with a smooth outline. But along the shore it tore up cottages and trees, as it swept onwards with irresistible force. At the head of the bay it broke in a fearful line of white breakers, which rushed up to a height of twenty-three vertical feet above the highest spring tides. Their force must have been prodigious. For at the fort a cannon with its carriage, estimated at four tons in weight, was moved fifteen feet inwards. A schooner was left in the midst of the ruins, two hundred yards from the beach. The first wave was followed by two others, which in their retreat carried away a vast wreck of floating objects. In one part of the bay, a ship was pitched high and dry on shore, was carried off, again driven on shore, and again carried off. In another part, two large vessels anchored near together were whirled about, and their cables were thrice wound round each other. Though anchored at a depth of thirty-six feet, they were for some minutes aground. The great wave must have travelled slowly, for the inhabitants of Talcahuano had time to run up the hills behind the town. And some sailors pulled out seaward, trusting successfully to their boat riding securely over the swell, if they could reach it before it broke. One old woman with a little boy, four or five years old, ran into a boat, but there was nobody to row it out, the boat was consequently dashed against an anchor and cut in twain. The old woman was drowned, but the child was picked up some hours afterwards clinging to the wreck. Pools of salt water were still standing amidst the ruins of the houses, and children, making boats with old tables and chairs, appeared as happy as their parents were miserable. It was, however, exceedingly interesting to observe, how much more active and cheerful all appeared than could have been expected. It was remarked with much truth, that from the destruction being universal, no one individual was humbled more than another. Or could suspect his friends of coldness, that most grievous result of the loss of wealth. Mr. Rouse, and a large party whom he kindly took under his protection, lived for the first week in a garden beneath some apple trees. At first they were as merry as if it had been a picnic. But soon afterwards heavy rain caused much discomfort, for they were absolutely without shelter. 
In Captain Fitz Roy's excellent account of the earthquake, it is said that two explosions, one like a column of smoke and another like the blowing of a great whale, were seen in the bay. The water also appeared everywhere to be boiling, and it became black, and exhaled a most disagreeable sulfurous smell. These latter circumstances were observed in the Bay of Valparaiso during the earthquake of 1822. They may, I think, be accounted for, by the disturbance of the mud at the bottom of the sea containing organic matter in decay. In the Bay of Calau, during a calm day, I noticed, that as the ship dragged her cable over the bottom, its course was marked by a line of bubbles. The lower orders in Talcahuano thought that the earthquake was caused by some old Indian women, who two years ago, being offended, stopped the volcano of Antuco. This silly belief is curious, because it shows that experience has taught them to observe, that there exists a relation between the suppressed action of the volcanoes, and the trembling of the ground. It was necessary to apply the witchcraft to the point where their perception of cause and effect failed, and this was the closing of the volcanic vent. This belief is the more singular in this particular instance, because, according to Captain Fitzroy, there is reason to believe that Antuco was no ways affected. The town of Concepcion was built in the usual Spanish fashion, with all the streets running at right angles to each other, one set ranging S, W by W, and the other set N, W by N. The walls in the former direction certainly stood better than those in the latter, the greater number of the masses of brickwork were thrown down towards the N, E. Both these circumstances perfectly agree with the general idea, of the undulations having come from the S, W, in which quarter subterranean noises were also heard. For it is evident that the walls running S, W, and N, E which presented their ends to the point whence the undulations came, would be much less likely to fall than those walls which, running N, W, and S, E, must in their whole lengths have been at the same instant thrown out of the perpendicular, for the undulations, coming from the S, W, must have extended in N, W, and S, E. Waves, as they passed under the foundations. This may be illustrated by placing books edgeways on a carpet, and then, after the manner suggested by Michel, imitating the undulations of an earthquake, it will be found that they fall with more or less readiness, according as their direction more or less nearly coincides with the line of the waves. The fissures in the ground generally, though not uniformly, extended in a s, e, and n, w, direction, and therefore corresponded to the lines of undulation or of principal flexure. Bearing in mind all these circumstances, which so clearly point to the s, w, as the chief focus of disturbance, it is a very interesting fact that the island of s. Maria, situated in that quarter, was, during the general uplifting of the land, raised to nearly three times the height of any other part of the coast. The different resistance offered by the walls, according to their direction, was well exemplified in the case of the cathedral. The side which fronted the N.E. presented a grand pile of ruins, in the midst of which doorcases and masses of timber stood up, as if floating in a stream. Some of the angular blocks of brickwork were of great dimensions. And they were rolled to a distance on the level plaza, like fragments of rock at the base of some high mountain. The side walls, running S, W, and N, E. Though exceedingly fractured, yet remained standing. But the vast buttresses, at right angles to them, and therefore parallel to the walls that fell, were in many cases cut clean off, as if by a chisel, and hurled to the ground. Some square ornaments on the coping of these same walls, were moved by the earthquake into a diagonal position. A similar circumstance was observed after an earthquake at Valparaiso, Calabria, and other places, including some of the ancient Greek temples. 138 This twisting displacement, at first appears to indicate a vortico's movement beneath each point thus affected, but this is highly improbable. May it not be caused by a tendency in each stone to arrange itself in some particular position? With respect to the lines of vibration, in a manner somewhat similar to pins on a sheet of paper when shaken? Generally speaking, arched doorways or windows stood much better than any other part of the buildings. Nevertheless, a poor lame old man, who had been in the habit, during trifling shocks, of crawling to a certain doorway, 
was this time crushed to pieces. I have not attempted to give any detailed description of the appearance of Concepcion, for I feel that it is quite impossible to convey the mingled feelings which I experienced. Several of the officers visited it before me, but their strongest language failed to give a just idea of the scene of desolation. It is a bitter and humiliating thing to see works, which have cost man so much time and labor, overthrown in one minute. Yet compassion for the inhabitants was almost instantly banished, by the surprise in seeing a state of things produced in a moment of time. Which one was accustomed to attribute to a succession of ages? In my opinion, we have scarcely beheld, since leaving England, any sight so deeply interesting. In almost every severe earthquake, the neighboring waters of the sea are said to have been greatly agitated. The disturbance seems generally, as in the case of Concepcion, to have been of two kinds, first, at the instant of the shock, the water swells high up on the beach with a gentle motion. And then as quietly retreats. Secondly, some time afterwards, the whole body of the sea retires from the coast, and then returns in waves of overwhelming force. The first movement seems to be an immediate consequence of the earthquake affecting differently a fluid and a solid. So that their respective levels are slightly deranged, but the second case is a far more important phenomenon. During most earthquakes, and especially during those on the west coast of America, it is certain that the first great movement of the waters has been a retirement. Some authors have attempted to explain this, by supposing that the water retains its level, whilst the land oscillates upwards. But surely the water close to the land, even on a rather steep coast, would partake of the motion of the bottom, moreover, as urged by Mr. Lyell, similar movements of the sea have occurred at islands far distant from the chief line of disturbance, as was the case with Juan Fernandez during this earthquake. And with Madeira during the famous Lisbon shock. I suspect, but the subject is a very obscure one, that a wave, however produced, first draws the water from the shore. On which it is advancing to break, I have observed that this happens with the little waves from the paddles of a steamboat. It is remarkable that whilst Talcahuano and Calau, near Lima, both situated at the head of large shallow bays, have suffered during every severe earthquake from great waves, Valparaiso. Seated close to the edge of profoundly deep water, has never been overwhelmed, though so often shaken by the severest shocks. From the great wave not immediately following the earthquake, but sometimes after the interval of even half an hour. And from distant islands being affected similarly with the coasts near the focus of the disturbance, it appears that the wave first rises in the offing. And as this is of general occurrence, the cause must be general, I suspect we must look to the line, where the less disturbed waters of the deep ocean join the water nearer the coast. Which has partaken of the movements of the land, as the place where the great wave is first generated. It would also appear that the wave is larger or smaller, according to the extent of shoal water which has been agitated together with the bottom on which it rested. The most remarkable effect of this earthquake was the permanent elevation of the land, it would probably be far more correct to speak of it as the cause. There can be no doubt that the land round the Bay of Concepcion was upraised two or three feet. But it deserves notice, that owing to the wave having obliterated the old lines of tidal action on the sloping sandy shores, I could discover no evidence of this fact. Except in the united testimony of the inhabitants, that one little rocky shoal, now exposed, was formerly covered with water. At the island of S. Maria, about thirty miles distant, the elevation was greater. On one part, Captain Fitzroy found beds of putrid mussel shells still adhering to the rocks. Ten feet above high water mark, the inhabitants had formerly dived at lower water spring tides for these shells. The elevation of this province is particularly interesting, from its having been the theater of several other violent earthquakes, and from the vast numbers of seashells scattered over the land. Up to a height of certainly 600, and I believe, of 1,000 feet. At Valparaiso, as I have remarked, similar shells are found at the height of 1,300 feet, it is hardly possible to doubt that this great elevation has been affected by successive small uprisings. Such as that which accompanied or caused the earthquake of this year, 
and likewise by an insensibly slow rise, which is certainly in progress on some parts of this coast. The island of Juan Fernandez, 360 miles to the N.E., was, at the time of the great shock of the 20th, violently shaken, so that the trees beat against each other. And a volcano burst forth under water close to the shore, these facts are remarkable because this island, during the earthquake of 1751, was then also affected more violently than other places at an equal distance from Concepcion, and this seems to show some subterranean connection between these two points. Chiloé, about 340 miles southward of Concepcion, appears to have been shaken more strongly than the intermediate district of Valdivia, where the volcano of Villarica was no ways affected. Whilst in the Cordillera in front of Chiloé, two of the volcanoes burst forth at the same instant in violent action. These two volcanoes, and some neighboring ones, continued for a long time in eruption, and ten months afterwards were again influenced by an earthquake at Concepcion. Some men, cutting wood near the base of one of these volcanoes, did not perceive the shock of the twentieth, although the whole surrounding province was then trembling. Here we have an eruption relieving and taking the place of an earthquake, as would have happened at Concepcion, according to the belief of the lower orders. If the volcano at Antuco had not been closed by witchcraft. Two years and three quarters afterwards, Valdivia and Chiloé were again shaken, more violently than on the 20th, and an island in the Chonos archipelago was permanently elevated more than eight feet. It will give a better idea of the scale of these phenomena. If, as in the case of the glaciers, we suppose them to have taken place at corresponding distances in Europe, then would the land from the North Sea to the Mediterranean have been violently shaken. And at the same instant of time a large tract of the eastern coast of England would have been permanently elevated. Together with some outlying islands, a train of volcanoes on the coast of Holland would have burst forth in action, and an eruption taken place at the bottom of the sea. Near the northern extremity of Ireland, and lastly, the ancient vents of Auvergne, Cantal, and Mont d'Or would each have sent up to the sky a dark column of smoke, and have long remained in fierce action. Two years and three quarters afterwards, France, from its center to the English Channel, would have been again desolated by an earthquake and an island permanently upraised in the Mediterranean. The space, from under which volcanic matter on the 20th was actually erupted, is 720 miles in one line, and 400 miles in another line at right angles to the first, hence, in all probability. A subterranean lake of lava is here stretched out, of nearly double the area of the Black Sea. From the intimate and complicated manner in which the elevatory and eruptive forces were shown to be connected during this train of phenomena, we may confidently come to the conclusion that the forces which slowly and by little starts uplift continents, and those which at successive periods pour forth volcanic matter from open orifices, are identical. From many reasons, I believe that the frequent quakings of the earth on this line of coast are caused by the rending of the strata, necessarily consequent on the tension of the land when upraised, and their injection by fluidified rock. This rending and injection would, if repeated often enough, and we know that earthquakes repeatedly affect the same areas in the same manner, form a chain of hills, and the linear island of S. Mary, which was upraised thrice the height of the neighboring country, seems to be undergoing this process. I believe that the solid axis of a mountain, differs in its manner of formation from a volcanic hill, only in the molten stone having been repeatedly injected. Instead of having been repeatedly ejected. Moreover, I believe that it is impossible to explain the structure of great mountain chains, such as that of the Cordillera, where the strata, capping the injected axis of plutonic rock, have been thrown on their edges along several parallel and neighboring lines of elevation, except on this view of the rock of the axis having been repeatedly injected. After intervals sufficiently long to allow the upper parts or wedges to cool and become solid. For if the strata had been thrown into their present highly inclined, vertical, and even inverted positions, by a single blow, the very bowels of the earth would have gushed out. And instead of beholding abrupt mountain axes of rock solidified under great pressure, deluges of lava would have flowed out at innumerable points on every line of elevation. 139. 
Chapter 15 Passage of the Cordillera Valparaiso, Portillo Pass, Sagacity of Mules, Mountain Torrents, Mines How discovered, proofs of the gradual elevation of the Cordillera, effect of snow on rocks, geological structure of the two main ranges. Their distinct origin and upheaval, great subsidence, red snow, winds, pinnacles of snow, dry and clear atmosphere, electricity, pampas, zoology of the opposite side of the Andes, locusts, great bugs, Mendoza, Uspallata Pass, silicified trees buried as they grew, Incas Bridge, badness of the passes exaggerated, Cumber, Casuchas, Valparaiso. March 7, 1835, we stayed three days at Concepcion, and then sailed for Valparaiso. The wind being northerly, we only reached the mouth of the harbor of Concepcion before it was dark. Being very near the land, and a fog coming on, the anchor was dropped. Presently a large American whaler appeared alongside of us. And we heard the Yankee swearing at his men to keep quiet, whilst he listened for the breakers. Captain Fitz Roy hailed him, in a loud clear voice, to anchor where he then was. The poor man must have thought the voice came from the shore, such a babble of cries issued at once from the ship, everyone hallooing out, let go the anchor. Veer cable. Shorten sail. It was the most laughable thing I ever heard. If the ship's crew had been all captains, and no men, there could not have been a greater uproar of orders. We afterwards found that the mate stuttered, I suppose all hands were assisting him in giving his orders. On the eleventh we anchored at Valparaiso, and two days afterwards I set out to cross the Cordillera. I proceeded to Santiago, where Mr. Called Clo most kindly assisted me in every possible way in making the little preparations which were necessary. In this part of Chile there are two passes across the Andes to Mendoza, the one most commonly used, namely, that of Aconcagua or Uspallata, is situated some way to the north. The other, called the Portillo, is to the south, and nearer, but more lofty and dangerous. March 18 th, we set out for the Portillo Pass. Leaving Santiago we crossed the wide burnt-up plain on which that city stands, and in the afternoon arrived at the Maipu, one of the principal rivers in Chile. The valley, at the point where it enters the first cordillera, is bounded on each side by lofty barren mountains, and although not broad, it is very fertile. Numerous cottages were surrounded by vines, and by orchards of apple, nectarine, and peach trees, their boughs breaking with the weight of the beautiful ripe fruit. In the evening we passed the custom house, where our luggage was examined. The frontier of Chile is better guarded by the Cordillera, than by the waters of the sea. There are very few valleys which lead to the central ranges, and the mountains are quite impassable in other parts by beasts of burden. The custom house officers were very civil, which was perhaps partly owing to the passport which the President of the Republic had given me. But I must express my admiration at the natural politeness of almost every Chileno. In this instance, the contrast with the same class of men in most other countries was strongly marked. I may mention an anecdote with which I was at the time much pleased, we met near Mendoza a little and very fat negress, riding astride on a mule. She had a goiter so enormous that it was scarcely possible to avoid gazing at her for a moment. But my two companions almost instantly, by way of apology, made the common salute of the country by taking off their hats. Where would one of the lower or higher classes in Europe, have shown such feeling politeness to a poor and miserable object of a degraded race? At night we slept at a cottage. Our manner of traveling was delightfully independent. In the inhabited parts we bought a little firewood, hired pasture for the animals, and bivouacked in the corner of the same field with them. Carrying an iron pot, we cooked and ate our supper under a cloudless sky, and knew no trouble. My companions were Mariano Gonzalez, who had formerly accompanied me in Chile, and an arriero, with his ten mules and a madrina. The madrina, or godmother, is a most important personage. She is an old steady mare, with a little bell round her neck, and wherever she goes, the mules, like good children, follow her. 
the affection of these animals for their madrinas saves infinite trouble. If several large troops are turned into one field to graze, in the morning the muleteers have only to lead the madrinas a little apart and tinkle their bells. Although there may be two or three hundred together, each mule immediately knows the bell of its own madrina and comes to her. It is nearly impossible to lose an old mule. For if detained for several hours by force, she will, by the power of smell, like a dog, track out her companions, or rather the madrina, for, according to the muleteer, she is the chief object of affection. The feeling, however, is not of an individual nature, for I believe I am right in saying that any animal with a bell will serve as a madrina. In a troop each animal carries on a level road, a cargo weighing 416 pounds, more than 29 stone, but in a mountainous country 100 pounds less. Yet with what delicate slim limbs, without any proportional bulk of muscle, these animals support so great a burden. The mule always appears to me a most surprising animal. That a hybrid should possess more reason, memory, obstinacy, social affection, powers of muscular endurance, and length of life, than either of its parents. Seems to indicate that art has here outdone nature. Of our ten animals, six were intended for riding, and four for carrying cargoes, each taking turnabout. We carried a good deal of food in case we should be snowed up, as the season was rather late for passing the Portillo. March 19. We rode during this day to the last, and therefore most elevated, house in the valley. The number of inhabitants became scanty, but wherever water could be brought on the land, it was very fertile. All the main valleys in the Cordillera are characterized by having, on both sides, a fringe or terrace of shingle and sand, rudely stratified, and generally of considerable thickness. These fringes evidently once extended across the valleys and were united, and the bottoms of the valleys in northern Chile, where there are no streams, are thus smoothly filled up. On these fringes the roads are generally carried, for their surfaces are even, and they rise, with a very gentle slope up the valleys, hence, also, they are easily cultivated by irrigation. They may be traced up to a height of between 7,000 and 9,000 feet, where they become hidden by the irregular piles of debris. At the lower end or mouths of the valleys, they are continuously united to those landlocked plains, also formed of shingle, at the foot of the main cordillera. Which I have described in a former chapter as characteristic of the scenery of Chile, and which were undoubtedly deposited when the sea penetrated Chile, as it now does the more southern coasts. No one fact in the geology of South America interested me more than these terraces of rudely stratified shingle. They precisely resemble in composition the matter which the torrents in each valley would deposit, if they were checked in their course by any cause, such as entering a lake or arm of the sea. But the torrents, instead of depositing matter, are now steadily at work wearing away both the solid rock and these alluvial deposits, along the whole line of every main valley and side valley. It is impossible here to give the reasons, but I am convinced that the shingle terraces were accumulated, during the gradual elevation of the cordillera, by the torrents delivering. At successive levels, their detritus on the beachheads of long narrow arms of the sea, first high up the valleys, then lower and lower down as the land slowly rose. If this be so, and I cannot doubt it, the grand and broken chain of the cordillera, instead of having been suddenly thrown up, as was till lately the universal. And still is the common opinion of geologists, has been slowly upheaved in mass, in the same gradual manner as the coasts of the Atlantic and Pacific have risen within the recent period. A multitude of facts in the structure of the Cordillera, on this view receive a simple explanation. The rivers which flow in these valleys ought rather to be called mountain torrents. Their inclination is very great, and their water the color of mud. The roar which the Maipu made, as it rushed over the great rounded fragments, was like that of the sea. Amidst the din of rushing waters, the noise from the stones, as they rattled one over another, was most distinctly audible even from a distance. This rattling noise, night and day, may be heard along the whole course of the torrent. The sound spoke eloquently to the geologist. The thousands and thousands of stones, which, striking against each other, 
made the one dull uniform sound, were all hurrying in one direction. It was like thinking on time, where the minute that now glides past is irrevocable. So was it with these stones. The ocean is their eternity, and each note of that wild music told of one more step towards their destiny. It is not possible for the mind to comprehend, except by a slow process, any effect which is produced by a cause repeated so often, that the multiplier itself conveys an idea. Not more definite than the savage implies when he points to the hairs of his head. As often as I have seen beds of mud, sand, and shingle, accumulated to the thickness of many thousand feet, I have felt inclined to exclaim that causes. Such as the present rivers and the present beaches, could never have ground down and produced such masses. But, on the other hand, when listening to the rattling noise of these torrents, and calling to mind that whole races of animals have passed away from the face of the earth. And that during this whole period, night and day, these stones have gone rattling onwards in their course, I have thought to myself, can any mountains, any continent, withstand such waste? In this part of the valley, the mountains on each side were from 3,000 to 6,000 or 8,000 feet high, with rounded outlines and steep bare flanks. The general color of the rock was dullish purple, and the stratification very distinct. If the scenery was not beautiful, it was remarkable and grand. We met during the day several herds of cattle, which men were driving down from the higher valleys in the Cordillera. This sign of the approaching winter hurried our steps, more than was convenient for geologizing. The house where we slept was situated at the foot of a mountain, on the summit of which are the mines of S. Pedro de Nolasco. Sir F. Head marvels how mines have been discovered in such extraordinary situations, as the bleak summit of the mountain of S. Pedro de Nolasco. In the first place, metallic veins in this country are generally harder than the surrounding strata, hence, during the gradual wear of the hills, they project above the surface of the ground. Secondly, almost every laborer, especially in the northern parts of Chile, understands something about the appearance of ores. In the great mining provinces of Coquimba and Copiapo, firewood is very scarce, and men search for it over every hill and dale. And by this means nearly all the richest mines have there been discovered. Chanancillo, from which silver to the value of many hundred thousand pounds has been raised in the course of a few years, was discovered by a man who threw a stone at his loaded donkey. And thinking that it was very heavy, he picked it up, and found it full of pure silver, the vein occurred at no great distance, standing up like a wedge of metal. The miners, also, taking a crowbar with them, often wander on Sundays over the mountains. In this south part of Chile, the men who drive cattle into the Cordillera, and who frequent every ravine where there is a little pasture, are the usual discoverers. 20th. As we ascended the valley, the vegetation, with the exception of a few pretty alpine flowers, became exceedingly scanty, and of quadrupeds, birds, or insects, scarcely one could be seen. The lofty mountains, their summits marked with a few patches of snow, stood well separated from each other, the valleys being filled up with an immense thickness of stratified alluvium. The features in the scenery of the Andes which struck me most, as contrasted with the other mountain chains with which I am acquainted, were, the flat fringes sometimes expanding into narrow plains on each side of the valleys, the bright colors, chiefly red and purple, of the utterly bare and precipitous hills of porphyry. The grand and continuous wall-like dikes, the plainly divided strata which, were nearly vertical, formed the picturesque and wild central pinnacles, but were less inclined. Composed the great massive mountains on the outskirts of the range, and lastly, the smooth conical piles of fine and brightly colored detritus, which sloped up at a high angle from the base of the mountains, sometimes to a height of more than 2,000 feet. I frequently observed, both in Tierra del Fuego and within the Andes, that where the rock was covered during the greater part of the year with snow, it was shivered in a very extraordinary manner into small angular fragments. Scorus B140 has observed the same fact in Spitzbergen. The case appears to me rather obscure, for that part of the mountain which is protected by a mantle of snow, must be less subject to repeated and great changes of temperature than any other part. I have sometimes thought, 
that the earth and fragments of stone on the surface, were perhaps less effectually removed by slowly percolating snow, water 141 than by rain. And therefore that the appearance of a quicker disintegration of the solid rock under the snow, was deceptive. Whatever the cause may be, the quantity of crumbling stone on the Cordillera is very great. Occasionally in the spring, great masses of this detritus slide down the mountains, and cover the snowdrifts in the valleys, thus forming natural icehouses. We rode over one, the height of which was far below the limit of perpetual snow. As the evening drew to a close, we reached a singular basin-like plain, called the Valle del Yeso. It was covered by a little dry pasture, and we had the pleasant sight of a herd of cattle amidst the surrounding rocky deserts. The valley takes its name of Yeso from a great bed, I should think at least two thousand feet thick, of white, and in some parts quite pure, gypsum. We slept with a party of men, who were employed in loading mules with this substance, which is used in the manufacture of wine. We set out early in the morning, 21st, and continued to follow the course of the river, which had become very small, till we arrived at the foot of the ridge. That separates the waters flowing into the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. The road, which as yet had been good with a steady but very gradual ascent, now changed into a steep zigzag track up the Great Range, dividing the republics of Chile and Mendoza. I will here give a very brief sketch of the geology of the several parallel lines forming the Cordillera. Of these lines, there are two considerably higher than the others. Namely, on the Chilean side, the Puquines Ridge, which, where the road crosses it, is 13,210 feet above the sea, and the Portillo Ridge, on the Mendoza side, which is 14,305 feet. The lower beds of the Puquines Ridge, and of the several great lines to the westward of it, are composed of a vast pile, many thousand feet in thickness. Of porphyries which have flowed as submarine lavas, alternating with angular and rounded fragments of the same rocks, thrown out of the submarine craters. These alternating masses are covered in the central parts, by a great thickness of red sandstone, conglomerate, and calcareous clay slate, associated with, and passing into. Prodigious beds of gypsum. In these upper beds shells are tolerably frequent, and they belong to about the period of the lower chalk of Europe. It is an old story, but not the less wonderful, to hear of shells which were once crawling on the bottom of the sea, now standing nearly 14,000 feet above its level. The lower beds in this great pile of strata, have been dislocated, baked, crystallized, and almost blended together, through the agency of mountain masses of a peculiar white sodogranitic rock. The other main line, namely, that of the Portillo, is of a totally different formation, it consists chiefly of grand bare pinnacles of a red potash granite, which low down on the western flank are covered by a sandstone, converted by the former heat into a quartz rock. On the quartz, there rest beds of a conglomerate several thousand feet in thickness, which have been upheaved by the red granite, and dip at an angle of 45 degrees towards the Puquines line. I was astonished to find that this conglomerate was partly composed of pebbles, derived from the rocks, with their fossil shells, of the Puquines range. And partly of red potash granite, like that of the Portillo. Hence we must conclude, that both the Puquines and Portillo ranges were partially upheaved and exposed to wear and tear, when the conglomerate was forming. But as the beds of the conglomerate have been thrown off at an angle of 45 degrees by the red Portillo granite, with the underlying sandstone baked by it, we may feel sure that the greater part of the injection and upheaval of the already partially formed Portillo line took place after the accumulation of the conglomerate, and long after the elevation of the Puquines Ridge. So that the Portillo, the loftiest line in this part of the Cordillera, is not so old as the less lofty line of the Puquines. Evidence derived from an inclined stream of lava at the eastern base of the Portillo, might be adduced to show, that it owes part of its great height to elevations of a still later date. Looking to its earliest origin, the red granite seems to have been injected on an ancient pre-existing line of white granite and mica slate. In most parts, perhaps in all parts, of the Cordillera, it may be concluded that each line has been formed by repeated upheavals and injections. 
and that the several parallel lines are of different ages. Only thus can we gain time, at all sufficient to explain the truly astonishing amount of denudation, which these great, though comparatively with most other ranges recent, mountains have suffered. Finally, the shells in the Pukines or oldest ridge, prove, as before remarked, that it has been upraised 14,000 feet since a secondary period, which in Europe we are accustomed to consider as far from ancient. But since these shells lived in a moderately deep sea, it can be shown that the area now occupied by the Cordillera must have subsided several thousand feet, in northern Chile as much as 6. 000 feet, so as to have allowed that amount of submarine strata to have been heaped on the bed on which the shells lived. The proof is the same with that by which it was shown, that at a much later period, since the tertiary shells of Patagonia lived, there must have been there a subsidence of several hundred feet, as well as an ensuing elevation. Daily it is forced home on the mind of the geologist, that nothing, not even the wind that blows, is so unstable as the level of the crust of this earth. I will make only one other geological remark, although the Portillo chain is here higher than the Pukines, the waters draining the intermediate valleys, have burst through it. The same fact, on a grander scale, has been remarked in the eastern and loftiest line of the Bolivian Cordillera. Through which the rivers pass, analogous facts have also been observed in other quarters of the world. On the supposition of the subsequent and gradual elevation of the Portillo line, this can be understood. For a chain of islets would at first appear, and, as these were lifted up, the tides would be always wearing deeper and broader channels between them. At the present day, even in the most retired sounds on the coast of Tierra del Fuego, the currents in the transverse breaks which connect the longitudinal channels, are very strong so that in one transverse channel even a small vessel under sail was whirled round and round. About noon we began the tedious ascent of the Pukines Ridge, and then for the first time experienced some little difficulty in our respiration. The mules would halt every fifty yards, and after resting for a few seconds the poor willing animals started of their own accord again. The short breathing from the rarefied atmosphere is called by the Chilenos, Puna, and they have most ridiculous notions concerning its origin. Some say, all the waters here have Puna. Others that, where there is snow there is Puna, and this no doubt is true. The only sensation I experienced was a slight tightness across the head and chest, like that felt on leaving a warm room and running quickly in frosty weather. There was some imagination even in this, for upon finding fossil shells on the highest ridge, I entirely forgot the puna in my delight. Certainly the exertion of walking was extremely great, and the respiration became deep and laborious, I am told that in Potosi, about 13. 000 feet above the sea, strangers do not become thoroughly accustomed to the atmosphere for an entire year. The inhabitants all recommend onions for the puna. As this vegetable has sometimes been given in Europe for pectoral complaints, it may possibly be of real service, for my part one found nothing so good as the fossil shells. When about halfway up we met a large party with seventy loaded mules. It was interesting to hear the wild cries of the muleteers, and to watch the long descending string of the animals. They appeared so diminutive, there being nothing but the black mountains with which they could be compared. When near the summit, the wind, as generally happens, was impetuous and extremely cold. On each side of the ridge, we had to pass over broad bands of perpetual snow, which were now soon to be covered by a fresh layer. When we reached the crest and looked backwards, a glorious view was presented. The atmosphere resplendently clear, the sky in intense blue, the profound valleys. The wild broken forms, the heaps of ruins, piled up during the lapse of ages. The bright-colored rocks, contrasted with the quiet mountains of snow, all these together produced a scene no one could have imagined. Neither plant nor bird, excepting a few condors wheeling around the higher pinnacles, distracted my attention from the inanimate mass. I felt glad that I was alone, it was like watching a thunderstorm, or hearing in full orchestra a chorus of the Messiah. On several patches of the snow I found the Protococcus nevelis, or red snow, 
so well known from the accounts of Arctic navigators. My attention was called to it, by observing the footsteps of the mules stained a pale red, as if their hoofs had been slightly bloody. I at first thought that it was owing to dust blown from the surrounding mountains of red porphyry. For from the magnifying power of the crystals of snow, the groups of these microscopical plants appeared like coarse particles. The snow was colored only where it had thawed very rapidly, or had been accidentally crushed. A little rubbed on paper gave it a faint rose tinge mingled with a little brick red. I afterwards scraped some off the paper, and found that it consisted of groups of little spheres in colorless cases, each of the thousandth part of an inch in diameter. The wind on the crest of the Pukines, as just remarked, is generally impetuous and very cold, it is said 142 to blow steadily from the westward or Pacific side. As the observations have been chiefly made in summer, this wind must be an upper and return current. The peak of Tenerife, with a less elevation, and situated in lat. 28 degrees, in like manner falls within an upper return stream. At first it appears rather surprising, that the trade wind along the northern parts of Chile and on the coast of Peru, should blow in so very southerly a direction as it does. But when we reflect that the Cordillera, running in a north and south line, intercepts, like a great wall, the entire depth of the lower atmospheric current, we can easily see that the trade wind must be drawn northward, following the line of mountains, towards the equatorial regions and thus lose part of that easterly movement which it otherwise would have gained from the Earth's rotation. At Mendoza, on the eastern foot of the Andes, the climate is said to be subject to long calms, and to frequent though false appearances of gathering rainstorms, we may imagine that the wind, which coming from the eastward is thus banked up by the line of mountains, would become stagnant and irregular in its movements. Having crossed the Pukines, we descended into a mountainous country, intermediate between the two main ranges, and then took up our quarters for the night. We were now in the Republic of Mendoza. The elevation was probably not under 11,000 feet, and the vegetation in consequence exceedingly scanty. The root of a small scrubby plant served as fuel, but it made a miserable fire, and the wind was piercingly cold. Being quite tired with my day's work, I made up my bed as quickly as I could, and went to sleep. About midnight I observed the sky became suddenly clouded, I awakened the arriero to know if there was any danger of bad weather. But he said that without thunder and lightning there was no risk of a heavy snowstorm. The peril is imminent, and the difficulty of subsequent escape great, to anyone overtaken by bad weather between the two ranges. A certain cave offers the only place of refuge, Mr. Kaldkla, who crossed on this same day of the month, was detained there for some time by a heavy fall of snow. Kasuchas, or houses of refuge, have not been built in this pass as in that of Uspayata, and, therefore, during the autumn, the Portillo is little frequented. I may here remark that within the main Cordillera rain never falls, for during the summer the sky is cloudless, and in winter snowstorms alone occur. At the place where we slept water necessarily boiled, from the diminished pressure of the atmosphere, at a lower temperature than it does in a less lofty country. The case being the converse of that of a papine's digester. Hence the potatoes, after remaining for some hours in the boiling water, were nearly as hard as ever. The pot was left on the fire all night, and next morning it was boiled again, but yet the potatoes were not cooked. I found out this, by overhearing my two companions discussing the cause, they had come to the simple conclusion, that the cursed pot, which was a new one, did not choose to boil potatoes. March 22 nd, after eating our potatoless breakfast, we travelled across the intermediate tract to the foot of the Portillo Range. In the middle of summer cattle are brought up here to graze. But they had now all been removed, even the greater number of the guanacos had decamped, knowing well that if overtaken here by a snowstorm, they would be caught in a trap. We had a fine view of a mass of mountains called Tupungata, the whole clothed with unbroken snow, in the midst of which there was a blue patch, no doubt a glacier. A circumstance of rare occurrence in these mountains. Now commenced a heavy and long climb, similar to that of the Pukines. 
bold conical hills of red granite rose on each hand. In the valleys there were several broad fields of perpetual snow. These frozen masses, during the process of thawing, had in some parts been converted into pinnacles or columns, 143 which, as they were high and close together, made it difficult for the cargo mules to pass. On one of these columns of ice, a frozen horse was sticking as on a pedestal, but with its hind leg straight up in the air. The animal, I suppose, must have fallen with its head downward into a hole, when the snow was continuous, and afterwards the surrounding parts must have been removed by the thaw. When nearly on the crest of the portillo, we were enveloped in a falling cloud of minute frozen spicula. This was very unfortunate, as it continued the whole day, and quite intercepted our view. The pass takes its name of portillo, from a narrow cleft or doorway on the highest ridge, through which the road passes. From this point, on a clear day, those vast plains which uninterruptedly extend to the Atlantic Ocean can be seen. We descended to the upper limit of vegetation, and found good quarters for the night under the shelter of some large fragments of rock. We met here some passengers, who made anxious inquiries about the state of the road. Shortly after it was dark the clouds suddenly cleared away, and the effect was quite magical. The great mountains, bright with the full moon, seemed impending over us on all sides, as over a deep crevice, one morning, very early, I witnessed the same striking effect. As soon as the clouds were dispersed it froze severely, but as there was no wind, we slept very comfortably. The increased brilliancy of the moon and stars at this elevation, owing to the perfect transparency of the atmosphere, was very remarkable. Travelers having observed the difficulty of judging heights and distances amidst lofty mountains, have generally attributed it to the absence of objects of comparison. It appears to me, that it is fully as much owing to the transparency of the air confounding objects at different distances, and likewise partly to the novelty of an unusual degree of fatigue arising from a little exertion, habit being thus opposed to the evidence of the senses. I am sure that this extreme clearness of the air gives a peculiar character to the landscape, all objects appearing to be brought nearly into one plane, as in a drawing or panorama. The transparency is, I presume, owing to the equable and high state of atmospheric dryness. This dryness was shown by the manner in which woodwork shrank, as I soon found by the trouble my geological hammer gave me, by articles of food, such as bread and sugar, becoming extremely hard. And by the preservation of the skin and parts of the flesh of the beasts, which had perished on the road. To the same cause we must attribute the singular facility with which electricity is excited. My flannel waistcoat, when rubbed in the dark, appeared as if it had been washed with phosphorus, every hair on a dog's back crackled. Even the linen sheets, and leathern straps of the saddle, when handled, emitted sparks. March 23rd. The descent on the eastern side of the Cordillera is much shorter or steeper than on the Pacific side. In other words, the mountains rise more abruptly from the plains than from the alpine country of Chile. A level and brilliantly white sea of clouds was stretched out beneath our feet, shutting out the view of the equally level pampas. We soon entered the band of clouds, and did not again emerge from it that day. About noon, finding pasture for the animals and bushes for firewood at Los Arenales, we stopped for the night. This was near the uppermost limit of bushes, and the elevation, I suppose, was between seven and eight thousand feet. I was much struck with the marked difference between the vegetation of these eastern valleys and those on the Chilean side, yet the climate, as well as the kind of soil, is nearly the same. And the difference of longitude very trifling. The same remark holds good with the quadrupeds, and in a lesser degree with the birds and insects. I may instance the mice, of which I obtained thirteen species on the shores of the Atlantic, and five on the Pacific, and not one of them is identical. We must accept all those species, which habitually or occasionally frequent elevated mountains, and certain birds, which range as far south as the Strait of Magellan. This fact is in perfect accordance with the geological history of the Andes, for these mountains have existed as a great barrier since the present races of animals have appeared. And therefore, unless we suppose the same species to have been created in two different places, 
We ought not to expect any closer similarity between the organic beings on the opposite sides of the Andes than on the opposite shores of the ocean. In both cases, we must leave out of the question those kinds which have been able to cross the barrier, whether of solid rock or saltwater. 144. A great number of the plants and animals were absolutely the same as, or most closely allied to, those of Patagonia. We here have the agouti, biscacha, three species of armadillo, the ostrich, certain kinds of partridges and other birds, none of which are ever seen in Chile. But are the characteristic animals of the desert plains of Patagonia? We have likewise many of the same, to the eyes of a person who is not a botanist, thorny stunted bushes, withered grass, and dwarf plants. Even the black slowly crawling beetles are closely similar, and some, I believe, on rigorous examination, absolutely identical. It had always been to me a subject of regret, that we were unavoidably compelled to give up the ascent of the S. Cruz River before reaching the mountains, I always had a latent hope of meeting with some great change in the features of the country. But I now feel sure, that it would only have been following the plains of Patagonia up a mountainous ascent. March 24. Early in the morning I climbed up a mountain on one side of the valley, and enjoyed a far extended view over the Pampas. This was a spectacle to which I had always looked forward with interest, but I was disappointed, at the first glance it much resembled a distant view of the ocean. But in the northern parts many irregularities were soon distinguishable. The most striking feature consisted in the rivers, which, facing the rising sun, glittered like silver threads, till lost in the immensity of the distance. At midday we descended the valley, and reached a hovel, where an officer and three soldiers were posted to examine passports. One of these men was a thoroughbred Pampas Indian, he was kept much for the same purpose as a bloodhound, to track out any person who might pass by secretly, either on foot or horseback. Some years ago, a passenger endeavored to escape detection, by making a long circuit over a neighboring mountain. But this Indian, having by chance crossed his track, followed it for the whole day over dry and very stony hills, till at last he came on his prey hidden in a gully. We here heard that the silvery clouds, which we had admired from the bright region above, had poured down torrents of rain. The valley from this point gradually opened, and the hills became mere water-worn hillocks compared to the giants behind, it then expanded into a gently sloping plain of shingle covered with low trees and bushes. This talus, although appearing narrow, must be nearly ten miles wide before it blends into the apparently dead-level pampas. We passed the only house in this neighborhood, the Estancia of Chiquillo, and at sunset we pulled up in the first snug corner, and there bivouacked. March 25th. I was reminded of the pampas of Buenos Aires, by seeing the disk of the rising sun, intersected by an horizon level as that of the ocean. During the night a heavy dew fell, a circumstance which we did not experience within the Cordillera. The road proceeded for some distance due east across a low swamp. Then meeting the dry plain, it turned to the north towards Mendoza. The distance is two very long days' journey. Our first day's journey was called fourteen leagues to Estacado, and the second seventeen to Luxon, near Mendoza. The whole distance is over a level desert plain, with not more than two or three houses. The sun was exceedingly powerful, and the ride devoid of all interest. There is very little water in this, traversia, and in our second day's journey we found only one little pool. Little water flows from the mountains, and it soon becomes absorbed by the dry and porous soil. So that, Although we traveled at the distance of only ten or fifteen miles from the outer range of the Cordillera, we did not cross a single stream. In many parts the ground was encrusted with a saline efflorescence, hence we had the same salt-loving plants which are common near Bahia Blanca. The landscape has a uniform character from the Strait of Magellan, along the whole eastern coast of Patagonia, to the Rio Colorado. And it appears that the same kind of country extends inland from this river, in a sweeping line as far as San Luis and perhaps even further north. To the eastward of this curved line lies the basin of the comparatively damp and green plains of Buenos Aires. 
The sterile plains of Mendoza and Patagonia consist of a bed of shingle, worn smooth and accumulated by the waves of the sea while the pampas, covered by thistles, clover, and grass, have been formed by the ancient estuary mud of the Plata. After our two days' tedious journey, it was refreshing to see in the distance the rows of poplars and willows growing round the village and river of Luxon. Shortly before we arrived at this place, we observed to the south a ragged cloud of dark reddish-brown color. At first we thought that it was smoke from some great fire on the plains. But we soon found that it was a swarm of locusts. They were flying northward, and with the aid of a light breeze, they overtook us at a rate of ten or fifteen miles an hour. The main body filled the air from a height of twenty feet, to that, as it appeared, of two or three thousand above the ground. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle, or rather, I should say, like a strong breeze passing through the rigging of a ship. The sky, seen through the advanced guard, appeared like a mezzotinto engraving, but the main body was impervious to sight. They were not, however, so thick together, but that they could escape a stick waved backwards and forwards. When they alighted, they were more numerous than the leaves in the field, and the surface became reddish instead of being green, the swarm having once alighted. The individuals flew from side to side in all directions. Locusts are not an uncommon pest in this country, already during the season, several smaller swarms had come up from the south, where, as apparently in all other parts of the world, they are bred in the deserts. The poor cottagers in vain attempted by lighting fires, by shouts, and by waving branches to avert the attack. This species of locust closely resembles, and perhaps is identical with, the famous Gryllus migratorius of the east. We crossed the Luxon, which is a river of considerable size, though its course towards the seacoast is very imperfectly known, it is even doubtful whether, in passing over the plains, it is not evaporated and lost. We slept in the village of Luxon, which is a small place surrounded by gardens, and forms the most southern cultivated district in the province of Mendoza, it is five leagues south of the capital. At night I experienced an attack, for it deserves no less a name, of the Benchuca, a species of Reduvius, the great black bug of the pampas. It is most disgusting to feel soft wingless insects, about an inch long, crawling over one's body. Before sucking they are quite thin, but afterwards they become round and bloated with blood, and in this state are easily crushed. One which I caught at Iquique, for they are found in Chile and Peru, was very empty. When placed on a table, and though surrounded by people, if a finger was presented, the bold insect would immediately protrude its sucker, make a charge, and if allowed, draw blood. No pain was caused by the wound. It was curious to watch its body during the act of sucking, as in less than ten minutes it changed from being as flat as a wafer to a globular form. This one feast, for which the benchuka was indebted to one of the officers, kept it fat during four whole months, but, after the first fortnight, it was quite ready to have another suck. March 27. We rode on to Mendoza. The country was beautifully cultivated, and resembled Chile. This neighborhood is celebrated for its fruit. And certainly nothing could appear more flourishing than the vineyards and the orchards of figs, peaches, and olives. We bought watermelons nearly twice as large as a man's head, most deliciously cool and well-flavored, for a halfpenny apiece, and for the value of threepence, half a wheelbarrow full of peaches. The cultivated and enclosed part of this province is very small, there is little more than that which we passed through between Luxon and the capital. The land, as in Chile, owes its fertility entirely to artificial irrigation, and it is really wonderful to observe how extraordinarily productive a barren traversia is thus rendered. We stayed the ensuing day in Mendoza. The prosperity of the place has much declined of late years. The inhabitants say, it is good to live in, but very bad to grow rich in. The lower orders have the lounging, reckless manners of the gauchos of the pampas, and their dress, riding gear, and habits of life, are nearly the same. To my mind the town had a stupid, forlorn aspect. Neither the boasted Alameda, nor the scenery, 
is at all comparable with that of Santiago. But to those who, coming from Buenos Aires, have just crossed the unvaried pampas, the gardens and orchards must appear delightful. Sir F. Head, speaking of the inhabitants, says, they eat their dinners, and it is so very hot, they go to sleep, and could they do better? I quite agree with Sir F. Head, the happy doom of the Mendozinos is to eat, sleep and be idle. March 29 th, we set out on our return to Chile, by the Uspallata Pass situated north of Mendoza. We had to cross a long and most sterile traversia of fifteen leagues. The soil in parts was absolutely bare, in others covered by numberless dwarf cacti, armed with formidable spines, and called by the inhabitants little lions. There were, also, a few low bushes. Although the plain is nearly three thousand feet above the sea, the sun was very powerful, and the heat as well as the clouds of impalpable dust, rendered the traveling extremely irksome. Our course during the day lay nearly parallel to the Cordillera, but gradually approaching them. Before sunset we entered one of the wide valleys, or rather bays, which open on the plain, this soon narrowed into a ravine, where a little higher up the house of Villa Vicencio is situated. As we had ridden all day without a drop of water, both our mules and selves were very thirsty, and we looked out anxiously for the stream which flows down this valley. It was curious to observe how gradually the water made its appearance, on the plain the course was quite dry, by degrees it became a little damper, then puddles of water appeared. These soon became connected, and at Villa Vicencio there was a nice little rivulet. 30th. The solitary hovel which bears the imposing name of Villa Vicencio, has been mentioned by every traveller who has crossed the Andes. I stayed here and at some neighbouring mines during the two succeeding days. The geology of the surrounding country is very curious. The Uspallata range is separated from the main cordillera by a long narrow plain or basin, like those so often mentioned in Chile, but higher, being 6,000 feet above the sea. This range has nearly the same geographical position with respect to the cordillera, which the gigantic Portillo line has. But it is of a totally different origin, it consists of various kinds of submarine lava, alternating with volcanic sandstones and other remarkable sedimentary deposits. The whole having a very close resemblance to some of the tertiary beds on the shores of the Pacific. From this resemblance I expected to find silicified wood, which is generally characteristic of those formations. I was gratified in a very extraordinary manner. In the central part of the range, at an elevation of about 7,000 feet, I observed on a bare slope some snow-white projecting columns. These were petrified trees, eleven being silicified, and from thirty to forty converted into coarsely crystallized white calcareous spar. They were abruptly broken off, the upright stumps projecting a few feet above the ground. The trunks measured from three to five feet each in circumference. They stood a little way apart from each other, but the whole formed one group. Mr. Robert Brown has been kind enough to examine the wood, he says it belongs to the fir tribe, partaking of the character of the Araucarian family, but with some curious points of affinity with the yew. The volcanic sandstone in which the trees were embedded, and from the lower part of which they must have sprung, had accumulated in successive thin layers around their trunks. And the stone yet retained the impression of the bark. It required little geological practice to interpret the marvelous story which this scene at once unfolded. Though I confess I was at first so much astonished that I could scarcely believe the plainest evidence. I saw the spot where a cluster of fine trees once waved their branches on the shores of the Atlantic, when that ocean, now driven back seven hundred miles, came to the foot of the Andes. I saw that they had sprung from a volcanic soil which had been raised above the level of the sea, and that subsequently this dry land, with its upright trees, had been let down into the depths of the ocean. In these depths, the formerly dry land was covered by sedimentary beds, and these again by enormous streams of submarine lava, one such mass attaining the thickness of a thousand feet. And these deluges of molten stone and aqueous deposits five times alternately had been spread out. The ocean which received such thick masses, must have been profoundly deep. 
But again the subterranean forces exerted themselves, and I now beheld the bed of that ocean, forming a chain of mountains more than seven thousand feet in height. Nor had those antagonistic forces been dormant, which are always at work wearing down the surface of the land. The great piles of strata had been intersected by many wide valleys, and the trees now changed into silex, were exposed projecting from the volcanic soil, now changed into rock, whence formerly. In a green and budding state, they had raised their lofty heads. Now, all is utterly irreclaimable and desert, even the lichen cannot adhere to the stony casts of former trees. Vast, and scarcely comprehensible as such changes must ever appear, yet they have all occurred within a period, recent when compared with the history of the Cordillera. And the Cordillera itself is absolutely modern as compared with many of the fossiliferous strata of Europe and America. April 1st. We crossed the Upsalata Range, and at night slept at the Custom House, the only inhabited spot on the plain. Shortly before leaving the mountains, there was a very extraordinary view. Red, purple, green, and quite white sedimentary rocks, alternating with black lavas, were broken up and thrown into all kinds of disorder by masses of porphyry of every shade of color. From dark brown to the brightest lilac. It was the first view I ever saw, which really resembled those pretty sections which geologists make of the inside of the earth. The next day we crossed the plain, and followed the course of the same great mountain stream which flows by Luxon. Here it was a furious torrent, quite impassable, and appeared larger than in the low country, as was the case with the rivulet of Villa Vicencio. On the evening of the succeeding day, we reached the Rio de las Vacas, which is considered the worst stream in the Cordillera to cross. As all these rivers have a rapid and short course, and are formed by the melting of the snow, the hour of the day makes a considerable difference in their volume. In the evening the stream is muddy and full, but about daybreak it becomes clearer, and much less impetuous. This we found to be the case with the Rio Vacas, and in the morning we crossed it with little difficulty. The scenery thus far was very uninteresting, compared with that of the Portillo Pass. Little can be seen beyond the bare walls of the one grand flat-bottomed valley, which the road follows up to the highest crest. The valley and the huge rocky mountains are extremely barren, during the two previous nights the poor mules had absolutely nothing to eat, for excepting a few low resinous bushes. Scarcely a plant can be seen. In the course of this day we crossed some of the worst passes in the Cordillera, but their danger has been much exaggerated. I was told that if I attempted to pass on foot, my head would turn giddy, and that there was no room to dismount. But I did not see a place where anyone might not have walked over backwards, or got off his mule on either side. One of the bad passes, called Los Animas, the souls, I had crossed, and did not find out till a day afterwards, that it was one of the awful dangers. No doubt there are many parts in which, if the mule should stumble, the rider would be hurled down a great precipice, but of this there is little chance. I dare say, in the spring, the Laderas, or roads, which each year are formed anew across the piles of fallen detritus, are very bad, but from what I saw, I suspect the real danger is nothing. With cargo mules the case is rather different, for the loads project so far, that the animals, occasionally running against each other, or against a point of rock, lose their balance. And are thrown down the precipices. In crossing the rivers I can well believe that the difficulty may be very great, at this season there was little trouble, but in the summer they must be very hazardous. I can quite imagine, as Sir F. Head describes, the different expressions of those who have passed the gulf, and those who are passing. I never heard of any man being drowned, but with loaded mules it frequently happens. The arriero tells you to show your mule the best line, and then allow her to cross as she likes, the cargo mule takes a bad line, and is often lost. April 4th. From the Rio de las Vacas to the Puente del Incas, half a day's journey. As there was pasture for the mules, and geology for me, we bivouacked here for the night. When one hears of a natural bridge, one pictures to oneself some deep and narrow ravine, across which a bold mass of rock has fallen, or a great arch hollowed out like the vault of a cavern. Instead of this, 
The Inca's bridge consists of a crust of stratified shingle cemented together by the deposits of the neighboring hot springs. It appears, as if the stream had scooped out a channel on one side, leaving an overhanging ledge, which was met by earth and stones falling down from the opposite cliff. Certainly an oblique junction, as would happen in such a case, was very distinct on one side. The bridge of the Incas is by no means worthy of the great monarchs whose name it bears. Fifth. We had a long day's ride across the central ridge, from the Incas bridge to the Ojos del Agua, which are situated near the lowest casucha on the Chilean side. These casuchas are round little towers, with steps outside to reach the floor, which is raised some feet above the ground on account of the snowdrifts. They are eight in number, and under the Spanish government were kept during the winter well stored with food and charcoal, and each courier had a master key. Now they only answer the purpose of caves, or rather dungeons. Seated on some little eminence, they are not, however, ill-suited to the surrounding scene of desolation. The zigzag ascent of the cumber, or the partition of the waters, was very steep and tedious, its height, according to Mr. Pentland, is 12,454 feet. The road did not pass over any perpetual snow, although there were patches of it on both hands. The wind on the summit was exceedingly cold, but it was impossible not to stop for a few minutes to admire, again and again, the color of the heavens. And the brilliant transparency of the atmosphere. The scenery was grand, to the westward there was a fine chaos of mountains, divided by profound ravines. Some snow generally falls before this period of the season, and it has even happened that the Cordillera have been finally closed by this time. But we were most fortunate. The sky, by night and by day, was cloudless, excepting a few round little masses of vapor, that floated over the highest pinnacles. I have often seen these islets in the sky, marking the position of the Cordillera, when the far distant mountains have been hidden beneath the horizon. April 6. In the morning we found some thief had stolen one of our mules, and the bell of the Madrina. We therefore rode only two or three miles down the valley, and stayed there the ensuing day in hopes of recovering the mule, which the arriero thought had been hidden in some ravine. The scenery in this part had assumed a Chilean character, the lower sides of the mountains, dotted over with the pale evergreen quillay tree, and with the great chandelier-like cactus. Are certainly more to be admired than the bare eastern valleys. But I cannot quite agree with the admiration expressed by some travelers. The extreme pleasure, I suspect, is chiefly owing to the prospect of a good fire and of a good supper. After escaping from the cold regions above, and I am sure I most heartily participated in these feelings. 8th, we left the valley of the Aconcagua, by which we had descended, and reached in the evening a cottage near the Villa del Saint Rosa. The fertility of the plain was delightful, the autumn being advanced, the leaves of many of the fruit trees were falling. And of the laborers, some were busy in drying figs and peaches on the roofs of their cottages, while others were gathering the grapes from the vineyards. It was a pretty scene. But I missed that pensive stillness which makes the autumn in England indeed the evening of the year. On the tenth we reached Santiago, where I received a very kind and hospitable reception from Mr. Called Clu. My excursion only cost me twenty-four days, and never did I more deeply enjoy an equal space of time. A few days afterwards I returned to Mr. Corfield's house at Valparaiso. Chapter 16 Northern Chile and Peru Coast Road to Coquimba, Great Loads Carried by the Miners, Coquimba, Earthquake, step formed Terrace, Absence of Recent Deposits, Contemporaneousness of the Tertiary Formations, Excursion Up the Valley, Road to Guasco, Deserts, Valley of Copiapo, Rain and Earthquakes, Hydrophobia, The Despoblado, Indian Ruins, Probable Change of Climate, Riverbed Arched by an Earthquake, Cold Gales of Wind, Noises from a Hill, Iquique, Salt Alluvium, Nitrate of Soda, Lima, Unhealthy Country, Ruins of Calau. Overthrown by an earthquake, recent subsidence, elevated shells on San Lorenzo, their decomposition, plain with embedded shells and fragments of pottery, antiquity of the Indian race. April 27th, 
I set out on a journey to Kakimba, and thence through Guasco to Copiapo, where Captain Fitz Roy kindly offered to pick me up in the Beagle. The distance in a straight line along the shore northward is only 420 miles, but my mode of traveling made it a very long journey. I bought four horses and two mules, the latter carrying the luggage on alternate days. The six animals together only cost the value of two five, and at Copiapo I sold them again for twenty-three. We traveled in the same independent manner as before, cooking our own meals, and sleeping in the open air. As we rode towards the Vino del Mar, I took a farewell view of Valparaiso, and admired its picturesque appearance. For geological purposes I made a detour from the high road to the foot of the Bell of Quiloda. We passed through an alluvial district rich in gold, to the neighborhood of Limache, where we slept. Washing for gold supports the inhabitants of numerous hovels, scattered along the sides of each little rivulet. But, like all those whose gains are uncertain, they are unthrifty in all their habits, and consequently poor. 28 th, in the afternoon we arrived at a cottage at the foot of the Bell Mountain. The inhabitants were freeholders, which is not very usual in Chile. They supported themselves on the produce of a garden and a little field, but were very poor. Capital is here so deficient, that the people are obliged to sell their green corn while standing in the field, in order to buy necessaries for the ensuing year. Wheat in consequence was dearer in the very district of its production than at Valparaiso, where the contractors live. The next day we joined the main road to Coquimba. At night there was a very light shower of rain, this was the first drop that had fallen since the heavy rain of September 11th and 12th, which detained me a prisoner at the Baths of Coquines. The interval was seven and a half months, but the rain this year in Chile was rather later than usual. The distant Andes were now covered by a thick mass of snow, and were a glorious sight. May 2nd. The road continued to follow the coast, at no great distance from the sea. The few trees and bushes which are common in central Chile decreased rapidly in numbers, and were replaced by a tall plant, something like a yucca in appearance. The surface of the country, on a small scale, was singularly broken and irregular, abrupt little peaks of rock rising out of small plains or basins. The indented coast and the bottom of the neighboring sea, studded with breakers, would, if converted into dry land, present similar forms. And such a conversion without doubt has taken place in the part over which we rode. 3 R.D., Quilomary to Conchali. The country became more and more barren. In the valleys there was scarcely sufficient water for any irrigation, and the intermediate land was quite bare, not supporting even goats. In the spring, after the winter showers, a thin pasture rapidly springs up, and cattle are then driven down from the cordillera to graze for a short time. It is curious to observe how the seeds of the grass and other plants seem to accommodate themselves, as if by an acquired habit. To the quantity of rain which falls upon different parts of this coast. One shower far northward at Copiapo produces as great an effect on the vegetation, as two at Guasco, and three or four in this district. At Valparaiso a winter so dry as greatly to injure the pasture, would at Guasco produce the most unusual abundance. Proceeding northward, the quantity of rain does not appear to decrease in strict proportion to the latitude. At Conchali, which is only 67 miles north of Valparaiso, rain is not expected till the end of May. Whereas at Valparaiso some generally falls early in April, the annual quantity is likewise small in proportion to the lateness of the season at which it commences. Fourth. Finding the coast road devoid of interest of any kind, we turned inland towards the mining district and valley of Illapel. This valley, like every other in Chile, is level, broad, and very fertile, it is bordered on each side, either by cliffs of stratified shingle, or by bare rocky mountains. Above the straight line of the uppermost irrigating ditch, all is brown as on a high road, while all below is of as bright a green as verdigris, from the beds of alfalfa, a kind of clover. We proceeded to Los Hornos, another mining district, where the principal hill was drilled with holes, like a great ant's nest. The Chilean miners are a peculiar race of men in their habits. 
living for weeks together in the most desolate spots, when they descend to the villages on feast days, there is no excess of extravagance into which they do not run. They sometimes gain a considerable sum, and then, like sailors with prize money, they try how soon they can contrive to squander it. They drink excessively, buy quantities of clothes, and in a few days return penniless to their miserable abodes, there to work harder than beasts of burden. This thoughtlessness, as with sailors, is evidently the result of a similar manner of life. Their daily food is found them, and they acquire no habits of carefulness, moreover, temptation and the means of yielding to it are placed in their power at the same time. On the other hand, in Cornwall, and some other parts of England, where the system of selling part of the vein is followed, the miners, from being obliged to act and think for themselves, are a singularly intelligent and well-conducted set of men. The dress of the Chilean miner is peculiar and rather picturesque he wears a very long shirt of some dark-colored baize, with a leathern apron. The whole being fastened round his waist by a bright-colored sash. His trousers are very broad, and his small cap of scarlet cloth is made to fit the head closely. We met a party of these miners in full costume, carrying the body of one of their companions to be buried. They marched at a very quick trot, for men supporting the corpse. One set having run as hard as they could for about two hundred yards, were relieved by four others, who had previously dashed on ahead on horseback. Thus they proceeded, encouraging each other by wild cries, altogether the scene formed a most strange funeral. We continued traveling northward, in a zigzag line. Sometimes stopping a day to geologize. The country was so thinly inhabited, and the track so obscure, that we often had difficulty in finding our way. On the twelfth I stayed at some mines. The ore in this case was not considered particularly good, but from being abundant it was supposed the mine would sell for about thirty or forty thousand dollars, that is, six zero 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 or eight zero zero zero. Yet it had been bought by one of the English associations for an ounce of gold, three eighths. The ore is yellow parites, which, as I have already remarked, before the arrival of the English, was not supposed to contain a particle of copper. On a scale of profits nearly as great as in the above instance, piles of cinders, abounding with minute globules of metallic copper, were purchased, yet with these advantages, the mining associations, as is well known, contrived to lose immense sums of money. The folly of the greater number of the commissioners and shareholders amounted to infatuation, a thousand pounds per annum given in some cases to entertain the Chilean authorities, libraries of well-bound geological books, miners brought out for particular metals. As tin, which are not found in Chile, contracts to supply the miners with milk, in parts where there are no cows, machinery, where it could not possibly be used, and a hundred similar arrangements. Bore witness to our absurdity, and to this day afford amusement to the natives. Yet there can be no doubt, that the same capital well employed in these mines would have yielded an immense return. A confidential man of business, a practical miner and a sayer, would have been all that was required. Captain Head has described the wonderful load which the apires, truly beasts of burden, carry up from the deepest mines. I confess I thought the account exaggerated, so that I was glad to take an opportunity of weighing one of the loads, which I picked out by hazard. It required considerable exertion on my part, when standing directly over it, to lift it from the ground. The load was considered underweight when found to be 197 pounds. The apire had carried this up 80 perpendicular yards, part of the way by a steep passage, but the greater part up notched poles, placed in a zigzag line up the shaft. According to the general regulation, the apire is not allowed to halt for breath, except the mine is 600 feet deep. The average load is considered as rather more than 200 pounds. And I have been assured that one of 300 pounds, 22 stone and a half, by way of a trial has been brought up from the deepest mine. At this time the apires were bringing up the usual load 12 times in the day, that is 2,400 pounds from 80 yards deep, and they were employed in the intervals in breaking and picking ore. These men, excepting from accidents, are healthy, and appear cheerful. 
their bodies are not very muscular. They rarely eat meat once a week, and never oftener, and then only the hard dry charka. Although with a knowledge that the labor was voluntary, it was nevertheless quite revolting to see the state in which they reached the mouth of the mine. Their bodies bent forward, leaning with their arms on the steps, their legs bowed, their muscles quivering, the perspiration streaming from their faces over their breasts, their nostrils distended. The corners of their mouth forcibly drawn back, and the expulsion of their breath most laborious. Each time they draw their breath, they utter an articulate cry of, I, which ends in a sound rising from deep in the chest, but shrill like the note of a fife. After staggering to the pile of ore, they emptied the carpaccio. In two or three seconds recovering their breath, they wiped the sweat from their brows, and apparently quite fresh descended the mine again at a quick pace. This appears to me a wonderful instance of the amount of labor which habit, for it can be nothing else, will enable a man to endure. In the evening, talking with the mayor domo of these mines about the number of foreigners now scattered over the whole country, he told me that, though quite a young man, he remembers when he was a boy at school at Kakimba, a holiday being given to see the captain of an English ship, who was brought to the city to speak to the governor. He believes that nothing would have induced any boy in the school, himself included, to have gone close to the Englishman. So deeply had they been impressed with an idea of the heresy, contamination, and evil to be derived from contact with such a person. To this day they relate the atrocious actions of the buccaneers. And especially of one man, who took away the figure of the Virgin Mary, and returned the year after for that of St. Joseph, saying it was a pity the lady should not have a husband. I heard also of an old lady who, at a dinner at Kakimba, remarked how wonderfully strange it was that she should have lived to dine in the same room with an Englishman. For she remembered as a girl, that twice, at the mere cry of, Los Ingleses, every soul, carrying what valuables they could, had taken to the mountains. 14th. We reached Kakimba, where we stayed a few days. The town is remarkable for nothing but its extreme quietness. It is said to contain from 6,000 to 8,000 inhabitants. On the morning of the 17th it rained lightly, the first time this year, for about five hours. The farmers, who plant corn near the seacoast where the atmosphere is most humid, taking advantage of this shower, would break up the ground, after a second they would put the seed in. And if a third shower should fall, they would reap a good harvest in the spring. It was interesting to watch the effect of this trifling amount of moisture. Twelve hours afterwards the ground appeared as dry as ever, yet after an interval of ten days, all the hills were faintly tinged with green patches. The grass being sparingly scattered in hair-like fibers a full inch in length. Before this shower every part of the surface was bare as on a high road. In the evening, Captain Fitzroy and myself were dining with Mr. Edwards, an English resident well known for his hospitality by all who have visited Kakimba, when a sharp earthquake happened. I heard the forecoming rumble, but from the screams of the ladies, the running of the servants, and the rush of several of the gentlemen to the doorway, I could not distinguish the motion. Some of the women afterwards were crying with terror, and one gentleman said he should not be able to sleep all night, or if he did, it would only be to dream of falling houses. The father of this person had lately lost all his property at Talcahuano, and he himself had only just escaped a falling roof at Valparaiso, in 1822. He mentioned a curious coincidence which then happened, he was playing at cards, when a German, one of the party, got up, and said he would never sit in a room in these countries with the door shut. As owing to his having done so, he had nearly lost his life at Copiapo. Accordingly he opened the door, and no sooner had he done this, than he cried out, Here it comes again, and the famous shock commenced. The whole party escaped. The danger in an earthquake is not from the time lost in opening the door, but from the chance of its becoming jammed by the movement of the walls. It is impossible to be much surprised at the fear which natives and old residents, though some of them known to be men of great command of mind, so generally experienced during earthquakes. I think, however, this excess of panic may be partly attributed to a want of habit in governing their fear, as it is not a feeling they are ashamed of. 
Indeed, the natives do not like to see a person indifferent. I heard of two Englishmen who, sleeping in the open air during a smart shock, knowing that there was no danger, did not rise. The natives cried out indignantly, look at those heretics, they do not even get out of their beds. I spent some days in examining the step-form terraces of Shingle, first noticed by Captain B. Hall, and believed by Mr. Lyell to have been formed by the sea, during the gradual rising of the land. This certainly is the true explanation, for I found numerous shells of existing species on these terraces. Five narrow, gently sloping, fringe-like terraces rise one behind the other, and where best developed are formed of shingle, they front the bay, and sweep up both sides of the valley. At Guasco, north of Coquimba, the phenomenon is displayed on a much grander scale, so as to strike with surprise even some of the inhabitants. The terraces are there much broader, and may be called plains, in some parts there are six of them, but generally only five, they run up the valley for thirty-seven miles from the coast. These step-formed terraces or fringes closely resemble those in the valley of S. Cruz, and, except in being on a smaller scale, those great ones along the whole coastline of Patagonia. They have undoubtedly been formed by the denuding power of the sea, during long periods of rest in the gradual elevation of the continent. Shells of many existing species not only lie on the surface of the terraces at Kakimba, to a height of 250 feet, but are embedded in a friable calcareous rock, which in some places is as much as between 20 and 30 feet in thickness, but is of little extent. These modern beds rest on an ancient tertiary formation containing shells, apparently all extinct. Although I examined so many hundred miles of coast on the Pacific, as well as Atlantic side of the continent, I found no regular strata containing seashells of recent species. Excepting at this place, and at a few points northward on the road to Guasco. This fact appears to me highly remarkable. For the explanation generally given by geologists, of the absence in any district of stratified fossiliferous deposits of a given period, namely, that the surface then existed as dry land, is not here applicable. For we know from the shells strewed on the surface and embedded in loose sand or mold that the land for thousands of miles along both coasts has lately been submerged. The explanation, no doubt, must be sought in the fact, that the whole southern part of the continent has been for a long time slowly rising. And therefore that all matter deposited along shore in shallow water, must have been soon brought up and slowly exposed to the wearing action of the sea beach. And it is only in comparatively shallow water that the greater number of marine organic beings can flourish. And in such water it is obviously impossible that strata of any great thickness can accumulate. To show the vast power of the wearing action of sea beaches, we need only appeal to the great cliffs along the present coast of Patagonia. And to the escarpments or ancient sea cliffs at different levels, one above another, on that same line of coast. The old underlying tertiary formation at Kakimba, appears to be of about the same age with several deposits on the coast of Chile, of which that of Navedad is the principal one. And with the great formation of Patagonia. Both at Navedad and in Patagonia there is evidence, that since the shells, a list of which has been seen by Professor E. Forbes, their entombed were living, there has been a subsidence of several hundred feet, as well as an ensuing elevation. It may naturally be asked, how it comes that, although no extensive fossiliferous deposits of the recent period, nor of any period intermediate between it and the ancient tertiary epoch, have been preserved on either side of the continent, yet that at this ancient tertiary epoch, sedimentary matter containing fossil remains, should have been deposited and preserved at different points in north and south lines, over a space of 1,100 miles on the shores of the Pacific, and of at least one. 350 miles on the shores of the Atlantic, and in an east and west line of 700 miles across the widest part of the continent? I believe the explanation is not difficult, and that it is perhaps applicable to nearly analogous facts observed in other quarters of the world. Considering the enormous power of denudation which the sea possesses, as shown by numberless facts, it is not probable that a sedimentary deposit, when being appraised, could pass through the ordeal of the beach, 
so as to be preserved in sufficient masses to last to a distant period. Without it were originally of wide extent and of considerable thickness, now it is impossible on a moderately shallow bottom, which alone is favorable to most living creatures. That a thick and widely extended covering of sediment could be spread out, without the bottom sank down to receive the successive layers. This seems to have actually taken place at about the same period in southern Patagonia and Chile, though these places are a thousand miles apart. Hence, if prolonged movements of approximately contemporaneous subsidence are generally widely extensive. As I am strongly inclined to believe from my examination of the coral reefs of the great oceans, or if, confining our view to South America. The subsiding movements have been coextensive with those of elevation, by which, within the same period of existing shells, the shores of Peru, Chile, Tierra del Fuego, Patagonia, and La Plata have been upraised, then we can see that at the same time, at far distant points, circumstances would have been favorable to the formation of fossiliferous deposits of wide extent and of considerable thickness. And such deposits, consequently, would have a good chance of resisting the wear and tear of successive beach lines, and of lasting to a future epoch. May 21. I set out in company with Don Jose Edwards to the silver mine of Arqueros, and thence up the valley of Coquimba. Passing through a mountainous country, we reached by nightfall the mines belonging to Mr. Edwards. I enjoyed my night's rest here from a reason which will not be fully appreciated in England namely, the absence of fleas. The rooms in Coquimba swarm with them. But they will not live here at the height of only three or four thousand feet, it can scarcely be the trifling diminution of temperature. But some other cause which destroys these troublesome insects at this place. The mines are now in a bad state, though they formerly yielded about two thousand pounds in weight of silver a year. It has been said that a person with a copper mine will gain, with silver he may gain. But with gold he is sure to lose. This is not true, all the large Chilean fortunes have been made by mines of the more precious metals. A short time since an English physician returned to England from Copiapo, taking with him the profits of one share of a silver mine, which amounted to about 24,000. No doubt a copper mine with care is a sure game, whereas the other is gambling, or rather taking a ticket in a lottery. The owners lose great quantities of rich ores. For no precautions can prevent robberies. I heard of a gentleman laying a bet with another, that one of his men should rob him before his face. The ore when brought out of the mine is broken into pieces, and the useless stone thrown on one side. A couple of the miners who were thus employed, pitched, as if by accident, two fragments away at the same moment, and then cried out for a joke, let us see which rolls furthest. The owner, who was standing by, bet a cigar with his friend on the race. The miner by this means watched the very point amongst the rubbish where the stone lay. In the evening he picked it up and carried it to his master, showing him a rich mass of silver ore, and saying, this was the stone on which you won a cigar by its rolling so far. May 23rd. We descended into the fertile valley of Coquimba, and followed it till we reached an hacienda belonging to a relation of Don Jose, where we stayed the next day. I then rode one day's journey further, to see what were declared to be some petrified shells and beans, which latter turned out to be small quartz pebbles. We passed through several small villages. And the valley was beautifully cultivated, and the whole scenery very grand. We were here near the main cordillera, and the surrounding hills were lofty. In all parts of northern Chile, fruit trees produce much more abundantly at a considerable height near the Andes than in the lower country. The figs and grapes of this district are famous for their excellence, and are cultivated to a great extent. This valley is, perhaps, the most productive one north of Quiloda. I believe it contains, including Coquimba, 25,000 inhabitants. The next day I returned to the hacienda, and thence, together with Don Jose, to Coquimba. June 2nd. We set out for the valley of Guasco, following the coast road, which was considered rather less desert than the other. Our first day's ride was to a solitary house, called Yerba Buena, 
where there was pasture for our horses. The shower mentioned as having fallen, a fortnight ago, only reached about halfway to Guasco. We had, therefore, in the first part of our journey a most faint tinge of green, which soon faded quite away. Even where brightest, it was scarcely sufficient to remind one of the fresh turf and budding flowers of the spring of other countries. While traveling through these deserts one feels like a prisoner shut up in a gloomy court, who longs to see something green and to smell a moist atmosphere. June 3 R.D., Yerba Buena to Carizal. During the first part of the day we crossed a mountainous rocky desert, and afterwards a long deep sandy plain, strewed with broken seashells. There was very little water, and that little saline, the whole country, from the coast to the Cordillera, is an uninhabited desert. I saw traces only of one living animal in abundance, namely, the shells of a bulimus, which were collected together in extraordinary numbers on the driest spots. In the spring one humble little plant sends out a few leaves, and on these the snails feed. As they are seen only very early in the morning, when the ground is slightly damp with dew, the guascos believe that they are bred from it. I have observed in other places that extremely dry and sterile districts, where the soil is calcareous, are extraordinarily favorable to land shells. At Carizal there were a few cottages, some brackish water, and a trace of cultivation, but it was with difficulty that we purchased a little corn and straw for our horses. 40th, Carizal to Sauce. We continued to ride over desert plains, tenanted by large herds of guanaco. We crossed also the valley of Shanral. Which, although the most fertile one between Guasco and Coquimba, is very narrow, and produces so little pasture, that we could not purchase any for our horses. At Sauce we found a very civil old gentleman, superintendent of a copper smelting furnace. As an especial favor, he allowed me to purchase at a high price an armful of dirty straw, which was all the poor horses had for supper after their long day's journey. Few smelting furnaces are now at work in any part of Chile. It is found more profitable, on account of the extreme scarcity of firewood, and from the Chilean method of reduction being so unskillful, to ship the ore for Swansea. The next day we crossed some mountains to Freirina, in the valley of Guasco. During each day's ride further northward, the vegetation became more and more scanty. Even the great chandelier-like cactus was here replaced by a different and much smaller species. During the winter months, both in northern Chile and in Peru, a uniform bank of clouds hangs, at no great height, over the Pacific. From the mountains we had a very striking view of this white and brilliant aerial field, which sent arms up the valleys, leaving islands and promontories in the same manner. As the sea does in the Chonos Archipelago and in Tierra del Fuego. We stayed two days at Ferina. In the valley of Guasco there are four small towns. At the mouth there is the port, a spot entirely desert, and without any water in the immediate neighborhood. Five leagues higher up stands Freirina, a long straggling village, with decent whitewashed houses. Again, ten leagues further up Baliner is situated, and above this Guasco Alto, a horticultural village, famous for its dried fruit. On a clear day the view up the valley is very fine. The straight opening terminates in the far distant snowy cordillera, on each side an infinity of crossing lines are blended together in a beautiful haze. The foreground is singular from the number of parallel and step-formed terraces, and the included strip of green valley, with its willow bushes, is contrasted on both hands with the naked hills. That the surrounding country was most barren will be readily believed, when it is known that a shower of rain had not fallen during the last thirteen months. The inhabitants heard with the greatest envy of the rain at Coquimba, from the appearance of the sky they had hopes of equally good fortune, which, a fortnight afterwards, were realized. I was at Copiapo at the time, and there the people, with equal envy, talked of the abundant rain at Guasco. After two or three very dry years, perhaps with not more than one shower during the whole time, a rainy year generally follows, and this does more harm than even the drought. The rivers swell, and cover with gravel and sand the narrow strips of ground, which alone are fit for cultivation. The floods also injure the irrigating ditches. 
Great devastation had thus been caused three years ago. June 8. We rode on to Ballinor, which takes its name from Ballinac in Ireland, the birthplace of the family of O'Higgins, who, under the Spanish government, were presidents and generals in Chile. As the rocky mountains on each hand were concealed by clouds, the terrace-like plains gave to the valley an appearance like that of Santa Cruz in Patagonia. After spending one day at Ballinor I set out, on the 10th, for the upper part of the valley of Copiapo. We rode all day over an uninteresting country. I am tired of repeating the epithets barren and sterile. These words, however, as commonly used, are comparative. I have always applied them to the plains of Patagonia, which can boast of spiny bushes and some tufts of grass, and this is absolute fertility, as compared with northern Chile. Here again, there are not many spaces of two hundred yards square, where some little bush, cactus or lichen, may not be discovered by careful examination. And in the soil seeds lie dormant ready to spring up during the first rainy winter. In Peru real deserts occur over wide tracts of country. In the evening we arrived at a valley, in which the bed of the streamlet was damp, following it up, we came to tolerably good water. During the night, the stream, from not being evaporated and absorbed so quickly, flows a league lower down than during the day. Sticks were plentiful for firewood, so that it was a good place to bivouac for us, but for the poor animals there was not a mouthful to eat. June 11. We rode without stopping for twelve hours till we reached an old smelting furnace, where there was water and firewood, but our horses again had nothing to eat, being shut up in an old courtyard. The line of road was hilly, and the distant views interesting, from the varied colors of the bare mountains. It was almost a pity to see the sun shining constantly over so useless a country. Such splendid weather ought to have brightened fields and pretty gardens. The next day we reached the valley of Copiapo. I was heartily glad of it. For the whole journey was a continued source of anxiety. It was most disagreeable to hear, whilst eating our own suppers, our horses gnawing the posts to which they were tied, and to have no means of relieving their hunger. To all appearance, however, the animals were quite fresh, and no one could have told that they had eaten nothing for the last fifty-five hours. I had a letter of introduction to Mr. Bingley, who received me very kindly at the Hacienda of Petrero Seco. This estate is between twenty and thirty miles long, but very narrow, being generally only two fields wide, one on each side the river. In some parts the estate is of no width, that is to say, the land cannot be irrigated, and therefore is valueless, like the surrounding rocky desert. The small quantity of cultivated land in the whole line of valley, does not so much depend on inequalities of level, and consequent unfitness for irrigation, as on the small supply of water. The river this year was remarkably full, here, high up the valley, it reached to the horse's belly, and was about fifteen yards wide, and rapid. Lower down it becomes smaller and smaller, and is generally quite lost, as happened during one period of thirty years, so that not a drop entered the sea. The inhabitants watch a storm over the Cordillera with great interest, as one good fall of snow provides them with water for the ensuing year. This is of infinitely more consequence than rain in the lower country. Rain, as often as it falls, which is about once in every two or three years, is a great advantage, because the cattle and mules can for some time afterwards find a little pasture in the mountains. But without snow on the Andes, desolation extends throughout the valley. It is on record that three times nearly all the inhabitants have been obliged to emigrate to the south. This year there was plenty of water, and every man irrigated his ground as much as he chose. But it has frequently been necessary to post soldiers at the sluices, to see that each estate took only its proper allowance during so many hours in the week. The valley is said to contain twelve thousand souls, but its produce is sufficient only for three months in the year, the rest of the supply being drawn from Valparaiso and the south. Before the discovery of the famous silver mines of Chanancillo, Copiapo was in a rapid state of decay, but now it is in a very thriving condition. And the town, which was completely overthrown by an earthquake, has been rebuilt. 
The valley of Copiapo, forming a mere ribbon of green in a desert, runs in a very southerly direction. So that it is of considerable length to its source in the Cordillera. The valleys of Guasco and Copiapo may both be considered as long narrow islands, separated from the rest of Chile by deserts of rock instead of by salt water. Northward of these, there is one other very miserable valley, called Poposo, which contains about two hundred souls. And then there extends the real desert of Atacama, a barrier far worse than the most turbulent ocean. After staying a few days at Petrero Seco, I proceeded up the valley to the house of Don Benito Cruz, to whom I had a letter of introduction. I found him most hospitable. Indeed it is impossible to bear too strong testimony to the kindness with which travelers are received in almost every part of South America. The next day I hired some mules to take me by the ravine of Jalquera into the central cordillera. On the second night the weather seemed to foretell a storm of snow or rain, and whilst lying in our beds we felt a trifling shock of an earthquake. The connection between earthquakes and the weather has been often disputed, it appears to me to be a point of great interest, which is little understood. Humboldt has remarked in one part of the personal narrative 145 that it would be difficult for any person who had long resided in New Andalusia, or in Lower Peru. To deny that there exists some connection between these phenomena, in another part, however he seems to think the connection fanciful. At Guayaquil it is said that a heavy shower in the dry season is invariably followed by an earthquake. In northern Chile, from the extreme infrequency of rain, or even of weather foreboding rain, the probability of accidental coincidences becomes very small. Yet the inhabitants are here most firmly convinced of some connection between the state of the atmosphere and of the trembling of the ground, I was much struck by this when mentioning to some people at Copiapo that there had been a sharp shock at Coquimba, they immediately cried out. How fortunate! There will be plenty of pasture there this year. To their minds an earthquake foretold rain as surely as rain foretold abundant pasture. Certainly it did so happen that on the very day of the earthquake, that shower of rain fell, which I have described as in ten days' time producing a thin sprinkling of grass. At other times rain has followed earthquakes at a period of the year when it is a far greater prodigy than the earthquake itself, this happened after the shock of November, 1822, and again in 1829. At Valparaiso. Also after that of September, 1833, at Tacna. A person must be somewhat habituated to the climate of these countries to perceive the extreme improbability of rain falling at such seasons. Except as a consequence of some law quite unconnected with the ordinary course of the weather. In the cases of great volcanic eruptions, as that of Cosagina, where torrents of rain fell at a time of the year most unusual for it, and almost unprecedented in Central America. It is not difficult to understand that the volumes of vapor and clouds of ashes might have disturbed the atmospheric equilibrium. Humboldt extends this view to the case of earthquakes unaccompanied by eruptions. But I can hardly conceive it possible that the small quantity of aeriform fluids which then escape from the fissured ground can produce such remarkable effects. There appears much probability in the view first proposed by Mr. P. Scrope, that when the barometer is low, and when rain might naturally be expected to fall, the diminished pressure of the atmosphere over a wide extent of country might well determine the precise day on which the earth, already stretched to the utmost by the subterranean forces, should yield, crack, and consequently tremble. It is, however, doubtful how far this idea will explain the circumstances of torrents of rain falling in the dry season during several days, after an earthquake unaccompanied by an eruption. Such cases seem to bespeak some more intimate connection between the atmospheric and subterranean regions. Finding little of interest in this part of the ravine, we retraced our steps to the house of Don Benito, where I stayed two days collecting fossil shells and wood. Great prostrate silicified trunks of trees, embedded in a conglomerate, were extraordinarily numerous. I measured one, which was fifteen feet in circumference, how surprising it is that every atom of the woody matter in this great cylinder should have been removed and replaced by silex so perfectly. That each vessel and pore is preserved. These trees flourished at about the period of our lower chalk, 
they all belonged to the fur tribe. It was amusing to hear the inhabitants discussing the nature of the fossil shells which I collected, almost in the same terms as were used a century ago in Europe, namely, whether or not they had been thus born by nature. My geological examination of the country generally created a good deal of surprise amongst the Chilenos, it was long before they could be convinced that I was not hunting for mines. This was sometimes troublesome, I found the most ready way of explaining my employment, was to ask them how it was that they themselves were not curious concerning earthquakes and volcanoes? Why some springs were hot and others cold, why there were mountains in Chile, and not a hill in La Plata? These bare questions at once satisfied and silenced the greater number. Some, however, like a few in England who are a century behindhand, thought that all such inquiries were useless and impious. And that it was quite sufficient that God had thus made the mountains. An order had recently been issued that all stray dogs should be killed, and we saw many lying dead on the road. A great number had lately gone mad, and several men had been bitten and had died in consequence. On several occasions hydrophobia has prevailed in this valley. It is remarkable thus to find so strange and dreadful a disease, appearing time after time in the same isolated spot. It has been remarked that certain villages in England are in like manner much more subject to this visitation than others. Dar. Ananya states that hydrophobia was first known in South America in 1803, this statement is corroborated by Azara and Aloha having never heard of it in their time. Dar. Ananya says that it broke out in Central America, and slowly traveled southward. It reached Arequipa in 1807. And it is said that some men there, who had not been bitten, were affected, as were some negroes, who had eaten a bullock which had died of hydrophobia. At Ica 42 people thus miserably perished. The disease came on between 12 and 90 days after the bite, and in those cases where it did come on, death ensued invariably within five days. After 1808, a long interval ensued without any cases. On inquiry, I did not hear of hydrophobia in Van Diemen's land, or in Australia. And Birchall says, that during the five years he was at the Cape of Good Hope, he never heard of an instance of it. Webster asserts that at the Azores hydrophobia has never occurred. And the same assertion has been made with respect to Mauritius and St. Helena. 146 In so strange a disease some information might possibly be gained by considering the circumstances under which it originates in distant climates. For it is improbable that a dog already bitten, should have been brought to these distant countries. At night, a stranger arrived at the house of Don Benito, and asked permission to sleep there. He said he had been wandering about the mountains for seventeen days, having lost his way. He started from Guasco, and being accustomed to traveling in the Cordillera, did not expect any difficulty in following the track to Copiapo. But he soon became involved in a labyrinth of mountains, whence he could not escape. Some of his mules had fallen over precipices, and he had been in great distress. His chief difficulty arose from not knowing where to find water in the lower country, so that he was obliged to keep bordering the central ranges. We returned down the valley, and on the twenty-second reached the town of Copiapo. The lower part of the valley is broad, forming a fine plain like that of Quiloda. The town covers a considerable space of ground, each house possessing a garden, but it is an uncomfortable place, and the dwellings are poorly furnished. Everyone seems bent on the one object of making money, and then migrating as quickly as possible. All the inhabitants are more or less directly concerned with mines. And mines and ores are the sole subjects of conversation. Necessaries of all sorts are extremely dear. As the distance from the town to the port is eighteen leagues, and the land carriage very expensive. A fowl costs five or six shillings, meat is nearly as dear as in England. Firewood, or rather sticks, are brought on donkeys from a distance of two and three days' journey within the Cordillera and pasturage for animals is a shilling a day, all this for South America is wonderfully exorbitant. June 26. I hired a guide and eight mules to take me into the Cordillera by a different line from my last excursion. 
As the country was utterly desert, we took a cargo and a half of barley mixed with chopped straw. About two leagues above the town a broad valley called the Despoblado, or uninhabited, branches off from that one by which we had arrived. Although a valley of the grandest dimensions, and leading to a pass across the Cordillera, yet it is completely dry, excepting perhaps for a few days during some very rainy winter. The sides of the crumbling mountains were furrowed by scarcely any ravines, and the bottom of the main valley, filled with shingle, was smooth and nearly level. No considerable torrent could ever have flowed down this bed of shingle, for if it had, a great cliff-bounded channel, as in all the southern valleys, would assuredly have been formed. I feel little doubt that this valley, as well as those mentioned by travelers in Peru, were left in the state we now see them by the waves of the sea, as the land slowly rose. I observed in one place, where the Despoblado was joined by a ravine, which in almost any other chain would have been called a grand valley, that its bed, though composed merely of sand and gravel, was higher than that of its tributary. A mere rivulet of water, in the course of an hour, would have cut a channel for itself, but it was evident that ages had passed away, and no such rivulet had drained this great tributary. It was curious to behold the machinery, if such a term may be used, for the drainage, all, with the last trifling exception, perfect, yet without any signs of action. Everyone must have remarked how mud banks, left by the retiring tide, imitate in miniature a country with hill and dale. And here we have the original model in rock, formed as the continent rose during the secular retirement of the ocean, instead of during the ebbing and flowing of the tides. If a shower of rain falls on the mud bank, when left dry, it deepens the already formed shallow lines of excavation. And so it is with the rain of successive centuries on the bank of rock and soil, which we call a continent. We rode on after it was dark, till we reached a side ravine with a small well, called Agua Amarga. The water deserved its name, for besides being saline it was most offensively putrid and bitter. So that we could not force ourselves to drink either tea or mate. I suppose the distance from the river of Copiapo to this spot was at least twenty-five or thirty English miles. In the whole space there was not a single drop of water, the country deserving the name of desert in the strictest sense. Yet about halfway we passed some old Indian ruins near Punta Gorda, I noticed also in front of some of the valleys, which branch off from the Despoblado. Two piles of stones placed a little way apart, and directed so as to point up the mouths of these small valleys. My companions knew nothing about them, and only answered my queries by their imperturbable, Quien sabe? I observed Indian ruins in several parts of the Cordillera, the most perfect which I saw, were the Ruinas de Tambillos, in the Uspallata Pass. Small square rooms were there huddled together in separate groups, some of the doorways were yet standing, they were formed by a cross slab of stone only about three feet high. Aloha has remarked on the lowness of the doors in the ancient Peruvian dwellings. These houses, when perfect, must have been capable of containing a considerable number of persons. Tradition says, that they were used as halting places for the Incas, when they crossed the mountains. Traces of Indian habitations have been discovered in many other parts, where it does not appear probable that they were used as mere resting places. But yet where the land is as utterly unfit for any kind of cultivation, as it is near the Tambillos or at the Incas Bridge, or in the Portillo Pass, at all which places I saw ruins. In the ravine of Jajual, near Aconcagua, where there is no pass, I heard of remains of houses situated at a great height, where it is extremely cold and sterile. At first I imagined that these buildings had been places of refuge, built by the Indians on the first arrival of the Spaniards. But I have since been inclined to speculate on the probability of a small change of climate. In this northern part of Chile, within the Cordillera, old Indian houses are said to be especially numerous, by digging amongst the ruins, bits of woolen articles, instruments of precious metals. And heads of Indian corn, are not unfrequently discovered, an arrowhead made of agate, and of precisely the same form with those now used in Tierra del Fuego, was given me. I am aware that the Peruvian Indians now frequently inhabit most lofty and bleak situations. 
but at Copiapo I was assured by men who had spent their lives in travelling through the Andes. That there were very many, muchisimas, buildings at heights so great as almost to border upon the perpetual snow, and in parts where there exist no passes. And where the land produces absolutely nothing, and what is still more extraordinary, where there is no water. Nevertheless it is the opinion of the people of the country, although they are much puzzled by the circumstance, that, from the appearance of the houses. The Indians must have used them as places of residence. In this valley, at Punta Gorda, the remains consisted of seven or eight square little rooms, which were of a similar form with those at Tambillos, but built chiefly of mud. Which the present inhabitants cannot, either here or, according to Aloha, in Peru, imitate in durability. They were situated in the most conspicuous and defenseless position, at the bottom of the flat broad valley. There was no water nearer than three or four leagues, and that only in very small quantity, and bad, the soil was absolutely sterile, I looked in vain even for a lichen adhering to the rocks. At the present day, with the advantage of beasts of burden, a mine, unless it were very rich, could scarcely be worked here with profit. Yet the Indians formerly chose it as a place of residence. If at the present time two or three showers of rain were to fall annually, instead of one, as now is the case during as many years, a small rill of water would probably be formed in this great valley. And then, by irrigation, which was formerly so well understood by the Indians, the soil would easily be rendered sufficiently productive to support a few families. I have convincing proofs that this part of the continent of South America has been elevated near the coast at least from 400 to 500, and in some parts from 1000 to 1300 feet. Since the epoch of existing shells. And further inland the rise possibly may have been greater. As the peculiarly arid character of the climate is evidently a consequence of the height of the Cordillera, we may feel almost sure that before the later elevations. The atmosphere could not have been so completely drained of its moisture as it now is. And as the rise has been gradual, so would have been the change in climate. On this notion of a change of climate since the buildings were inhabited, the ruins must be of extreme antiquity, but I do not think their preservation under the Chilean climate any great difficulty. We must also admit on this notion, and this perhaps is a greater difficulty, that man has inhabited South America for an immensely long period. Inasmuch as any change of climate effected by the elevation of the land must have been extremely gradual. At Valparaiso, within the last 220 years, the rise has been somewhat less than 19 feet, at Lima a sea beach has certainly been upheaved from 80 to 90 feet. Within the Indo-human period, but such small elevations could have had little power in deflecting the moisture-bringing atmospheric currents. Dr. Lund, however, found human skeletons in the caves of Brazil, the appearance of which induced him to believe that the Indian race has existed during a vast lapse of time in South America. When at Lima, I conversed on these subjects 147 with Mr. Gill, a civil engineer, who had seen much of the interior country. He told me that a conjecture of a change of climate had sometimes crossed his mind. But that he thought that the greater portion of land, now incapable of cultivation, but covered with Indian ruins, had been reduced to this state by the water conduits. Which the Indians formerly constructed on so wonderful a scale, having been injured by neglect and by subterranean movements. I may here mention, that the Peruvians actually carried their irrigating streams in tunnels through hills of solid rock. Mr. Gill told me, he had been employed professionally to examine one, he found the passage low, narrow, crooked, and not of uniform breadth, but of very considerable length. Is it not most wonderful that men should have attempted such operations, without the use of iron or gunpowder? Mr. Gill also mentioned to me a most interesting, and, as far as I am aware, quite unparalleled case, of a subterranean disturbance having changed the drainage of a country. Traveling from Casma to Juarez, not very far distant from Lima, he found a plain covered with ruins and marks of ancient cultivation but now quite barren. Near it was the dry course of a considerable river, whence the water for irrigation had formerly been conducted. 
There was nothing in the appearance of the watercourse to indicate that the river had not flowed there a few years previously, in some parts, beds of sand and gravel were spread out. In others, the solid rock had been worn into a broad channel, which in one spot was about forty yards in breadth and eight feet deep. It is self-evident that a person following up the course of a stream, will always ascend at a greater or less inclination, Mr. Gill, therefore, was much astonished, when walking up the bed of this ancient river, to find himself suddenly going downhill. He imagined that the downward slope had a fall of about forty or fifty feet perpendicular. We here have unequivocal evidence that a ridge had been uplifted right across the old bed of a stream. From the moment the river course was thus arched, the water must necessarily have been thrown back, and a new channel formed. From that moment, also, the neighboring plain must have lost its fertilizing stream, and become a desert. June 27. We set out early in the morning, and by midday reached the ravine of Papote, where there is a tiny rill of water, with a little vegetation, and even a few algaroba trees, a kind of mimosa. From having firewood, a smelting furnace had formerly been built here, we found a solitary man in charge of it, whose sole employment was hunting guanacos. At night it froze sharply. But having plenty of wood for our fire, we kept ourselves warm. 28 th, we continued gradually ascending, and the valley now changed into a ravine. During the day we saw several guanacos, and the track of the closely allied species, the vicuña, this latter animal is preeminently alpine in its habits. It seldom descends much below the limit of perpetual snow, and therefore haunts even a more lofty and sterile situation than the guanaco. The only other animal which we saw in any number was a small fox, I suppose this animal preys on the mice and other small rodents, which, as long as there is the least vegetation, subsist in considerable numbers in very desert places. In Patagonia, even on the borders of the Salinas, where a drop of fresh water can never be found, excepting dew, these little animals swarm. Next to lizards, mice appear to be able to support existence on the smallest and driest portions of the earth, even on islets in the midst of great oceans. The scene on all sides showed desolation, brightened and made palpable by a clear, unclouded sky. For a time such scenery is sublime, but this feeling cannot last, and then it becomes uninteresting. We bivouacked at the foot of the Primera Linea, or the first line of the partition of waters. The streams, however, on the east side do not flow to the Atlantic, but into an elevated district, in the middle of which there is a large saline, or salt lake. Thus forming a little Caspian Sea at the height, perhaps, of ten thousand feet. Where we slept, there were some considerable patches of snow, but they do not remain throughout the year. The winds in these lofty regions obey very regular laws. Every day a fresh breeze blows up the valley, and at night, an hour or two after sunset, the air from the cold regions above descends as through a funnel. This night it blew a gale of wind, and the temperature must have been considerably below the freezing point, for water in a vessel soon became a block of ice. No clothes seemed to pose any obstacle to the air, I suffered very much from the cold, so that I could not sleep, and in the morning rose with my body quite dull and benumbed. In the Cordillera further southward, people lose their lives from snowstorms, here, it sometimes happens from another cause. My guide, when a boy of fourteen years old, was passing the Cordillera with a party in the month of May. And while in the central parts, a furious gale of wind arose, so that the men could hardly cling on their mules, and stones were flying along the ground. The day was cloudless, and not a speck of snow fell, but the temperature was low. It is probable that the thermometer could not have stood very many degrees below the freezing point, but the effect on their bodies, ill protected by clothing, must have been in proportion to the rapidity of the current of cold air. The gale lasted for more than a day, the men began to lose their strength, and the mules would not move onwards. My guide's brother tried to return, but he perished, and his body was found two years afterwards. Lying by the side of his mule near the road, with the bridle still in his hand. Two other men in the party lost their fingers and toes, and out of two hundred mules and thirty cows, 
only fourteen mules escaped alive. Many years ago the whole of a large party are supposed to have perished from a similar cause, but their bodies to this day have never been discovered. The union of a cloudless sky, low temperature, and a furious gale of wind, must be, I should think, in all parts of the world an unusual occurrence. June 29 th, we gladly traveled down the valley to our former night's lodging, and thence to near the Agua Amarga. On July 1 we reached the valley of Copiapo. The smell of the fresh clover was quite delightful, after the scentless air of the dry, sterile despoblado. Whilst staying in the town I heard an account from several of the inhabitants, of a hill in the neighborhood which they called, El Bramador, the Roarer or Bellower. I did not at the time pay sufficient attention to the account. But, as far as I understood, the hill was covered by sand, and the noise was produced only when people, by ascending it, put the sand in motion. The same circumstances are described in detail on the authority of Seetzen and Ehrenberg 148 as the cause of the sounds which have been heard by many travelers on Mount Sinai near the Red Sea. One person with whom I conversed had himself heard the noise, he described it as very surprising. And he distinctly stated that, although he could not understand how it was caused, yet it was necessary to set the sand rolling down the acclivity. A horse walking over dry coarse sand, causes a peculiar chirping noise from the friction of the particles, a circumstance which I several times noticed on the coast of Brazil. Three days afterwards I heard of the Beagle's arrival at the port, distant eighteen leagues from the town. There is very little land cultivated down the valley. Its wide expanse supports a wretched wiry grass, which even the donkeys can hardly eat. This poorness of the vegetation is owing to the quantity of saline matter with which the soil is impregnated. The port consists of an assemblage of miserable little hovels, situated at the foot of a sterile plain. At present, as the river contains water enough to reach the sea, the inhabitants enjoy the advantage of having fresh water within a mile and a half. On the beach there were large piles of merchandise, and the little place had an air of activity. In the evening I gave my adios, with a hearty goodwill, to my companion Mariano Gonzalez, with whom I had ridden so many leagues in Chile. The next morning the Beagle sailed for Iquique. July 12th. We anchored in the port of Iquique, in Lat. 20 degrees 12 minutes, on the coast of Peru. The town contains about a thousand inhabitants, and stands on a little plain of sand at the foot of a great wall of rock, two thousand feet in height, here forming the coast. The whole is utterly desert. A light shower of rain falls only once in very many years. And the ravines consequently are filled with detritus, and the mountainsides covered by piles of fine white sand, even to a height of a thousand feet. During this season of the year a heavy bank of clouds, stretched over the ocean, seldom rises above the wall of rocks on the coast. The aspect of the place was most gloomy. The little port, with its few vessels, and small group of wretched houses, seemed overwhelmed and out of all proportion with the rest of the scene. The inhabitants live like persons on board a ship, every necessary comes from a distance, water is brought in boats from Pasagua, about forty miles northward and is sold at the rate of nine reals, fours. 6d, an eighteen-gallon cask, I bought a wine bottle full for threepence. In like manner firewood, and of course every article of food, is imported. Very few animals can be maintained in such a place, on the ensuing morning I hired with difficulty, at the price of four, two mules, and a guide to take me to the nitrate of soda works. These are at present the support of Iquique. This salt was first exported in 1830, in one year an amount in value of 100,000 was sent to France and England. It is principally used as a manure and in the manufacture of nitric acid, owing to its deliquescent property it will not serve for gunpowder. Formerly there were two exceedingly rich silver mines in this neighborhood, but their produce is now very small. Our arrival in the offing caused some little apprehension. Peru was in a state of anarchy, and each party having demanded a contribution, the poor town of Iquique was in tribulation, thinking the evil hour was come. The people had also their domestic troubles. A short time before, 
three French carpenters had broken open, during the same night, the two churches, and stolen all the plate, one of the robbers, however, subsequently confessed. And the plate was recovered. The convicts were sent to Arequipa, which though the capital of this province, is two hundred leagues distant, the government there thought it a pity to punish such useful workmen. Who could make all sorts of furniture? And accordingly liberated them. Things being in this state, the churches were again broken open, but this time the plate was not recovered. The inhabitants became dreadfully enraged, and declaring that none but heretics would thus eat God Almighty, proceeded to torture some Englishmen, with the intention of afterwards shooting them. At last the authorities interfered, and peace was established. 13 th, in the morning I started for the Saltpetri works, a distance of fourteen leagues. Having ascended the steep coast mountains by a zigzag sandy track, we soon came in view of the mines of Guantajea and St. Rosa. These two small villages are placed at the very mouths of the mines. And being perched up on hills, they had a still more unnatural and desolate appearance than the town of Iquique. We did not reach the Saltpetri works till after sunset, having ridden all day across an undulating country, a complete and utter desert. The road was strewed with the bones and dried skins of many beasts of burden which had perished on it from fatigue. Excepting the vulture aura, which preys on the carcasses, I saw neither bird, quadruped, reptile, nor insect. On the coast mountains, at the height of about two thousand feet where during this season the clouds generally hang, a very few cacti were growing in the clefts of rock. And the loose sand was strewed over with a lichen, which lies on the surface quite unattached. This plant belongs to the genus Cladonia, and somewhat resembles the reindeer lichen. In some parts it was in sufficient quantity to tinge the sand, as seen from a distance, of a pale yellowish color. Further inland, during the whole ride of fourteen leagues, I saw only one other vegetable production, and that was a most minute yellow lichen, growing on the bones of the dead mules. This was the first true desert which I had seen, the effect on me was not impressive. But I believe this was owing to my having become gradually accustomed to such scenes, as I rode northward from Valparaiso, through Coquimba, to Copiapo. The appearance of the country was remarkable, from being covered by a thick crust of common salt, and of a stratified saliferous alluvium, which seems to have been deposited as the land slowly rose above the level of the sea. The salt is white, very hard, and compact, it occurs in water-worn nodules projecting from the agglutinated sand, and is associated with much gypsum. The appearance of this superficial mass very closely resembled that of a country after snow, before the last dirty patches are thawed. The existence of this crust of a soluble substance over the whole face of the country, shows how extraordinarily dry the climate must have been for a long period. At night I slept at the house of the owner of one of the Saltpetri mines. The country is here as unproductive as near the coast. But water, having rather a bitter and brackish taste, can be procured by digging wells. The well at this house was thirty-six yards deep, as scarcely any rain falls, it is evident the water is not thus derived. Indeed if it were, it could not fail to be as salt as brine, for the whole surrounding country is encrusted with various saline substances. We must therefore conclude that it percolates underground from the Cordillera, though distant many leagues. In that direction there are a few small villages, where the inhabitants, having more water, are enabled to irrigate a little land, and raise hay, on which the mules and asses, employed in carrying the saltpetri, are fed. The nitrate of soda was now selling at the ship's side at fourteen shillings per hundred pounds, the chief expense is its transport to the seacoast. The mine consists of a hard stratum, between two and three feet thick, of the nitrate mingled with a little of the sulfate of soda and a good deal of common salt. It lies close beneath the surface, and follows for a length of one hundred and fifty miles the margin of a grand basin or plain. This, from its outline, manifestly must once have been a lake, or more probably an inland arm of the sea, as may be inferred from the presence of iotic salts in the saline stratum. The surface of the plain is 3,300 feet above the Pacific. 19th, we anchored in the Bay of Calau, 
the seaport of Lima, the capital of Peru. We stayed here six weeks but from the troubled state of public affairs, I saw very little of the country. During our whole visit the climate was far from being so delightful, as it is generally represented. A dull heavy bank of clouds constantly hung over the land, so that during the first sixteen days I had only one view of the Cordillera behind Lima. These mountains, seen in stages, one above the other, through openings in the clouds, had a very grand appearance. It is almost become a proverb, that rain never falls in the lower part of Peru. Yet this can hardly be considered correct. For during almost every day of our visit there was a thick drizzling mist, which was sufficient to make the streets muddy and one's clothes damp, this the people are pleased to call Peruvian dew. That much rain does not fall is very certain, for the houses are covered only with flat roofs made of hardened mud. And on the mole shiploads of wheat were piled up, being thus left for weeks together without any shelter. I cannot say I liked the very little I saw of Peru, in summer, however, it is said that the climate is much pleasanter. In all seasons, both inhabitants and foreigners suffer from severe attacks of ague. This disease is common on the whole coast of Peru, but is unknown in the interior. The attacks of illness which arise from miasma never fail to appear most mysterious. So difficult is it to judge from the aspect of a country, whether or not it is healthy, that if a person had been told to choose within the tropics a situation appearing favorable for health, very probably he would have named this coast. The plain round the outskirts of Calao is sparingly covered with a coarse grass, and in some parts there are a few stagnant, though very small, pools of water. The miasma, in all probability, arises from these, for the town of Arica was similarly circumstanced, and its healthiness was much improved by the drainage of some little pools. Miasma is not always produced by a luxuriant vegetation with an ardent climate. For many parts of Brazil, even where there are marshes and a rank vegetation, are much more healthy than this sterile coast of Peru. The densest forests in a temperate climate, as in Chiloé, do not seem in the slightest degree to affect the healthy condition of the atmosphere. The island of Esti. Iago, at the Cape de Verdes, offers another strongly marked instance of a country, which anyone would have expected to find most healthy, being very much the contrary. I have described the bare and open plains as supporting, during a few weeks after the rainy season, a thin vegetation, which directly withers away and dries up, at this period the air appears to become quite poisonous. Both natives and foreigners often being affected with violent fevers. On the other hand, the Galapagos archipelago, in the Pacific, with a similar soil, and periodically subject to the same process of vegetation, is perfectly healthy. Humboldt has observed, that, under the torrid zone, the smallest marshes are the most dangerous, being surrounded, as at Vera Cruz and Carthagena, with an arid and sandy soil. Which raises the temperature of the ambient air. 149 on the coast of Peru, however, the temperature is not hot to any excessive degree, and perhaps in consequence, the intermittent fevers are not of the most malignant order. In all unhealthy countries the greatest risk is run by sleeping on shore. Is this owing to the state of the body during sleep, or to a greater abundance of miasma at such times? It appears certain that those who stay on board a vessel, though anchored at only a short distance from the coast, generally suffer less than those actually on shore. On the other hand, I have heard of one remarkable case where a fever broke out among the crew of a man-of-war some hundred miles off the coast of Africa. And at the same time one of those fearful periods 150 of death commenced at Sierra Leone. No state in South America, since the Declaration of Independence, has suffered more from anarchy than Peru. At the time of our visit, there were four chiefs in arms contending for supremacy in the government, if one succeeded in becoming for a time very powerful, the others coalesced against him. But no sooner were they victorious, than they were again hostile to each other. The other day, at the anniversary of the independence, high mass was performed, the president partaking of the sacrament, during the Te Deum Laudamus. Instead of each regiment displaying the Peruvian flag, a black one with death's head was unfurled. 
Imagine a government under which such a scene could be ordered, on such an occasion, to be typical of their determination of fighting to death. This state of affairs happened at a time very unfortunately for me, as I was precluded from taking any excursions much beyond the limits of the town. The barren island of Esti. Lorenzo, which forms the harbor, was nearly the only place where one could walk securely. The upper part, which is upwards of 1,000 feet in height, during this season of the year, winter, comes within the lower limit of the clouds. And in consequence, an abundant cryptogamic vegetation, and a few flowers cover the summit. On the hills near Lima, at a height but little greater, the ground is carpeted with moss, and beds of beautiful yellow lilies, called amancas. This indicates a very much greater degree of humidity, than at a corresponding height at Iquique. Proceeding northward of Lima, the climate becomes damper, till on the banks of the Guayaquil, nearly under the equator, we find the most luxuriant forests. The change, however, from the sterile coast of Peru to that fertile land is described as taking place rather abruptly in the latitude of Cape Blanco, two degrees south of Guayaquil. Calao is a filthy, ill-built, small seaport. The inhabitants, both here and at Lima, present every imaginable shade of mixture, between European, Negro, and Indian blood. They appear a depraved, drunken set of people. The atmosphere is loaded with foul smells, and that peculiar one, which may be perceived in almost every town within the tropics, was here very strong. The fortress, which withstood Lord Cochrane's long siege, has an imposing appearance. But the president, during our stay, sold the brass guns, and proceeded to dismantle parts of it. The reason assigned was, that he had not an officer to whom he could trust so important a charge. He himself had good reason for thinking so, as he had obtained the presidentship by rebelling while in charge of this same fortress. After we left South America, he paid the penalty in the usual manner, by being conquered, taken prisoner, and shot. Lima stands on a plain in a valley, formed during the gradual retreat of the sea. It is seven miles from Calao, and is elevated five hundred feet above it, but from the slope being very gradual, the road appears absolutely level. So that when at Lima it is difficult to believe one has ascended even one hundred feet, Humboldt has remarked on this singularly deceptive case. Steep barren hills rise like islands from the plain, which is divided, by straight mud walls, into large green fields. In these scarcely a tree grows excepting a few willows, and an occasional clump of bananas and of oranges. The city of Lima is now in a wretched state of decay, the streets are nearly unpaved. And heaps of filth are piled up in all directions, where the black gallinazos, tame as poultry, pick up bits of carrion. The houses have generally an upper story, built on account of the earthquakes, of plastered woodwork but some of the old ones, which are now used by several families, are immensely large. And would rival in suites of apartments the most magnificent in any place. Lima, the city of the kings, must formerly have been a splendid town. The extraordinary number of churches gives it, even at the present day, a peculiar and striking character, especially when viewed from a short distance. One day I went out with some merchants to hunt in the immediate vicinity of the city. Our sport was very poor. But I had an opportunity of seeing the ruins of one of the ancient Indian villages, with its mound like a natural hill in the center. The remains of houses, enclosures, irrigating streams, and burial mounds, scattered over this plain, cannot fail to give one a high idea of the condition and number of the ancient population. When their earthenware, woolen clothes, utensils of elegant forms cut out of the hardest rocks, tools of copper, ornaments of precious stones, palaces, and hydraulic works, are considered. It is impossible not to respect the considerable advance made by them in the arts of civilization. The burial mounds, called huacas, are really stupendous, although in some places they appear to be natural hills encased and modeled. There is also another and very different class of ruins, which possesses some interest, namely, those of old Kalao, overwhelmed by the great earthquake of 1746, and its accompanying wave. The destruction must have been more complete even than at Talcahuano. Quantities of shingle almost conceal the foundations of the walls, 
and vast masses of brickwork appear to have been whirled about like pebbles by the retiring waves. It has been stated that the land subsided during this memorable shock, I could not discover any proof of this. Yet it seems far from improbable, for the form of the coast must certainly have undergone some change since the foundation of the old town. As no people in their senses would willingly have chosen for their building place, the narrow spit of shingle on which the ruins now stand. Since our voyage, M. Scuddy has come to the conclusion, by the comparison of old and modern maps, that the coast both north and south of Lima has certainly subsided. On the island of San Lorenzo, there are very satisfactory proofs of elevation within the recent period. This of course is not opposed to the belief, of a small sinking of the ground having subsequently taken place. The side of this island fronting the Bay of Calao, is worn into three obscure terraces, the lower one of which is covered by a bed a mile in length. Almost wholly composed of shells of eighteen species, now living in the adjoining sea. The height of this bed is eighty-five feet. Many of the shells are deeply corroded, and have a much older and more decayed appearance than those at the height of five hundred or six hundred feet on the coast of Chile. These shells are associated with much common salt, a little sulfate of lime, both probably left by the evaporation of the spray, as the land slowly rose. Together with sulfate of soda and muriate of lime. They rest on fragments of the underlying sandstone, and are covered by a few inches thick of detritus. The shells, higher up on this terrace could be traced scaling off in flakes, and falling into an impalpable powder. And on an upper terrace, at the height of 170 feet, and likewise at some considerably higher points, I found a layer of saline powder of exactly similar appearance. And lying in the same relative position. I have no doubt that this upper layer originally existed as a bed of shells, like that on the 85 feet ledge, but it does not now contain even a trace of organic structure. The powder has been analyzed for me by Mr. T. Reeks, it consists of sulfates and muriates both of lime and soda, with very little carbonate of lime. It is known that common salt and carbonate of lime left in a mass for some time together, partly decompose each other, though this does not happen with small quantities in solution. As the half-decomposed shells in the lower parts are associated with much common salt, together with some of the saline substances composing the upper saline layer. And as these shells are corroded and decayed in a remarkable manner, I strongly suspect that this double decomposition has here taken place. The resultant salts, however, ought to be carbonate of soda and muriate of lime, the latter is present, but not the carbonate of soda. Hence I am led to imagine that by some unexplained means, the carbonate of soda becomes changed into the sulfate. It is obvious that the saline layer could not have been preserved in any country in which abundant rain occasionally fell, on the other hand, this very circumstance, which at first sight appears so highly favorable to the long preservation of exposed shells, has probably been the indirect means, through the common salt not having been washed away, of their decomposition and early decay. I was much interested by finding on the terrace, at the height of eighty-five feet, embedded amidst the shells and much sea-drifted rubbish, some bits of cotton thread, plated rush, and the head of a stalk of Indian corn, I compared these relics with similar ones taken out of the Huacas, or old Peruvian tombs, and found them identical in appearance. On the mainland in front of San Lorenzo, near Bella Vista, there is an extensive and level plain about a hundred feet high, of which the lower part is formed of alternating layers of sand and impure clay, together with some gravel, and the surface, to the depth of from three to six feet, of a reddish loam. Containing a few scattered seashells and numerous small fragments of coarse red earthenware, more abundant at certain spots than at others. At first I was inclined to believe that this superficial bed, from its wide extent and smoothness, must have been deposited beneath the sea. But I afterwards found in one spot, that it lay on an artificial floor of round stones. It seems, therefore, most probable that at a period when the land stood at a lower level there was a plain very similar to that now surrounding Kalau, which being protected by a shingle beach, is raised but very little above the level of the sea. On this plain, with its underlying red clay beds, 
I imagine that the Indians manufactured their earthen vessels. And that, during some violent earthquake, the sea broke over the beach, and converted the plain into a temporary lake, as happened round Kalau in 1713 and 1746. The water would then have deposited mud, containing fragments of pottery from the kills, more abundant at some spots than at others, and shells from the sea. This bed, with fossil earthenware, stands at about the same height with the shells on the lower terrace of San Lorenzo, in which the cotton thread and other relics were embedded. Hence we may safely conclude, that within the Indo-human period there has been an elevation, as before alluded to, of more than 85 feet. For some little elevation must have been lost by the coast having subsided since the old maps were engraved. At Valparaiso, although in the 220 years before our visit, the elevation cannot have exceeded 19 feet, yet subsequently to 1817, there has been a rise. Partly insensible and partly by a start during the shock of 1822, of 10 or 11 feet. The antiquity of the Indo-human race here, judging by the 85 feet rise of the land since the relics were embedded, is the more remarkable, as on the coast of Patagonia. When the land stood about the same number of feet lower, the Macrochenia was a living beast. But as the Patagonian coast is some way distant from the Cordillera, the rising there may have been slower than here. At Bahia Blanca, the elevation has been only a few feet since the numerous gigantic quadrupeds were there entombed. And, according to the generally received opinion, when these extinct animals were living, man did not exist. But the rising of that part of the coast of Patagonia, is perhaps no way connected with the Cordillera, but rather with a line of old volcanic rocks in Banda Oriental. So that it may have been infinitely slower than on the shores of Peru. All these speculations, however, must be vague, for who will pretend to say that there may not have been several periods of subsidence, intercalated between the movements of elevation. For we know that along the whole coast of Patagonia, there have certainly been many and long pauses in the upward action of the elevatory forces. Chapter 17. Galapagos Archipelago. The whole group volcanic, numbers of craters, leafless bushes colony at Charles Island, James Island, Salt Lake in Crater, Natural History of the Group, Ornithology. Curious finches, reptiles, great tortoises, habits of, marine lizard, feeds on seaweed, terrestrial lizard, burrowing habits, herbivorous, importance of reptiles in the archipelago, fish, shells. Insects, botany, American type of organization, differences in the species or races on different islands, tameness of the birds, fear of man, an acquired instinct. September 15 th, this archipelago consists of ten principal islands, of which five exceed the others in size. They are situated under the equator, and between five and six hundred miles westward of the coast of America. They are all formed of volcanic rocks. A few fragments of granite curiously glazed and altered by the heat, can hardly be considered as an exception. Some of the craters, surmounting the larger islands, are of immense size, and they rise to a height of between three and four thousand feet. Their flanks are studded by innumerable smaller orifices. I scarcely hesitate to affirm, that there must be in the whole archipelago at least two thousand craters. These consist either of lava or scoriae, or of finely stratified, sandstone-like tuff. Most of the latter are beautifully symmetrical. They owe their origin to eruptions of volcanic mud without any lava, it is a remarkable circumstance that every one of the twenty-eight tuff craters which were examined had their southern sides either much lower than the other sides, or quite broken down and removed. As all these craters apparently have been formed when standing in the sea, and as the waves from the trade wind and the swell from the open Pacific here unite their forces on the southern coasts of all the islands. This singular uniformity in the broken state of the craters, composed of the soft and yielding tuff, is easily explained. Considering that these islands are placed directly under the equator, the climate is far from being excessively hot. This seems chiefly caused by the singularly low temperature of the surrounding water, brought here by the great southern polar current. Excepting during one short season, very little rain falls, 
and even then it is irregular, but the clouds generally hang low. Hence, whilst the lower parts of the islands are very sterile, the upper parts, at a height of a thousand feet and upwards, possess a damp climate and a tolerably luxuriant vegetation. This is especially the case on the windward sides of the islands, which first receive and condense the moisture from the atmosphere. In the morning, 17th, we landed on Chatham Island, which, like the others, rises with a tame and rounded outline, broken here and there by scattered hillocks, the remains of former craters. Nothing could be less inviting than the first appearance. A broken field of black basaltic lava, thrown into the most rugged waves, and crossed by great fissures, is everywhere covered by stunted, sunburnt brushwood, which shows little signs of life. The dry and parched surface, being heated by the noonday sun, gave to the air a close and sultry feeling, like that from a stove, we fancied even that the bushes smelt unpleasantly. Although I diligently tried to collect as many plants as possible, I succeeded in getting very few, and such wretched-looking little weeds would have better become an arctic than an equatorial flora. The brushwood appears, from a short distance, as leafless as our trees during winter. And it was some time before I discovered that not only almost every plant was now in full leaf, but that the greater number were in flower. The commonest bush is one of the Euphorbiaceae, an acacia and a great odd-looking cactus are the only trees which afford any shade. After the season of heavy rains, the islands are said to appear for a short time partially green. The volcanic island of Fernando Narona, placed in many respects under nearly similar conditions, is the only other country where I have seen a vegetation at all like this of the Galapagos Islands. The beagle sailed round Chatham Island, and anchored in several bays. One night I slept on shore on a part of the island, where black truncated cones were extraordinarily numerous, from one small eminence I counted sixty of them. All surmounted by craters more or less perfect. The greater number consisted merely of a ring of red scoriae or slags, cemented together, and their height above the plain of lava was not more than from fifty to a hundred feet. None had been very lately active. The entire surface of this part of the island seems to have been permeated, like a sieve, by the subterranean vapors, here and there the lava, whilst soft, has been blown into great bubbles. And in other parts, the tops of caverns similarly formed have fallen in, leaving circular pits with steep sides. From the regular form of the many craters, they gave to the country an artificial appearance, which vividly reminded me of those parts of Staffordshire where the great iron foundries are most numerous. The day was glowing hot, and the scrambling over the rough surface and through the intricate thickets, was very fatiguing, but I was well repaid by the strange cyclopean scene. As I was walking along I met two large tortoises, each of which must have weighed at least two hundred pounds, one was eating a piece of cactus, and as I approached, it stared at me and slowly walked away. The other gave a deep hiss, and drew in its head. These huge reptiles, surrounded by the black lava, the leafless shrubs, and large cacti, seem to my fancy like some antediluvian animals. The few dull-colored birds cared no more for me than they did for the great tortoises. 23 RD, the beagle proceeded to Charles Island. This archipelago has long been frequented, first by the buccaneers, and latterly by whalers, but it is only within the last six years that a small colony has been established here. The inhabitants are between two and three hundred in number. They are nearly all people of color, who have been banished for political crimes from the Republic of the Equator, of which Quito is the capital. The settlement is placed about four and a half miles inland, and at a height probably of a thousand feet. In the first part of the road we passed through leafless thickets, as in Chatham Island. Higher up, the woods gradually became greener. And as soon as we crossed the ridge of the island, we were cooled by a fine southerly breeze, and our sight refreshed by a green and thriving vegetation. In this upper region coarse grasses and ferns abound. But there are no tree ferns, I saw nowhere any member of the palm family, which is the more singular, as 360 miles northward, Cocos Island takes its name from the number of coconuts. The houses are irregularly scattered over a flat space of ground, 
which is cultivated with sweet potatoes and bananas. It will not easily be imagined how pleasant the sight of black mud was to us, after having been so long, accustomed to the parched soil of Peru and northern Chile. The inhabitants, although complaining of poverty, obtain, without much trouble, the means of subsistence. In the woods there are many wild pigs and goats. But the staple article of animal food is supplied by the tortoises. Their numbers have of course been greatly reduced in this island, but the people yet count on two days hunting giving them food for the rest of the week. It is said that formerly single vessels have taken away as many as seven hundred, and that the ship's company of a frigate some years since brought down in one day two hundred tortoises to the beach. September 29 th, we doubled the southwest extremity of Albemarle Island, and the next day were nearly becalmed between it and Narborough Island. Both are covered with immense deluges of black naked lava, which have flowed either over the rims of the great cauldrons, like pitch over the rim of a pot in which it has been boiled, or have burst forth from smaller orifices on the flanks. In their descent they have spread over miles of the seacoast. On both of these islands, eruptions are known to have taken place. And in Albemarle, we saw a small jet of smoke curling from the summit of one of the great craters. In the evening we anchored in Banks Cove, in Albemarle Island. The next morning I went out walking. To the south of the broken tough crater, in which the beagle was anchored, there was another beautifully symmetrical one of an elliptic form. Its longer axis was a little less than a mile, and its depth about five hundred feet. At its bottom there was a shallow lake, in the middle of which a tiny crater formed an islet. The day was overpoweringly hot, and the lake looked clear and blue, I hurried down the cindery slope, and, choked with dust, eagerly tasted the water, but, to my sorrow, I found it salt as brine. The rocks on the coast abounded with great black lizards, between three and four feet long, and on the hills, an ugly yellowish-brown species was equally common. We saw many of this latter kind, some clumsily running out of the way, and others shuffling into their burrows. I shall presently describe in more detail the habits of both these reptiles. The whole of this northern part of Albemarle Island is miserably sterile. October 8. We arrived at James Island, this island, as well as Charles Island, were long since thus named after our kings of the Stuart line. Mr. Bino, myself, and our servants were left here for a week, with provisions and a tent, whilst the beagle went for water. We found here a party of Spaniards, who had been sent from Charles Island to dry fish, and to salt tortoise meat. About six miles inland, and at the height of nearly two thousand feet, a hovel had been built in which two men lived, who were employed in catching tortoises, whilst the others were fishing on the coast. I paid this party two visits, and slept there one night. As in the other islands, the lower region was covered by nearly leafless bushes, but the trees were here of a larger growth than elsewhere. Several being two feet and some even two feet nine inches in diameter. The upper region being kept damp by the clouds, supports a green and flourishing vegetation. So damp was the ground, that there were large beds of a coarse cypress, in which great numbers of a very small water rail lived and bred. While staying in this upper region, we lived entirely upon tortoise meat, the breastplate roasted, as the gauchos do carne con cuero, with the flesh on it, is very good. And the young tortoises make excellent soup, but otherwise the meat to my taste is indifferent. One day we accompanied a party of the Spaniards in their whaleboat to a salina, or lake from which salt is procured. After landing, we had a very rough walk over a rugged field of recent lava, which has almost surrounded a tough crater, at the bottom of which the salt lake lies. The water is only three or four inches deep, and rests on a layer of beautifully crystallized, white salt. The lake is quite circular, and is fringed with a border of bright green succulent plants. The almost precipitous walls of the crater are clothed with wood, so that the scene was altogether both picturesque and curious. A few years since, the sailors belonging to a sealing vessel murdered their captain in this quiet spot, and we saw his skull lying among the bushes. During the greater part of our stay of a week, the sky was cloudless, and if the trade wind failed for an hour, 
the heat became very oppressive. On two days, the thermometer within the tent stood for some hours at 93 degree, but in the open air, in the wind and sun, at only 85 degrees. The sand was extremely hot. The thermometer placed in some of a brown color immediately rose to 137 degrees, and how much above that it would have risen, I do not know, for it was not graduated any higher. The black sand felt much hotter, so that even in thick boots it was quite disagreeable to walk over it. The natural history of these islands is eminently curious, and well deserves attention. Most of the organic productions are aboriginal creations, found nowhere else, there is even a difference between the inhabitants of the different islands. Yet all show a marked relationship with those of America, though separated from that continent by an open space of ocean, between 500 and 600 miles in width. The archipelago is a little world within itself, or rather a satellite attached to America, whence it has derived a few stray colonists. And has received the general character of its indigenous productions. Considering the small size of the islands, we feel the more astonished at the number of their aboriginal beings, and at their confined range. Seeing every height crowned with its crater, and the boundaries of most of the lava streams still distinct. We are led to believe that within a period geologically recent the unbroken ocean was here spread out. Hence, both in space and time, we seem to be brought somewhat near to that great fact, that mystery of mysteries, the first appearance of new beings on this earth. Of terrestrial mammals, there is only one which must be considered as indigenous, namely, a mouse, Muse Galapagoensis, and this is confined, as far as I could ascertain, to Chatham Island. The most easterly island of the group. It belongs, as I am informed by Mr. Waterhouse, to a division of the family of mice characteristic of America. At James Island, there is a rat sufficiently distinct from the common kind to have been named and described by Mr. Waterhouse. But as it belongs to the Old World division of the family, and as this island has been frequented by ships for the last hundred and fifty years. I can hardly doubt that this rat is merely a variety produced by the new and peculiar climate, food, and soil, to which it has been subjected. Although no one has a right to speculate without distinct facts, yet even with respect to the Chatham Island mouse, it should be borne in mind. That it may possibly be an American species imported here. For I have seen, in a most unfrequented part of the Pampas, a native mouse living in the roof of a newly built hovel. And therefore its transportation in a vessel is not improbable, analogous facts have been observed by D.R. Richardson in North America. Of land birds I obtained twenty-six kinds, all peculiar to the group and found nowhere else, with the exception of one lark-like finch from North America, Dolichonyx orazivorus which ranges on that continent as far north as 54 degrees, and generally frequents marshes. The other 25 birds consist, firstly, of a hawk, curiously intermediate in structure between a buzzard and the American group of carrion-feeding polybori. And with these latter birds it agrees most closely in every habit and even tone of voice. Secondly, there are two owls, representing the short-eared and white barn owls of Europe. Thirdly, a wren, three tyrant flycatchers, two of them species of pyrocephalus, one or both of which would be ranked by some ornithologists as only varieties, and a dove, all analogous to, but distinct from, American species. Fourthly, a swallow, which though differing from the progne purpurea of both Americas, only in being rather duller colored, smaller, and slenderer, is considered by Mr. Gould as specifically distinct. Fifthly, there are three species of mocking thrush, a form highly characteristic of America. The remaining land birds form a most singular group of finches, related to each other in the structure of their beaks, short tails, form of body and plumage, there are thirteen species, which Mr. Gould has divided into four subgroups. All these species are peculiar to this archipelago. And so is the whole group, with the exception of one species of the subgroup Cactornis, lately brought from Bow Island, in the Low Archipelago. Of Cactornis, the two species may be often seen climbing about the flowers of the great cactus trees. 
but all the other species of this group of finches, mingled together in flocks, feed on the dry and sterile ground of the lower districts. The males of all, or certainly of the greater number, are jet black, and the females, with perhaps one or two exceptions, are brown. The most curious fact is the perfect gradation in the size of the beaks in the different species of Giaspiza, from one as large as that of a hawfinch to that of a chaffinch, and, if Mr. Gould is right in including his subgroup, Certhidia, in the main group, even to that of a warbler. The largest beak in the genus Giaspiza is shown in figure 1, and the smallest in figure 3. But instead of there being only one intermediate species, with a beak of the size shown in figure 2, there are no less than six species with insensibly graduated beaks. The beak of the subgroup Certhidia is shown in figure 4. The beak of Cactornis is somewhat like that of a starling, and that of the fourth subgroup, Camarynchus, is slightly parrot shaped. Seeing this gradation and diversity of structure in one small, intimately related group of birds, one might really fancy that from an original paucity of birds in this archipelago, one species had been taken and modified for different ends. In a like manner it might be fancied that a bird originally a buzzard, had been induced here to undertake the office of the carrion-feeding polybory of the American continent. 1. Giaspiza magnarostris. 2. Giaspiza fortis. 3. Giaspiza parvula. 4. Certhidia olivaci. Of waders and waterbirds I was able to get only eleven kinds, and of these only three, including a rail confined to the damp summits of the islands, are new species. Considering the wandering habits of the gulls, I was surprised to find that the species inhabiting these islands is peculiar, but allied to one from the southern parts of South America. The far greater peculiarity of the land birds, namely, 25 out of 26, being new species, or at least new races, compared with the waders and web-footed birds, is in accordance with the greater range which these latter orders have in all parts of the world. We shall hereafter see this law of aquatic forms, whether marine or freshwater, being less peculiar at any given point of the Earth's surface than the terrestrial forms of the same classes. Strikingly illustrated in the shells, and in a lesser degree in the insects of this archipelago. Two of the waders are rather smaller than the same species brought from other places, the swallow is also smaller, though it is doubtful whether or not it is distinct from its analogue. The two owls, the two tyrant catchers, pyrocephalus, and the dove, are also smaller than the analogous but distinct species, to which they are most nearly related. On the other hand, the gull is rather larger. The two owls, the swallow, all three species of mocking thrush, the dove in its separate colors though not in its whole plumage, the totanus, and the gull, are likewise duskier colored than their analogous species. And in the case of the mocking thrush and totanus, than any other species of the two genera. With the exception of a wren with a fine yellow breast, and of a tyrant flycatcher with a scarlet tuft and breast, none of the birds are brilliantly colored. As might have been expected in an equatorial district. Hence it would appear probable, that the same causes which here make the immigrants of some peculiar species smaller, make most of the peculiar Galapagian species also smaller as well as very generally more dusky colored. All the plants have a wretched, weedy appearance, and I did not see one beautiful flower. The insects, again, are small-sized and dull-colored, and, as Mr. Waterhouse informs me, there is nothing in their general appearance which would have led him to imagine that they had come from under the equator. 151 The birds, plants, and insects have a desert character, and are not more brilliantly colored than those from southern Patagonia. We may, therefore, conclude that the usual gaudy coloring of the intertropical productions, is not related either to the heat or light of those zones, but to some other cause. Perhaps to the conditions of existence being generally favorable to life. We will now turn to the order of reptiles, which gives the most striking character to the zoology of these islands. The species are not numerous, but the numbers of individuals of each species are extraordinarily great. There is one small lizard belonging to a South American genus, and two species, and probably more, 
of the Amblerhynchus, a genus confined to the Galapagos Islands. There is one snake which is numerous, it is identical, as I am informed by M. Bibron, with the Samophis Taminki from Chile. 152 of sea turtle I believe there are more than one species, and of tortoises there are, as we shall presently show, two or three species or races. Of toads and frogs there are none, I was surprised at this, considering how well suited for them the temperate and damp upper woods appeared to be. It recalled to my mind the remark made by Boris T. Vincent 153 namely, that none of this family are found on any of the volcanic islands in the great oceans. As far as I can ascertain from various works, this seems to hold good throughout the Pacific, and even in the large islands of the Sandwich Archipelago. Mauritius offers an apparent exception, where I saw the Rana mascariensis in abundance, this frog is said now to inhabit the Seychelles, Madagascar, and Bourbon. But on the other hand, Dubois, in his voyage in 1669, states that there were no reptiles in Bourbon except tortoises. And the officer du Roy asserts that before 1768 it had been attempted, without success. To introduce frogs into Mauritius, I presume for the purpose of eating, hence it may be well doubted whether this frog is an aboriginal of these islands. The absence of the frog family in the oceanic islands is the more remarkable, when contrasted with the case of lizards, which swarm on most of the smallest islands. May this difference not be caused, by the greater facility with which the eggs of lizards, protected by calcareous shells might be transported through saltwater, than could the slimy spawn of frogs? I will first describe the habits of the tortoise, Testudo nigra, formerly called indica, which has been so frequently alluded to. These animals are found, I believe, on all the islands of the archipelago, certainly on the greater number. They frequent in preference the high damp parts, but they likewise live in the lower and arid districts. I have already shown, from the numbers which have been caught in a single day, how very numerous they must be. Some grow to an immense size, Mr. Lawson, an Englishman, and vice-governor of the colony, told us that he had seen several so large, that it required six or eight men to lift them from the ground. And that some had afforded as much as two hundred pounds of meat. The old males are the largest, the females rarely growing to so great a size, the male can readily be distinguished from the female by the greater length of its tail. The tortoises which live on those islands where there is no water, or in the lower and arid parts of the others, feed chiefly on the succulent cactus. Those which frequent the higher and damp regions, eat the leaves of various trees, a kind of berry, called guayavita, which is acid and austere. And likewise a pale green filamentous lichen, Usnera plicata, that hangs from the boughs of the trees. The tortoise is very fond of water, drinking large quantities, and wallowing in the mud. The larger islands alone possess springs, and these are always situated towards the central parts, and at a considerable height. The tortoises, therefore, which frequent the lower districts, when thirsty, are obliged to travel from a long distance. Hence broad and well-beaten paths branch off in every direction from the wells down to the seacoast, and the Spaniards by following them up, first discovered the watering places. When I landed at Chatham Island, I could not imagine what animal travelled so methodically along well-chosen tracks. Near the springs it was a curious spectacle to behold many of these huge creatures, one set eagerly travelling onwards with outstretched necks, and another set returning. After having drunk their fill. When the tortoise arrives at the spring, quite regardless of any spectator, he buries his head in the water above his eyes, and greedily swallows great mouthfuls. At the rate of about ten in a minute. The inhabitants say each animal stays three or four days in the neighborhood of the water, and then returns to the lower country, but they differed respecting the frequency of these visits. The animal probably regulates them according to the nature of the food on which it has lived. It is, however, certain, that tortoises can subsist even on these islands where there is no other water than what falls during a few rainy days in the year. I believe it is well ascertained, that the bladder of the frog acts as a reservoir for the moisture necessary to its existence, such seems to be the case with the tortoise. 
For some time after a visit to the springs, their urinary bladders are distended with fluid, which is said gradually to decrease in volume, and to become less pure. The inhabitants, when walking in the lower district, and overcome with thirst, often take advantage of this circumstance, and drink the contents of the bladder if full, in one I saw killed. The fluid was quite limpid, and had only a very slightly bitter taste. The inhabitants, however, always first drink the water in the pericardium, which is described as being best. The tortoises, when purposely moving towards any point, travel by night and day, and arrive at their journey's end much sooner than would be expected. The inhabitants, from observing marked individuals, consider that they travel a distance of about eight miles in two or three days. One large tortoise, which I watched, walked at the rate of sixty yards in ten minutes, that is three hundred and sixty yards in the hour, or four miles a day, allowing a little time for it to eat on the road. During the breeding season, when the male and female are together, the male utters a hoarse roar or bellowing, which, it is said, can be heard at the distance of more than a hundred yards. The female never uses her voice, and the male only at these times, so that when the people hear this noise, they know that the two are together. They were at this time, October, laying their eggs. The female, where the soil is sandy, deposits them together, and covers them up with sand, but where the ground is rocky she drops them indiscriminately in any hole, Mr. Bino found seven placed in a fissure. The egg is white and spherical, one which I measured was seven inches and three-eighths in circumference, and therefore larger than a hen's egg. The young tortoises, as soon as they are hatched, fall a prey in great numbers to the carrion feeding buzzard. The old ones seem generally to die from accidents, as from falling down precipices, at least, several of the inhabitants told me, that they never found one dead without some evident cause. The inhabitants believe that these animals are absolutely deaf, certainly they do not overhear a person walking close behind them. I was always amused when overtaking one of these great monsters, as it was quietly pacing along, to see how suddenly, the instant I passed, it would draw in its head and legs. And uttering a deep hiss fall to the ground with a heavy sound, as if struck dead. I frequently got on their backs, and then giving a few raps on the hinder part of their shells, they would rise up and walk away, but I found it very difficult to keep my balance. The flesh of this animal is largely employed, both fresh and salted, and a beautifully clear oil is prepared from the fat. When a tortoise is caught, the man makes a slit in the skin near its tail, so as to see inside its body, whether the fat under the dorsal plate is thick. If it is not, the animal is liberated and it is said to recover soon from this strange operation. In order to secure the tortoise, it is not sufficient to turn them like turtle, for they are often able to get on their legs again. There can be little doubt that this tortoise is an aboriginal inhabitant of the Galapagos. For it is found on all, or nearly all, the islands, even on some of the smaller ones where there is no water. Had it been an imported species, this would hardly have been the case in a group which has been so little frequented. Moreover, the old buccaneers found this tortoise in greater numbers even than at present, Wood and Rogers also, in 1708, say that it is the opinion of the Spaniards. That it is found nowhere else in this quarter of the world. It is now widely distributed, but it may be questioned whether it is in any other place an aboriginal. The bones of a tortoise at Mauritius, associated with those of the extinct dodo, have generally been considered as belonging to this tortoise. If this had been so, undoubtedly it must have been their indigenous, but M. Bibron informs me that he believes that it was distinct, as the species now living there certainly is. Amblerinchus cristatus. A. Tooth of, natural size, and likewise magnified. The Amblerinchus, a remarkable genus of lizards, is confined to this archipelago. There are two species, resembling each other in general form, one being terrestrial and the other aquatic. This latter species, a cristatus, was first characterized by Mr. Bell, who well foresaw, from its short, broad head, and strong claws of equal length, that its habits of life would turn out very peculiar, and different from those of its nearest ally, the iguana. It is extremely common on all the islands throughout the group, 
and lives exclusively on the rocky sea beaches, being never found, at least I never saw one, even ten yards inshore. It is a hideous-looking creature, of a dirty black color, stupid, and sluggish in its movements. The usual length of a full-grown one is about a yard, but there are some even four feet long. A large one weighed twenty pounds, on the island of Albemarle they seem to grow to a greater size than elsewhere. Their tails are flattened sideways, and all four feet partially webbed. They are occasionally seen some hundred yards from the shore, swimming about, and Captain Colnett, in his voyage says, they go to sea in herds a fishing, and sun themselves on the rocks. And may be called alligators in miniature. It must not, however, be supposed that they live on fish. When in the water this lizard swims with perfect ease and quickness, by a serpentine movement of its body and flattened tail, the legs being motionless and closely collapsed on its sides. A seaman on board sank one, with a heavy weight attached to it, thinking thus to kill it directly, but when, an hour afterwards, he drew up the line, it was quite active. Their limbs and strong claws are admirably adapted for crawling over the rugged and fissured masses of lava, which everywhere form the coast. In such situations, a group of six or seven of these hideous reptiles may oftentimes be seen on the black rocks, a few feet above the surf, basking in the sun with outstretched legs. I opened the stomachs of several, and found them largely distended with minced seaweed, ulvi, which grows in thin foliaceous expansions of a bright green or a dull red color. I do not recollect having observed this seaweed in any quantity on the tidal rocks, and I have reason to believe it grows at the bottom of the sea, at some little distance from the coast. If such be the case, the object of these animals occasionally going out to sea is explained. The stomach contained nothing but the seaweed. Mr. Baino, however, found a piece of crab in one. But this might have got in accidentally, in the same manner as I have seen a caterpillar, in the midst of some lichen, in the paunch of a tortoise. The intestines were large, as in other herbivorous animals. The nature of this lizard's food, as well as the structure of its tail and feet, and the fact of its having been seen voluntarily swimming out at sea, absolutely prove its aquatic habits. Yet there is in this respect one strange anomaly, namely, that when frightened it will not enter the water. Hence it is easy to drive these lizards down to any little point overhanging the sea, where they will sooner allow a person to catch hold of their tails than jump into the water. They do not seem to have any notion of biting, but when much frightened they squirt a drop of fluid from each nostril. I threw one several times as far as I could, into a deep pool left by the retiring tide, but it invariably returned in a direct line to the spot where I stood. It swam near the bottom, with a very graceful and rapid movement, and occasionally aided itself over the uneven ground with its feet. As soon as it arrived near the edge, but still being under water, it tried to conceal itself in the tufts of seaweed, or it entered some crevice. As soon as it thought the danger was past, it crawled out on the dry rocks, and shuffled away as quickly as it could. I several times caught this same lizard, by driving it down to a point, and though possessed of such perfect powers of diving and swimming, nothing would induce it to enter the water. And as often as I threw it in, it returned in the manner above described. Perhaps this singular piece of apparent stupidity may be accounted for by the circumstance, that this reptile has no enemy whatever on shore. Whereas at sea it must often fall a prey to the numerous sharks. Hence, probably, urged by a fixed and hereditary instinct that the shore is its place of safety, whatever the emergency may be, it there takes refuge. During our visit, in October, I saw extremely few small individuals of this species, and none I should think under a year old. From this circumstance it seems probable that the breeding season had not then commenced. I asked several of the inhabitants if they knew where it laid its eggs, they said that they knew nothing of its propagation, although well acquainted with the eggs of the land kind, a fact. Considering how very common this lizard is, not a little extraordinary. We will now turn to the terrestrial species, a, de Marlii, with a round tail, and toes without webs. This lizard, instead of being found like the other on all the islands, is confined to the central part of the archipelago, 
namely to Albemarle, James, Barrington, and indefatigable islands. To the southward, in Charles, Hood, and Chatham Islands, and to the northward, in Towers, Bindlows, and Abingdon, I neither saw nor heard of any. It would appear as if it had been created in the center of the archipelago, and thence had been dispersed only to a certain distance. Some of these lizards inhabit the high and damp parts of the islands, but they are much more numerous in the lower and sterile districts near the coast. I cannot give a more forcible proof of their numbers, than by stating that when we were left at James Island, we could not for some time find a spot free from their burrows on which to pitch our single tent. Like their brothers the sea kind, they are ugly animals, of a yellowish orange beneath, and of a brownish red color above, from their low facial angle they have a singularly stupid appearance. They are, perhaps, of a rather less size than the marine species, but several of them weighed between ten and fifteen pounds. In their movements they are lazy and half torpid. When not frightened, they slowly crawl along with their tails and bellies dragging on the ground. They often stop and doze for a minute or two, with closed eyes and hind legs spread out on the parched soil. They inhabit burrows, which they sometimes make between fragments of lava, but more generally on level patches of the soft sandstone like tuff. The holes do not appear to be very deep, and they enter the ground at a small angle. So that when walking over these lizard warrens, the soil is constantly giving way, much to the annoyance of the tired walker. This animal, when making its burrow, works alternately the opposite sides of its body. One front leg for a short time scratches up the soil, and throws it towards the hind foot, which is well placed so as to heave it beyond the mouth of the hole. That side of the body being tired, the other takes up the task, and so on alternately. I watched one for a long time, till half its body was buried. I then walked up and pulled it by the tail, at this it was greatly astonished, and soon shuffled up to see what was the matter. And then stared me in the face, as much as to say, what made you pull my tail? They feed by day, and do not wander far from their burrows. If frightened, they rush to them with a most awkward gait. Except when running downhill, they cannot move very fast, apparently from the lateral position of their legs. They are not at all timorous, when attentively watching anyone, they curl their tails, and, raising themselves on their front legs, nod their heads vertically, with a quick movement. And try to look very fierce. But in reality they are not at all so, if one just stamps on the ground, down go their tails, and off they shuffle as quickly as they can. I have frequently observed small fly-eating lizards, when watching anything, nod their heads in precisely the same manner, but I do not at all know for what purpose. If this amblerinchus is held and plagued with a stick, it will bite it very severely, but I caught many by the tail, and they never tried to bite me. If two are placed on the ground and held together, they will fight, and bite each other till blood is drawn. The individuals, and they are the greater number, which inhabit the lower country, can scarcely taste a drop of water throughout the year. But they consume much of the succulent cactus, the branches of which are occasionally broken off by the wind. I several times threw a piece to two or three of them when together. And it was amusing enough to see them trying to seize and carry it away in their mouths, like so many hungry dogs with a bone. They eat very deliberately, but do not chew their food. The little birds are aware how harmless these creatures are, I have seen one of the thick-billed finches picking at one end of a piece of cactus, which is much relished by all the animals of the lower region. Whilst a lizard was eating at the other end. And afterwards the little bird with the utmost indifference hopped on the back of the reptile. I opened the stomachs of several, and found them full of vegetable fibers and leaves of different trees, especially of an acacia. In the upper region they live chiefly on the acid and astringent berries of the guayavita, under which trees I have seen these lizards and the huge tortoises feeding together. To obtain the acacia leaves they crawl up the low stunted trees, and it is not uncommon to see a pair quietly browsing, whilst seated on a branch several feet above the ground. These lizards, when cooked, yield a white meat, which is liked by those whose stomachs soar above all prejudices. Humboldt has remarked that in intertropical South America, 
all lizards which inhabit dry regions are esteemed delicacies for the table. The inhabitants state that those which inhabit the upper damp parts drink water, but that the others do not, like the tortoises, travel up for it from the lower sterile country. At the time of our visit, the females had within their bodies numerous, large, elongated eggs, which they lay in their burrows, the inhabitants seek them for food. These two species of Amblyrhynchus agree, as I have already stated, in their general structure, and in many of their habits. Neither have that rapid movement, so characteristic of the genera Lacerda and Iguana. They are both herbivorous, although the kind of vegetation on which they feed is so very different. Mr. Bell has given the name to the genus from the shortness of the snout, indeed. The form of the mouth may almost be compared to that of the tortoise, one is led to suppose that this is an adaptation to their herbivorous appetites. It is very interesting thus to find a well-characterized genus, having its marine and terrestrial species, belonging to so confined a portion of the world. The aquatic species is by far the most remarkable, because it is the only existing lizard which lives on marine vegetable productions. As I at first observed, these islands are not so remarkable for the number of the species of reptiles, as for that of the individuals. When we remember the well-beaten paths made by the thousands of huge tortoises, the many turtles, the great warrens of the terrestrial Amblyrhynchus, and the groups of the marine species basking on the coast rocks of every island, we must admit that there is no other quarter of the world where this order replaces the herbivorous mammalia in so extraordinary a manner. The geologist on hearing this will probably refer back in his mind to the secondary epochs, when lizards, some herbivorous, some carnivorous, and of dimensions comparable only with our existing whales, swarmed on the land and in the sea. It is, therefore, worthy of his observation, that this archipelago, instead of possessing a humid climate and rank vegetation, cannot be considered otherwise than extremely arid, and for an equatorial region, remarkably temperate. To finish with the zoology, the fifteen kinds of sea fish which I procured here are all new species. They belong to twelve genera, all widely distributed, with the exception of Prionotus, of which the four previously known species live on the eastern side of America. Of land shells I collected sixteen kinds, and two marked varieties, of which, with the exception of one helix found at Tahiti. All are peculiar to this archipelago, a single freshwater shell, Palladina, is common to Tahiti and Van Diemen's land. Mr. Cumming, before our voyage procured here ninety species of seashells, and this does not include several species not yet specifically examined, of Trachus, Turbo, Monodonta, and Nasa. He has been kind enough to give me the following interesting results, of the ninety shells, no less than forty-seven are unknown elsewhere, a wonderful fact. Considering how widely distributed seashells generally are. Of the 43 shells found in other parts of the world, 25 inhabit the western coast of America, and of these 8 are distinguishable as varieties. The remaining 18, including one variety, were found by Mr. Cumming in the Low Archipelago, and some of them also at the Philippines. This fact of shells from islands in the central parts of the Pacific occurring here, deserves notice. For not one single seashell is known to be common to the islands of that ocean and to the west coast of America. The space of open sea running north and south off the west coast, separates two quite distinct conchological provinces. But at the Galapagos archipelago we have a halting place, where many new forms have been created, and whither these two great conchological provinces have each sent up several colonists. The American province has also sent here representative species, for there is a Galapagian species of Monoceros, a genus only found on the west coast of America. And there are Galapagian species of Fissurella and Cancellaria, genera common on the west coast, but not found, as I am informed by Mr. Cumming, in the central islands of the Pacific. On the other hand, there are Galapagian species of Onisha and Stylifer, genera common to the West Indies and to the Chinese and Indian seas but not found either on the west coast of America or in the central Pacific. I may here add, that after the comparison by Messrs. Cumming and Hines of about 2,000 shells from the eastern and western coasts of America, 
only one single shell was found in common, namely, the Purpura patula, which inhabits the West Indies, the coast of Panama, and the Galapagos. We have, therefore, in this quarter of the world, three great conchological sea provinces, quite distinct, though surprisingly near each other. Being separated by long north and south spaces either of land or of open sea. I took great pains in collecting the insects, but excepting Tierra del Fuego, I never saw in this respect so poor a country. Even in the upper and damp region I procured very few, excepting some minute diptera and hymenoptera, mostly of common mundane forms. As before remarked, the insects, for a tropical region, are of very small size and dull colors. Of beetles I collected twenty-five species, excluding a dermestes and coronets imported, wherever a ship touches. Of these, two belong to the Harpalidae, two to the Hydrophilidae, nine to three families of the Heteromera, and the remaining twelve to as many different families. This circumstance of insects, and I may add plants, where few in number, belonging to many different families, is, I believe, very general. Mr. Waterhouse, who has published 154 an account of the insects of this archipelago, and to whom I am indebted for the above details, informs me that there are several new genera, and that of the genera not new, one or two are American, and the rest of mundane distribution. With the exception of a wood-feeding apate, and of one or probably two water beetles from the American continent, all the species appear to be new. The botany of this group is fully as interesting as the zoology. Dr. J. Hooker will soon publish in the Linnean Transactions a full account of the flora, and I am much indebted to him for the following details. Of flowering plants there are, as far as at present is known, 185 species, and 40 cryptogamic species, making altogether 225, of this number I was fortunate enough to bring home 193. Of the flowering plants, 100 are new species, and are probably confined to this archipelago. Dar. Hooker conceives that, of the plants not so confined, at least 10 species found near the cultivated ground at Charles Island, have been imported. It is, I think, surprising that more American species have not been introduced naturally, considering that the distance is only between 500 and 600 miles from the continent. And that, according to Colnett, page 58, driftwood, bamboos, canes, and the nuts of a palm, are often washed on the southeastern shores. The proportion of 100 flowering plants out of 183, or 175 excluding the imported weeds, being new, is sufficient, I conceive, to make the Galapagos archipelago a distinct botanical province. But this flora is not nearly so peculiar as that of St. Helena, nor, as I am informed by Dr. Hooker, of Juan Fernandez. The peculiarity of the Galapagian flora is best shown in certain families. Thus there are 21 species of composite, of which 20 are peculiar to this archipelago, these belong to 12 genera, and of these genera no less than 10 are confined to the archipelago. Dar. Hooker informs me that the flora has an undoubtedly Western American character, nor can he detect in it any affinity with that of the Pacific. If, therefore, we accept the 18 marine, the one freshwater, and one land shell, which have apparently come here as colonists from the central islands of the Pacific, and likewise the one distinct Pacific species of the Galapagian group of finches, we see that this archipelago, though standing in the Pacific Ocean, is zoologically part of America. If this character were owing merely to immigrants from America, there would be little remarkable in it. But we see that a vast majority of all the land animals, and that more than half of the flowering plants, are aboriginal productions. It was most striking to be surrounded by new birds, new reptiles, new shells, new insects, new plants, and yet by innumerable trifling details of structure and even by the tones of voice and plumage of the birds, to have the temperate plains of Patagonia, or rather the hot dry deserts of northern Chile, vividly brought before my eyes. Why, on these small points of land, which within a late geological period must have been covered by the ocean, which are formed by basaltic lava, 
and therefore differ in geological character from the American continent, and which are placed under a peculiar climate, why were their aboriginal inhabitants, associated, I may add, in different proportions both in kind and number from those on the continent, and therefore acting on each other in a different manner, why were they created on American types of organization? It is probable that the islands of the Cape de Verde group resemble, in all their physical conditions, far more closely the Galapagos Islands. Then these latter physically resemble the coast of America, yet the aboriginal inhabitants of the two groups are totally unlike. Those of the Cape de Verde Islands bearing the impress of Africa, as the inhabitants of the Galapagos archipelago are stamped with that of America. I have not as yet noticed by far the most remarkable feature in the natural history of this archipelago. It is, that the different islands to a considerable extent are inhabited by a different set of beings. My attention was first called to this fact by the vice-governor, Mr. Lawson, declaring that the tortoises differed from the different islands, and that he could with certainty tell from which island any one was brought. I did not for some time pay sufficient attention to this statement, and I had already partially mingled together the collections from two of the islands. I never dreamed that islands, about fifty or sixty miles apart, and most of them in sight of each other, formed of precisely the same rocks, placed under a quite similar climate. Rising to a nearly equal height, would have been differently tenanted. But we shall soon see that this is the case. It is the fate of most voyagers, no sooner to discover what is most interesting in any locality, than they are hurried from it. But I ought, perhaps, to be thankful that I obtained sufficient materials to establish this most remarkable fact in the distribution of organic beings. The inhabitants, as I have said, state that they can distinguish the tortoises from the different islands, and that they differ not only in size, but in other characters. Captain Porter has described 155 those from Charles and from the nearest island to it, namely, Hood Island, as having their shells in front thick and turned up like a Spanish saddle. Whilst the tortoises from James Island are rounder, blacker, and have a better taste when cooked. M. Bibron, moreover, informs me that he has seen what he considers two distinct species of tortoise from the Galapagos, but he does not know from which islands. The specimens that I brought from three islands were young ones, and probably owing to this cause neither Mr. Gray nor myself could find in them any specific differences. I have remarked that the marine Amblorhynchus was larger at Albemarle Island than elsewhere, and M. Bibron informs me that he has seen two distinct aquatic species of this genus. So that the different islands probably have their representative species or races of the Amblorhynchus, as well as of the tortoise. My attention was first thoroughly aroused, by comparing together the numerous specimens, shot by myself and several other parties on board, of the mocking thrushes, when, to my astonishment, I discovered that all those from Charles Island belonged to one species, Mimus trifasciatus, all from Albemarle Island to M. Parvulus, and all from James and Chatham Islands, between which two other islands are situated, as connecting links, belong to M. Melanotus. These two latter species are closely allied, and would by some ornithologists be considered as only well-marked races or varieties, but the Mimus trifasciatus is very distinct. Unfortunately most of the specimens of the finch tribe were mingled together, but I have strong reasons to suspect that some of the species of the subgroup Geospeza are confined to separate islands. If the different islands have their representatives of Geospeza, it may help to explain the singularly large number of the species of this subgroup in this one small archipelago. And as a probable consequence of their numbers, the perfectly graduated series in the size of their beaks. Two species of the subgroup Cactornis, and two of the Camarynchus, were procured in the archipelago. And of the numerous specimens of these two subgroups shot by four collectors at James Island, all were found to belong to one species of each. Whereas the numerous specimens shot either on Chatham or Charles Island, for the two sets were mingled together, all belonged to the two other species, hence we may feel almost sure that these islands possess their respective species of these two subgroups. In land shells this law of distribution does not appear to hold good. In my very small collection of insects, Mr. Waterhouse remarks, 
that of those which were ticketed with their locality, not one was common to any two of the islands. If we now turn to the flora, we shall find the aboriginal plants of the different islands wonderfully different. I give all the following results on the high authority of my friend Dr. J. Hooker. I may premise that I indiscriminately collected everything in flower on the different islands, and fortunately kept my collection separate. Too much confidence, however, must not be placed in the proportional results, as the small collections brought home by some other naturalists though in some respects confirming the results. Plainly show that much remains to be done in the botany of this group, the leguminosi, moreover, has as yet been only approximately worked out. Name of island. Total no. Of species. No of species found in other parts of the world. No of species confined to the Galapagos archipelago. No confined to the one island. No. Of species confined to the Galapagos archipelago. But found on more than the one island. James Island. 71. 33. 38. 30. 8. Albemarle Island. 46. 18. 26. 22. 4. Chatham Island. 32. 16. 16. 12. 4. Charles Island. 68. 39. Or 29. If the probably imported plants be subtracted. 29. 21. 8. Hence we have the truly wonderful fact, that in James Island, of the 38 Galapagian plants. Or those found in no other part of the world, 30 are exclusively confined to this one island. And in Albemarle Island, of the 26 aboriginal Galapagian plants, 22 are confined to this one island, that is. Only four are at present known to grow in the other islands of the archipelago. And so on, as shown in the above table, with the plants from Chatham and Charles Islands. This fact will, perhaps, be rendered even more striking, by giving a few illustrations, thus, Scalesia, a remarkable arborescent genus of the Compositi. Is confined to the archipelago, it has six species, one from Chatham, one from Albemarle, one from Charles Island, two from James Island, and the sixth from one of the three latter islands. But it is not known from which, not one of these six species grows on any two islands. Again, Euphorbia, a mundane or widely distributed genus, has here eight species, of which seven are confined to the archipelago, and not one found on any two islands, Acalypha and Bereria. Both mundane genera, have respectively six and seven species, none of which have the same species on two islands, with the exception of one Bereria, which does occur on two islands. The species of the Compositi are particularly local, and Dr. Hooker has furnished me with several other most striking illustrations of the difference of the species on the different islands. He remarks that this law of distribution holds good both with those genera confined to the archipelago, and those distributed in other quarters of the world, in like manner we have seen that the different islands have their proper species of the mundane genus of tortoise, and of the widely distributed American genus of the mocking thrush, as well as of two of the Galapagian subgroups of finches, and almost certainly of the Galapagian genus Amblerhynchus. The distribution of the tenants of this archipelago would not be nearly so wonderful, if, for instance, one island had a mocking thrush, and a second island some other quite distinct genus, if one island had its genus of lizard, and a second island another distinct genus, or none whatever. Or if the different islands were inhabited, not by representative species of the same genera of plants, but by totally different genera, as does to a certain extent hold good, for. To give one instance, a large berry-bearing tree at James Island has no representative species in Charles Island. But it is the circumstance, that several of the islands possess their own species of the tortoise, mocking thrush, finches, and numerous plants, these species having the same general habits. Occupying analogous situations, 
and obviously filling the same place in the natural economy of this archipelago, that strikes me with wonder. It may be suspected that some of these representative species, at least in the case of the tortoise and of some of the birds, may hereafter prove to be only well-marked races. But this would be of equally great interest to the philosophical naturalist. I have said that most of the islands are in sight of each other, I may specify that Charles Island is 50 miles from the nearest part of Chatham Island. And 33 miles from the nearest part of Albemarle Island. Chatham Island is 60 miles from the nearest part of James Island, but there are two intermediate islands between them which were not visited by me. James Island is only 10 miles from the nearest part of Albemarle Island, but the two points where the collections were made are 32 miles apart. I must repeat, that neither the nature of the soil, nor height of the land, nor the climate, nor the general character of the associated beings, and therefore their action one on another, can differ much in the different islands. If there be any sensible difference in their climates, it must be between the windward group, namely, Charles and Chatham Islands, and that to leeward. But there seems to be no corresponding difference in the productions of these two halves of the archipelago. The only light which I can throw on this remarkable difference in the inhabitants of the different islands, is, that very strong currents of the sea running in a westerly and w n w. Direction must separate, as far as transportal by the sea is concerned, the southern islands from the northern ones. And between these northern islands a strong n w. Current was observed, which must effectually separate James and Albemarle Islands. As the archipelago is free to a most remarkable degree from gales of wind, neither the birds, insects, nor lighter seeds, would be blown from island to island. And lastly, the profound depth of the ocean between the islands, and their apparently recent, in a geological sense, volcanic origin, render it highly unlikely that they were ever united. And this, probably, is a far more important consideration than any other, with respect to the geographical distribution of their inhabitants. Reviewing the facts here given, one is astonished at the amount of creative force, if such an expression may be used, displayed on these small, barren, and rocky islands. And still more so, at its diverse yet analogous action on points so near each other. I have said that the Galapagos archipelago might be called a satellite attached to America, but it should rather be called a group of satellites, physically similar, organically distinct. Yet intimately related to each other, and all related in a marked, though much lesser degree, to the great American continent. I will conclude my description of the natural history of these islands, by giving an account of the extreme tameness of the birds. This disposition is common to all the terrestrial species. Namely, to the mocking thrushes, the finches, wrens, tyrant flycatchers, the dove, and carrion buzzard. All of them are often approached sufficiently near to be killed with a switch, and sometimes, as I myself tried, with a cap or hat. A gun is here almost superfluous. For with the muzzle I pushed a hawk off the branch of a tree. One day, whilst lying down, a mocking thrush alighted on the edge of a pitcher, made of the shell of a tortoise, which I held in my hand, and began very quietly to sip the water. It allowed me to lift it from the ground whilst seated on the vessel, I often tried, and very nearly succeeded, in catching these birds by their legs. Formerly the birds appear to have been even tamer than at present. Cowley, in the year 1684, says that the turtle doves were so tame, that they would often alight on our hats and arms, so as that we could take them alive, they not fearing man. Until such time as some of our company did fire at them, whereby they were rendered more shy. Dampier also, in the same year, says that a man in a morning's walk might kill six or seven dozen of these doves. At present, although certainly very tame, they do not alight on people's arms, nor do they suffer themselves to be killed in such large numbers. It is surprising that they have not become wilder. For these islands during the last hundred and fifty years have been frequently visited by buccaneers and whalers. And the sailors, wandering through the wood in search of tortoises, always take cruel delight in knocking down the little birds. These birds, although now still more persecuted, do not readily become wild. 
In Charles Island, which had then been colonized about six years, I saw a boy sitting by a well with a switch in his hand, with which he killed the doves and finches as they came to drink. He had already procured a little heap of them for his dinner, and he said that he had constantly been in the habit of waiting by this well for the same purpose. It would appear that the birds of this archipelago, not having as yet learnt that man is a more dangerous animal than the tortoise or the amblyrhynchus, disregard him. In the same manner as in England shy birds, such as magpies, disregard the cows and horses grazing in our fields. The Falkland Islands offer a second instance of birds with a similar disposition. The extraordinary tameness of the little Apicioryncus has been remarked by Pernity, Lesson, and other voyagers. It is not, however, peculiar to that bird, the Polyborus, Snipe, Upland and Lowland Goose, Thrush, Bunting, and even some true hawks, are all more or less tame. As the birds are so tame there, where foxes, hawks, and owls occur, we may infer that the absence of all rapacious animals at the Galapagos, is not the cause of their tameness here. The upland geese at the Falklands show, by the precaution they take in building on the islets, that they are aware of their danger from the foxes, but they are not by this rendered wild towards man. This tameness of the birds, especially of the waterfowl, is strongly contrasted with the habits of the same species in Tierra del Fuego, where for ages past they have been persecuted by the wild inhabitants. In the Falklands, the sportsman may sometimes kill more of the upland geese in one day than he can carry home. Whereas in Tierra del Fuego it is nearly as difficult to kill one, as it is in England to shoot the common wild goose. In the time of Pernity, 1763, all the birds there appear to have been much tamer than at present, he states that the Apicioryncus would almost perch on his finger. And that with a wand he killed ten in half an hour. At that period the birds must have been about as tame as they now are at the Galapagos. They appear to have learnt caution more slowly at these latter islands than at the Falklands, where they have had proportionate means of experience. For besides frequent visits from vessels, those islands have been at intervals colonized during the entire period. Even formerly, when all the birds were so tame, it was impossible by Pernity's account to kill the black-necked swan, a bird of passage. Which probably brought with it the wisdom learnt in foreign countries. I may add that, according to Dubois, all the birds at Bourbon in 1571, 72, with the exception of the flamingos and geese, were so extremely tame, that they could be caught by the hand. Or killed in any number with a stick. Again, at Tristan Diacunha in the Atlantic, Carmichael 156 states that the only two land birds, a thrush and a bunting, were so tame as to suffer themselves to be caught with a hand net. From these several facts we may, I think, conclude, first, that the wildness of birds with regard to man, is a particular instinct directed against him. And not dependent upon any general degree of caution arising from other sources of danger. Secondly, that it is not acquired by individual birds in a short time, even when much persecuted, but that in the course of successive generations it becomes hereditary. With domesticated animals we are accustomed to see new mental habits or instincts acquired or rendered hereditary. But with animals in a state of nature, it must always be most difficult to discover instances of acquired hereditary knowledge. In regard to the wildness of birds towards man, there is no way of accounting for it, except as an inherited habit, comparatively few young birds, in any one year, have been injured by man in England, yet almost all, even nestlings, are afraid of him. Many individuals, on the other hand, both at the Galapagos and at the Falklands, have been pursued and injured by man, yet have not learned a salutary dread of him. We may infer from these facts, what havoc the introduction of any new beast of prey must cause in a country. Before the instincts of the indigenous inhabitants have become adapted to the stranger's craft or power. Chapter 18. Tahiti and New Zealand. Pass through the low archipelago, Tahiti, aspect, vegetation on the mountains, view of Imeo, excursion into the interior, profound ravines, succession of waterfalls, number of wild useful plants, temperance of the inhabitants, their moral state, parliament convened, New Zealand, 
Bay of Islands, Hippos, Excursion to Y Mate, Missionary Establishment, English Weeds Now. Run Wild, Wyomio, Funeral of a New Zealand Woman, Sail for Australia. October 20th, the survey of the Galapagos Archipelago being concluded, we steered towards Tahiti and commenced our long passage of 3,200 miles. In the course of a few days we sailed out of the gloomy and clouded ocean district which extends during the winter far from the coast of South America. We then enjoyed bright and clear weather, while running pleasantly along at the rate of 150 or 160 miles a day before the steady trade wind. The temperature in this more central part of the Pacific is higher than near the American shore. The thermometer in the poop cabin, by night and day, ranged between 80 degrees and 83 degrees, which feels very pleasant, but with one degree or two higher, the heat becomes oppressive. We passed through the low or dangerous archipelago, and saw several of those most curious rings of coral land, just rising above the water's edge, which have been called lagoon islands. A long and brilliantly white beach is capped by a margin of green vegetation, and the strip, looking either way, rapidly narrows away in the distance, and sinks beneath the horizon. From the masthead a wide expanse of smooth water can be seen within the ring. These low hollow coral islands bear no proportion to the vast ocean out of which they abruptly rise. And it seems wonderful, that such weak invaders are not overwhelmed, by the all-powerful and never-tiring waves of that great sea, miscalled the Pacific. November 15. At daylight, Tahiti, an island which must forever remain classical to the voyager in the South Sea, was in view. At a distance the appearance was not attractive. The luxuriant vegetation of the lower part could not yet be seen, and as the clouds rolled past, the wildest and most precipitous peaks showed themselves towards the center of the island. As soon as we anchored in Matavai Bay, we were surrounded by canoes. This was our Sunday, but the Monday of Tahiti, if the case had been reversed, we should not have received a single visit. For the injunction not to launch a canoe on the Sabbath is rigidly obeyed. After dinner we landed to enjoy all the delights produced by the first impressions of a new country, and that country the charming Tahiti. A crowd of men, women, and children, was collected on the memorable point Venus, ready to receive us with laughing, merry faces. They marshaled us towards the house of Mr. Wilson, the missionary of the district, who met us on the road, and gave us a very friendly reception. After sitting a very short time in his house, we separated to walk about, but returned there in the evening. The land capable of cultivation, is scarcely in any part more than a fringe of low alluvial soil, accumulated round the base of the mountains. And protected from the waves of the sea by a coral reef, which encircles the entire line of coast. Within the reef there is an expanse of smooth water, like that of a lake, where the canoes of the natives can ply with safety and where ships anchor. The low land which comes down to the beach of coral sand, is covered by the most beautiful productions of the intertropical regions. In the midst of bananas, orange, coconut, and breadfruit trees, spots are cleared where yams, sweet potatoes, and sugarcane, and pineapples are cultivated. Even the brushwood is an imported fruit tree, namely, the guava, which from its abundance has become as noxious as a weed. In Brazil I have often admired the varied beauty of the bananas, palms, and orange trees contrasted together. And here we also have the breadfruit, conspicuous from its large, glossy, and deeply digitate leaf. It is admirable to behold groves of a tree, sending forth its branches with the vigor of an English oak, loaded with large and most nutritious fruit. However seldom the usefulness of an object can account for the pleasure of beholding it, in the case of these beautiful woods. The knowledge of their high productiveness no doubt enters largely into the feeling of admiration. The little winding paths, cool from the surrounding shade, led to the scattered houses, the owners of which everywhere gave us a cheerful and most hospitable reception. I was pleased with nothing so much as with the inhabitants. There is a mildness in the expression of their countenances which at once banishes the idea of a savage. An intelligence which shows that they are advancing in civilization. The common people, when working, 
keep the upper part of their bodies quite naked. And it is then that the Tahitians are seen to advantage. They are very tall, broad-shouldered, athletic, and well-proportioned. It has been remarked, that it requires little habit to make a dark skin more pleasing and natural to the eye of a European than his own color. A white man bathing by the side of a Tahitian, was like a plant bleached by the gardener's art compared with a fine dark green one growing vigorously in the open fields. Most of the men are tattooed, and the ornaments follow the curvature of the body so gracefully, that they have a very elegant effect. One common pattern, varying in its details, is somewhat like the crown of a palm tree. It springs from the central line of the back, and gracefully curls round both sides. The simile may be a fanciful one, but I thought the body of a man thus ornamented was like the trunk of a noble tree embraced by a delicate creeper. Many of the elder people had their feet covered with small figures, so placed as to resemble a sock. This fashion, however, is partly gone by, and has been succeeded by others. Here, although fashion is far from immutable, everyone must abide by that prevailing in his youth. An old man has thus his age forever stamped on his body, and he cannot assume the airs of a young dandy. The women are tattooed in the same manner as the men, and very commonly on their fingers. One unbecoming fashion is now almost universal, namely, shaving the hair from the upper part of the head, in a circular form, so as to leave only an outer ring. The missionaries have tried to persuade the people to change this habit, but it is the fashion, and that is a sufficient answer at Tahiti, as well as at Paris. I was much disappointed in the personal appearance of the women, they are far inferior in every respect to the men. The custom of wearing a white or scarlet flower in the back of the head, or through a small hole in each ear, is pretty. A crown of woven coconut leaves is also worn as a shade for the eyes. The women appear to be in greater want of some becoming costume even than the men. Nearly all the natives understand a little English, that is, they know the names of common things. And by the aid of this, together with signs, a lame sort of conversation could be carried on. In returning in the evening to the boat, we stopped to witness a very pretty scene. Numbers of children were playing on the beach, and had lighted bonfires which illumined the placid sea and surrounding trees, others, in circles, were singing Tahitian verses. We seated ourselves on the sand, and joined their party. The songs were impromptu, and I believe related to our arrival, one little girl sang a line, which the rest took up in parts, forming a very pretty chorus. The whole scene made us unequivocally aware that we were seated on the shores of an island in the far-famed South Sea. 17th. This day is reckoned in the logbook as Tuesday the 17th, instead of Monday the 16th, owing to our, so far, successful chase of the sun. Before breakfast the ship was hemmed in by a flotilla of canoes, and when the natives were allowed to come on board, I suppose there could not have been less than two hundred. It was the opinion of everyone that it would have been difficult to have picked out an equal number from any other nation, who would have given so little trouble. Everybody brought something for sale, shells were the main articles of trade. The Tahitians now fully understand the value of money, and prefer it to old clothes or other articles. The various coins, however, of English and Spanish denomination puzzle them, and they never seem to think the small silver quite secure until changed into dollars. Some of the chiefs have accumulated considerable sums of money. One chief, not long since, offered eight hundred dollars, about one six zero, for a small vessel. And frequently they purchase whaleboats and horses at the rate of from fifty to one hundred dollars. After breakfast I went on shore, and ascended the nearest slope to a height of between two and three thousand feet. The outer mountains are smooth and conical, but steep. And the old volcanic rocks, of which they are formed, have been cut through by many profound ravines, diverging from the central broken parts of the island to the coast. Having crossed the narrow low girt of inhabited and fertile land, I followed a smooth steep ridge between two of the deep ravines. The vegetation was singular, consisting almost exclusively of small dwarf ferns, mingled higher up, with coarse grass. It was not very dissimilar from that on some of the Welsh hills, 
and this so close above the orchard of tropical plants on the coast was very surprising. At the highest point, which I reached, trees again appeared. Of the three zones of comparative luxuriance, the lower one owes its moisture, and therefore fertility, to its flatness. For, being scarcely raised above the level of the sea, the water from the higher land drains away slowly. The intermediate zone does not, like the upper one, reach into a damp and cloudy atmosphere, and therefore remain sterile. The woods in the upper zone are very pretty, tree ferns replacing the coconuts on the coast. It must not, however, be supposed that these woods at all equal in splendor the forests of Brazil. The vast numbers of productions, which characterize a continent, cannot be expected to occur in an island. From the highest point which I attained, there was a good view of the distant island of Aimeo, dependent on the same sovereign with Tahiti. On the lofty and broken pinnacles, white massive clouds were piled up, which formed an island in the blue sky, as Aimeo itself did in the blue ocean. The island, with the exception of one small gateway, is completely encircled by a reef. At this distance, a narrow but well-defined brilliantly white line was alone visible, where the waves first encountered the wall of coral. The mountains rose abruptly out of the glassy expanse of the lagoon, included within this narrow white line, outside which the heaving waters of the ocean were dark-colored. The view was striking, it may aptly be compared to a framed engraving, where the frame represents the breakers, the marginal paper the smooth lagoon, and the drawing the island itself. When in the evening I descended from the mountain, a man, whom I had pleased with a trifling gift, met me, bringing with him hot roasted bananas, a pineapple, and coconuts. After walking under a burning sun, I do not know anything more delicious than the milk of a young coconut. Pineapples are here so abundant that the people eat them in the same wasteful manner as we might turnips. They are of an excellent flavor, perhaps even better than those cultivated in England. And this I believe is the highest compliment which can be paid to any fruit. Before going on board, Mr. Wilson interpreted for me to the Tahitian who had paid me so adroit an attention, that I wanted him and another man to accompany me on a short excursion into the mountains. 18th. In the morning I came on shore early, bringing with me some provisions in a bag, and two blankets for myself and servant. These were lashed to each end of a long pole, which was alternately carried by my Tahitian companions on their shoulders. These men are accustomed thus to carry, for a whole day, as much as fifty pounds at each end of their poles. I told my guides to provide themselves with food and clothing. But they said that there was plenty of food in the mountains, and for clothing, that their skins were sufficient. Our line of march was the valley of Tayoru, down which a river flows into the sea by Point Venus. This is one of the principal streams in the island, and its source lies at the base of the loftiest central pinnacles, which rise to a height of about 7,000 feet. The whole island is so mountainous that the only way to penetrate into the interior is to follow up the valleys. Our road, at first, lay through woods which bordered each side of the river. And the glimpses of the lofty central peaks, seen as through an avenue, with here and there a waving coconut tree on one side, were extremely picturesque. The valley soon began to narrow, and the sides to grow lofty and more precipitous. After having walked between three and four hours, we found the width of the ravine scarcely exceeded that of the bed of the stream. On each hand the walls were nearly vertical, yet from the soft nature of the volcanic strata, trees and a rank vegetation sprung from every projecting ledge. These precipices must have been some thousand feet high, and the whole formed a mountain gorge far more magnificent than anything which I had ever before beheld. Until the midday sun stood vertically over the ravine, the air felt cool and damp, but now it became very sultry. Shaded by a ledge of rock, beneath a facade of columnar lava, we ate our dinner. My guides had already procured a dish of small fish and freshwater prawns. They carried with them a small net stretched on a hoop. And where the water was deep and in eddies, they dived, and like otters, with their eyes open followed the fish into holes and corners, and thus caught them. The Tahitians have the dexterity of amphibious animals in the water. 
An anecdote mentioned by Ellis shows how much they feel at home in this element. When a horse was landing for Pomar in 1817, the slings broke, and it fell into the water. Immediately the natives jumped overboard, and by their cries and vain efforts at assistance almost drowned it. As soon, however, as it reached the shore, the whole population took to flight, and tried to hide themselves from the man-carrying pig, as they christened the horse. A little higher up, the river divided itself into three little streams. The two northern ones were impracticable, owing to a succession of waterfalls which descended from the jagged summit of the highest mountain. The other to all appearance was equally inaccessible, but we managed to ascend it by a most extraordinary road. The sides of the valley were here nearly precipitous, but, as frequently happens with stratified rocks, small ledges projected, which were thickly covered by wild bananas, lilacious plants, and other luxuriant productions of the tropics. The Tahitians, by climbing amongst these ledges, searching for fruit, had discovered a track by which the whole precipice could be scaled. The first ascent from the valley was very dangerous. For it was necessary to pass a steeply inclined face of naked rock, by the aid of ropes which we brought with us. How any person discovered that this formidable spot was the only point where the side of the mountain was practicable, I cannot imagine. We then cautiously walked along one of the ledges till we came to one of the three streams. This ledge formed a flat spot, above which a beautiful cascade, some hundred feet in height, poured down its waters, and beneath, another high cascade fell into the main stream in the valley below. From this cool and shady recess we made a circuit to avoid the overhanging waterfall. As before, we followed little projecting ledges, the danger being partly concealed by the thickness of the vegetation. In passing from one of the ledges to another, there was a vertical wall of rock. One of the Tahitians, a fine active man, placed the trunk of a tree against this, climbed up it, and then by the aid of crevices reached the summit. He fixed the ropes to a projecting point, and lowered them for our dog and luggage, and then we clambered up ourselves. Beneath the ledge on which the dead tree was placed, the precipice must have been five or six hundred feet deep. And if the abyss had not been partly concealed by the overhanging ferns and lilies my head would have turned giddy, and nothing should have induced me to have attempted it. We continued to ascend, sometimes along ledges, and sometimes along knife-edged ridges, having on each hand profound ravines. In the Cordillera I have seen mountains on a far grander scale, but for abruptness, nothing at all comparable with this. In the evening we reached a flat little spot on the banks of the same stream, which we had continued to follow, and which descends in a chain of waterfalls, here we bivouacked for the night. On each side of the ravine there were great beds of the mountain banana, covered with ripe fruit. Many of these plants were from twenty to twenty-five feet high, and from three to four in circumference. By the aid of strips of bark for rope, the stems of bamboos for rafters, and the large leaf of the banana for a thatch, the Tahitians in a few minutes built us an excellent house. And with withered leaves made a soft bed. They then proceeded to make a fire, and cook our evening meal. A light was procured, by rubbing a blunt pointed stick in a groove made in another, as if with intention of deepening it, until by the friction the dust became ignited. A peculiarly white and very light wood, the hibiscus tiliarius, is alone used for this purpose, it is the same which serves for poles to carry any burden. And for the floating outriggers to their canoes. The fire was produced in a few seconds, but to a person who does not understand the art, it requires, as I found, the greatest exertion. But at last, to my great pride, I succeeded in igniting the dust. The gaucho in the pampas uses a different method, taking an elastic stick about eighteen inches long, he presses one end on his breast, and the other pointed end into a hole in a piece of wood. And then rapidly turns the curved part, like a carpenter's center bit. The Tahitians having made a small fire of sticks, placed a score of stones, of about the size of cricket balls, on the burning wood. In about ten minutes the sticks were consumed, and the stones hot. They had previously folded up in small parcels of leaves, pieces of beef, fish, ripe and unripe bananas, and the tops of the wild arum. 
These green parcels were laid in a layer between two layers of the hot stones, and the hole then covered up with earth, so that no smoke or steam could escape. In about a quarter of an hour, the hole was most deliciously cooked. The choice green parcels were now laid on a cloth of banana leaves, and with a coconut shell we drank the cool water of the running stream, and thus we enjoyed our rustic meal. I could not look on the surrounding plants without admiration. On every side were forests of banana, the fruit of which, though serving for food in various ways, lay in heaps decaying on the ground. In front of us there was an extensive break of wild sugarcane, and the stream was shaded by the dark green knotted stem of the Ava, so famous in former days for its powerful intoxicating effects. I chewed a piece, and found that it had an acrid and unpleasant taste, which would have induced anyone at once to have pronounced it poisonous. Thanks to the missionaries, this plant now thrives only in these deep ravines, innocuous to everyone. Close by I saw the wild arum, the roots of which, when well baked, are good to eat, and the young leaves better than spinach. There was the wild yam, an liliaceous plant called tea, which grows in abundance, and has a soft brown root, in shape and size like a huge log of wood, this served us for dessert. For it is as sweet as treacle, and with a pleasant taste. There were, moreover, several other wild fruits, and useful vegetables. The little stream, besides its cool water, produced eels, and crayfish. I did indeed admire this scene, when I compared it with an uncultivated one in the temperate zones. I felt the force of the remark, that man, at least savage man, with his reasoning powers only partly developed, is the child of the tropics. As the evening drew to a close, I strolled beneath the gloomy shade of the bananas up the course of the stream. My walk was soon brought to a close, by coming to a waterfall between two and three hundred feet high, and again above this there was another. I mention all these waterfalls in this one brook, to give a general idea of the inclination of the land. In the little recess where the water fell, it did not appear that a breath of wind had ever blown. The thin edges of the great leaves of the banana, damp with spray, were unbroken, instead of being, as is so generally the case, split into a thousand shreds. From our position, almost suspended on the mountainside, there were glimpses into the depths of the neighboring valleys. And the lofty points of the central mountains, towering up within sixty degrees of the zenith, hid half the evening sky. Thus seated, it was a sublime spectacle to watch the shades of night gradually obscuring the last and highest pinnacles. Before we laid ourselves down to sleep, the elder Tahitian fell on his knees, and with closed eyes repeated a long prayer in his native tongue. He prayed as a Christian should do, with fitting reverence, and without the fear of ridicule or any ostentation of piety. At our meals neither of the men would taste food, without saying beforehand a short grace. Those travelers who think that a Tahitian prays only when the eyes of the missionary are fixed on him, should have slept with us that night on the mountainside. Before morning it rained very heavily, but the good thatch of banana leaves kept us dry. November 19. At daylight my friends, after their morning prayer, prepared an excellent breakfast in the same manner as in the evening. They themselves certainly partook of it largely. Indeed I never saw any men eat near so much. I suppose such enormously capacious stomachs must be the effect of a large part of their diet consisting of fruit and vegetables, which contain, in a given bulk, a comparatively small portion of nutriment. Unwittingly, I was the means of my companions breaking, as I afterwards learned, one of their own laws, and resolutions, I took with me a flask of spirits, which they could not refuse to partake of. But as often as they drank a little, they put their fingers before their mouths, and uttered the word missionary. About two years ago, although the use of the Ava was prevented, drunkenness from the introduction of spirits became very prevalent. The missionaries prevailed on a few good men, who saw that their country was rapidly going to ruin, to join with them in a temperance society. From good sense or shame, all the chiefs and the queen were at last persuaded to join. Immediately a law was passed, that no spirits should be allowed to be introduced into the island, and that he who sold and he who bought the forbidden article should be punished by a fine. 
With remarkable justice, a certain period was allowed for stock in hand to be sold, before the law came into effect. But when it did, a general search was made, in which even the houses of the missionaries were not exempted, and all the Ava, as the natives call all ardent spirits, was poured on the ground. When one reflects on the effect of intemperance on the aborigines of the two Americas, I think it will be acknowledged that every well-wisher of Tahiti owes no common debt of gratitude to the missionaries. As long as the little island of St. Helena remained under the government of the East India Company, spirits, owing to the great injury they had produced, were not allowed to be imported. But wine was supplied from the Cape of Good Hope. It is rather a striking and not very gratifying fact, that in the same year that spirits were allowed to be sold in Helena, their use was banished from Tahiti by the free will of the people. After breakfast we proceeded on our journey. As my object was merely to see a little of the interior scenery, we returned by another track, which descended into the main valley lower down. For some distance we wound, by a most intricate path, along the side of the mountain which formed the valley. In the less precipitous parts we passed through extensive groves of the wild banana. The Tahitians, with their naked, tattooed bodies, their heads ornamented with flowers, and seen in the dark shade of these groves, would have formed a fine picture of man inhabiting some primeval land. In our descent we followed the line of ridges, these were exceedingly narrow, and for considerable lengths steep as a ladder, but all clothed with vegetation. The extreme care necessary in poising each step rendered the walk fatiguing. I did not cease to wonder at these ravines and precipices, when viewing the country from one of the knife-edged ridges, the point of support was so small, that the effect was nearly the same as it must be from a balloon. In this descent we had occasion to use the ropes only once, at the point where we entered the main valley. We slept under the same ledge of rock where we had dined the day before, the night was fine, but from the depth and narrowness of the gorge, profoundly dark. Before actually seeing this country, I found it difficult to understand two facts mentioned by Ellis. Namely, that after the murderous battles of former times, the survivors on the conquered side retired into the mountains, where a handful of men could resist a multitude. Certainly half a dozen men, at the spot where the Tahitian reared the old tree, could easily have repulsed thousands. Secondly, that after the introduction of Christianity, there were wild men who lived in the mountains, and whose retreats were unknown to the more civilized inhabitants. November 20th. In the morning we started early, and reached Matavai at noon. On the road we met a large party of noble athletic men, going for wild bananas. I found that the ship, on account of the difficulty in watering, had moved to the harbor of Papua, to which place I immediately walked. This is a very pretty spot. The cove is surrounded by reefs, and the water as smooth as in a lake. The cultivated ground, with its beautiful productions, interspersed with cottages, comes close down to the water's edge. From the varying accounts which I had read before reaching these islands, I was very anxious to form, from my own observation, a judgment of their moral state, although such judgment would necessarily be very imperfect. First impressions at all times very much depend on one's previously acquired ideas. My notions were drawn from Ellis's Polynesian Researches, an admirable and most interesting work, but naturally looking at everything under a favorable point of view, from Beachy's voyage. And from that of Kotzebue, which is strongly adverse to the whole missionary system. He who compares these three accounts will, I think, form a tolerably accurate conception of the present state of Tahiti. One of my impressions which I took from the two last authorities, was decidedly incorrect, viz., that the Tahitians had become a gloomy race, and lived in fear of the missionaries. Of the latter feeling I saw no trace, unless, indeed, fear and respect be confounded under one name. Instead of discontent being a common feeling, it would be difficult in Europe to pick out of a crowd half so many merry and happy faces. The prohibition of the flute and dancing is inveighed against as wrong and foolish, the more than Presbyterian manner of keeping the Sabbath is looked at in a similar light. On these points I will not pretend to offer any opinion to men who have resided as many years as I was days on the island. 
On the whole, it appears to me that the morality and religion of the inhabitants are highly creditable. There are many who attack, even more acrimoniously than Kotzebu, both the missionaries, their system, and the effects produced by it. Such reasoners never compare the present state with that of the island only twenty years ago, nor even with that of Europe at this day. But they compare it with the high standard of gospel perfection. They expect the missionaries to effect that which the apostles themselves failed to do. Inasmuch as the condition of the people falls short of this high standard, blame is attached to the missionary, instead of credit for that which he has effected. They forget, or will not remember, that human sacrifices. And the power of an idolatrous priesthood, a system of profligacy unparalleled in any other part of the world, infanticide a consequence of that system, bloody wars. Where the conquerors spared neither women nor children, that all these have been abolished. And that dishonesty, intemperance, and licentiousness have been greatly reduced by the introduction of Christianity. In a voyager to forget these things is base ingratitude. For should he chance to be at the point of shipwreck on some unknown coast, he will most devoutly pray that the lesson of the missionary may have extended thus far. In point of morality, the virtue of the women, it has been often said, is most open to exception. But before they are blamed too severely, it will be well distinctly to call to mind the scenes described by Captain Cook and Mr. Banks, in which the grandmothers and mothers of the present race played a part. Those who are most severe, should consider how much of the morality of the women in Europe is owing to the system early impressed by mothers on their daughters. And how much in each individual case to the precepts of religion. But it is useless to argue against such reasoners. I believe that, disappointed in not finding the field of licentiousness quite so open as formerly, they will not give credit to a morality which they do not wish to practice or to a religion which they undervalue, if not despise. Sunday, 22 nd, the harbour of Papite, where the Queen resides, may be considered as the capital of the island, it is also the seat of government, and the chief resort of shipping. Captain Fitzroy took a party there this day to hear divine service, first in the Tahitian language, and afterwards in our own. Mr. Pritchard, the leading missionary in the island, performed the service. The chapel consisted of a large airy framework of wood. And it was filled to excess by tidy, clean people, of all ages and both sexes. I was rather disappointed in the apparent degree of attention, but I believe my expectations were raised too high. At all events the appearance was quite equal to that in a country church in England. The singing of the hymns was decidedly very pleasing, but the language from the pulpit, although fluently delivered, did not sound well, a constant repetition of words, like ta-da-ta, matamai, rendered it monotonous. After English service, a party returned on foot to Matavai. It was a pleasant walk, sometimes along the sea beach and sometimes under the shade of the many beautiful trees. About two years ago, a small vessel under English colors was plundered by some of the inhabitants of the Low Islands, which were then under the dominion of the Queen of Tahiti. It was believed that the perpetrators were instigated to this act by some indiscreet laws issued by Her Majesty. The British government demanded compensation, which was acceded to, and the sum of nearly $3,000 was agreed to be paid on the 1st of last September. The Commodore at Lima ordered Captain Fitz Roy to inquire concerning this debt, and to demand satisfaction if it were not paid. Captain Fitz Roy accordingly requested an interview with the Queen Pomar, since famous from the ill-treatment she had received from the French. And a parliament was held to consider the question, at which all the principal chiefs of the island and the Queen were assembled. I will not attempt to describe what took place, after the interesting account given by Captain Fitz Roy. The money, it appeared, had not been paid, perhaps the alleged reasons were rather equivocal but otherwise I cannot sufficiently express our general surprise at the extreme good sense, the reasoning powers, moderation, candor, and prompt resolution, which were displayed on all sides. I believe we all left the meeting with a very different opinion of the Tahitians, from what we entertained when we entered. 
the chiefs and people resolved to subscribe and complete the sum which was wanting. Captain Fitz Roy urged that it was hard that their private property should be sacrificed for the crimes of distant islanders. They replied, that they were grateful for his consideration, but that Pomar was their queen, and that they were determined to help her in this her difficulty. This resolution and its prompt execution, for a book was opened early the next morning, made a perfect conclusion to this very remarkable scene of loyalty and good feeling. After the main discussion was ended, several of the chiefs took the opportunity of asking Captain Fitz Roy many intelligent questions on international customs and laws relating to the treatment of ships and foreigners. On some points, as soon as the decision was made, the law was issued verbally on the spot. This Tahitian parliament lasted for several hours. And when it was over Captain Fitz Roy invited Queen Pomar to pay the Beagle a visit. November 25 th, in the evening four boats were sent for Her Majesty. The ship was dressed with flags, and the yards manned on her coming on board. She was accompanied by most of the chiefs. The behavior of all was very proper, they begged for nothing, and seemed much pleased with Captain Fitzroy's presence. The queen is a large awkward woman, without any beauty, grace, or dignity. She has only one royal attribute, a perfect immovability of expression under all circumstances, and that rather a sullen one. The rockets were most admired, and a deep, oh! could be heard from the shore, all round the dark bay, after each explosion. The sailors' songs were also much admired. And the queen said she thought that one of the most boisterous ones certainly could not be a hymn. The royal party did not return on shore till past midnight. 26th. In the evening, with a gentle land breeze, a course was steered for New Zealand. And as the sun set, we had a farewell view of the mountains of Tahiti, the island to which every voyager has offered up his tribute of admiration. December 19. In the evening we saw in the distance New Zealand. We may now consider that we have nearly crossed the Pacific. It is necessary to sail over this great ocean to comprehend its immensity. Moving quickly onwards for weeks together, we meet with nothing but the same blue, profoundly deep, ocean. Even within the archipelagos, the islands are mere specks, and far distant one from the other. Accustomed to look at maps drawn on a small scale, where dots, shading, and names are crowded together. We do not rightly judge how infinitely small the proportion of dry land is to water of this vast expanse. The meridian of the antipodes has likewise been passed, and now every league, it made us happy to think, was one league nearer to England. These antipodes call to one's mind old recollections of childish doubt and wonder. Only the other day I looked forward to this airy barrier as a definite point in our voyage homewards. But now I find it, and all such resting places for the imagination, are like shadows, which a man moving onwards cannot catch. A gale of wind lasting for some days, has lately given us full leisure to measure the future stages in our homeward voyage, and to wish most earnestly for its termination. December 21st. Early in the morning we entered the Bay of Islands, and being becalmed for some hours near the mouth, we did not reach the anchorage till the middle of the day. The country is hilly, with a smooth outline, and is deeply intersected by numerous arms of the sea extending from the bay. The surface appears from a distance as if clothed with coarse pasture, but this in truth is nothing but fern. On the more distant hills, as well as in parts of the valleys, there is a good deal of woodland. The general tint of the landscape is not a bright green. And it resembles the country a short distance to the south of Concepcion in Chile. In several parts of the bay, little villages of square tidy-looking houses are scattered close down to the water's edge. Three whaling ships were lying at anchor, and a canoe every now and then crossed from shore to shore, with these exceptions, an air of extreme quietness reigned over the whole district. Only a single canoe came alongside. This, and the aspect of the whole scene, afforded a remarkable, and not very pleasing contrast, with our joyful and boisterous welcome at Tahiti. In the afternoon we went on shore to one of the larger groups of houses, which yet hardly deserves the title of a village. 
Its name is Pahia, it is the residence of the missionaries. And there are no native residents except servants and laborers. In the vicinity of the Bay of Islands, the number of Englishmen, including their families, amounts to between two and three hundred. All the cottages, many of which are whitewashed and look very neat, are the property of the English. The hovels of the natives are so diminutive and paltry, that they can scarcely be perceived from a distance. At Pahia, it was quite pleasing to behold the English flowers in the gardens before the houses, there were roses of several kinds, honeysuckle, jasmine, stocks, and whole hedges of sweetbriar. December 22 nd, in the morning I went out walking, but I soon found that the country was very impracticable. All the hills are thickly covered with tall fern, together with a low bush which grows like a cypress, and very little ground has been cleared or cultivated. I then tried the sea beach. But proceeding towards either hand, my walk was soon stopped by saltwater creeks and deep brooks. The communication between the inhabitants of the different parts of the bay, is, as in Chile Way, almost entirely kept up by boats. I was surprised to find that almost every hill which I ascended, had been at some former time more or less fortified. The summits were cut into steps or successive terraces, and frequently they had been protected by deep trenches. I afterwards observed that the principal hills inland in like manner showed an artificial outline. These are the Pa, so frequently mentioned by Captain Cook under the name of Hippa. The difference of sound being owing to the prefixed article. That the Pa had formerly been much used, was evident from the piles of shells, and the pits in which, as I was informed, sweet potatoes used to be kept as a reserve. As there was no water on these hills, the defenders could never have anticipated a long siege, but only a hurried attack for plunder. Against which the successive terraces would have afforded good protection. The general introduction of firearms has changed the whole system of warfare, and an exposed situation on the top of a hill is now worse than useless. The Pa in consequence are, at the present day, always built on a level piece of ground. They consist of a double stockade of thick and tall posts, placed in a zigzag line, so that every part can be flanked. Within the stockade a mound of earth is thrown up, behind which the defenders can rest in safety, or use their firearms over it. On the level of the ground little archways sometimes pass through this breastwork, by which means the defenders can crawl out to the stockade and reconnoiter their enemies. The Rev. W. Williams, who gave me this account, added, that in one paw he had noticed spurs or buttresses projecting on the inner and protected side of the mound of earth. On asking the chief the use of them, he replied, that if two or three of his men were shot, their neighbors would not see the bodies, and so be discouraged. These pa are considered by the New Zealanders as very perfect means of defense, for the attacking force is never so well disciplined as to rush in a body to the stockade, cut it down, and effect their entry. When a tribe goes to war, the chief cannot order one party to go here and another there, but every man fights in the manner which best pleases himself. And to each separate individual to approach a stockade defended by firearms must appear certain death. I should think a more warlike race of inhabitants could not be found in any part of the world than the New Zealanders. Their conduct on first seeing a ship, as described by Captain Cook, strongly illustrates this, the act of throwing volleys of stones at so great and novel an object. And their defiance of, come on shore and we will kill and eat you all, shows uncommon boldness. This warlike spirit is evident in many of their customs, and even in their smallest actions. If a New Zealander is struck, although but in joke, the blow must be returned and of this I saw an instance with one of our officers. At the present day, from the progress of civilization, there is much less warfare, except among some of the southern tribes. I heard a characteristic anecdote of what took place some time ago in the south. A missionary found a chief and his tribe in preparation for war. Their muskets clean and bright, and their ammunition ready. He reasoned long on the inutility of the war, and the little provocation which had been given for it. The chief was much shaken in his resolution, and seemed in doubt, but at length it occurred to him that a barrel of his gunpowder was in a bad state, and that it would not keep much longer. 
This was brought forward as an unanswerable argument for the necessity of immediately declaring war, the idea of allowing so much good gunpowder to spoil was not to be thought of. And this settled the point. I was told by the missionaries that in the life of Shangi, the chief who visited England, the love of war was the one and lasting spring of every action. The tribe in which he was a principal chief had at one time been oppressed by another tribe from the Thames River. A solemn oath was taken by the men that when their boys should grow up, and they should be powerful enough, they would never forget or forgive these injuries. To fulfill this oath appears to have been Shangi's chief motive for going to England, and when there it was his sole object. Presents were valued only as they could be converted into arms. Of the arts, those alone interested him which were connected with the manufacture of arms. When at Sydney, Shangi, by a strange coincidence, met the hostile chief of the Thames River at the house of Mr. Marsden, their conduct was civil to each other. But Shangi told him that when again in New Zealand he would never cease to carry war into his country. The challenge was accepted, and Shangi on his return fulfilled the threat to the utmost letter. The tribe on the Thames River was utterly overthrown, and the chief to whom the challenge had been given was himself killed. Shangi, although harboring such deep feelings of hatred and revenge, is described as having been a good-natured person. In the evening I went with Captain Fitz Roy and Mr. Baker, one of the missionaries, to pay a visit to Kororatica, we wandered about the village, and saw and conversed with many of the people, both men, women, and children. Looking at the New Zealander, one naturally compares him with the Tahitian, both belonging to the same family of mankind. The comparison, however, tells heavily against the New Zealander. He may, perhaps be superior in energy, but in every other respect his character is of a much lower order. One glance at their respective expressions, brings conviction to the mind that one is a savage, the other a civilized man. It would be vain to seek in the whole of New Zealand a person with the face and mien of the old Tahitian chief Utami. No doubt the extraordinary manner in which tattooing is here practiced, gives a disagreeable expression to their countenances. The complicated but symmetrical figures covering the whole face, puzzle and mislead an unaccustomed eye, it is moreover probable, that the deep incisions. By destroying the play of the superficial muscles, give an air of rigid inflexibility. But, besides this, there is a twinkling in the eye, which cannot indicate anything but cunning and ferocity. Their figures are tall and bulky. But not comparable in elegance with those of the working classes in Tahiti. But their persons and houses are filthily dirty and offensive, the idea of washing either their bodies or their clothes never seems to enter their heads. I saw a chief, who was wearing a shirt black and matted with filth, and when asked how it came to be so dirty, he replied, with surprise, do not you see it is an old one? Some of the men have shirts, but the common dress is one or two large blankets, generally black with dirt, which are thrown over their shoulders in a very inconvenient and awkward fashion. A few of the principal chiefs have decent suits of English clothes, but these are only worn on great occasions. December 23rd. At a place called Waimate, about fifteen miles from the Bay of Islands, and midway between the eastern and western coasts, the missionaries have purchased some land for agricultural purposes. I had been introduced to the Rev. W. Williams, who, upon my expressing a wish, invited me to pay him a visit there. Mr. Bushby, the British resident, offered to take me in his boat by a creek, where I should see a pretty waterfall, and by which means my walk would be shortened. He likewise procured for me a guide. Upon asking a neighboring chief to recommend a man, the chief himself offered to go. But his ignorance of the value of money was so complete, that at first he asked how many pounds I would give him, but afterwards was well contented with two dollars. When I showed the chief a very small bundle, which I wanted carried, it became absolutely necessary for him to take a slave. These feelings of pride are beginning to wear away. But formerly a leading man would sooner have died, than undergone the indignity of carrying the smallest burden. My companion was a light active man, dressed in a dirty blanket, and with his face completely tattooed. He had formerly been a great warrior. 
he appeared to be on very cordial terms with Mr. Bushby. But at various times they had quarreled violently. Mr. Bushby remarked that a little quiet irony would frequently silence any one of these natives in their most blustering moments. This chief has come and harangued Mr. Bushby in a hectoring manner, saying, Great chief, a great man, a friend of mine, has come to pay me a visit, you must give him something good to eat, some fine presents, etc. Mr. Bushby has allowed him to finish his discourse, and then has quietly replied by some answer such as, what else shall your slave do for you? The man would then instantly, with a very comical expression, cease his braggadocio. Some time ago, Mr. Bushby suffered a far more serious attack. A chief and a party of men tried to break into his house in the middle of the night, and not finding this so easy, commenced a brisk firing with their muskets. Mr. Bushby was slightly wounded, but the party was at length driven away. Shortly afterwards it was discovered who was the aggressor. And a general meeting of the chiefs was convened to consider the case. It was considered by the New Zealanders as very atrocious, inasmuch as it was a night attack, and that Mrs. Bushby was lying ill in the house, this latter circumstance, much to their honor, being considered in all cases as a protection. The chiefs agreed to confiscate the land of the aggressor to the King of England. The whole proceeding, however, in thus trying and punishing a chief was entirely without precedent. The aggressor, moreover, lost caste in the estimation of his equals and this was considered by the British as of more consequence than the confiscation of his land. As the boat was shoving off, a second chief stepped into her, who only wanted the amusement of the passage up and down the creek. I never saw a more horrid and ferocious expression than this man had. It immediately struck me I had somewhere seen his likeness, it will be found in Wretch's outlines to Schiller's Ballad of Fridolin, where two men are pushing Robert into the burning iron furnace. It is the man who has his arm on Robert's breast. Physiognomy here spoke the truth, this chief had been a notorious murderer, and was an errant coward to boot. At the point where the boat landed, Mr. Bushby accompanied me a few hundred yards on the road. I could not help admiring the cool impudence of the hoary old villain, whom we left lying in the boat, when he shouted to Mr. Bushby, do not you stay long, I shall be tired of waiting here. We now commenced our walk. The road lay along a well-beaten path, bordered on each side by the tall fern, which covers the whole country. After traveling some miles, we came to a little country village, where a few hovels were collected together, and some patches of ground cultivated with potatoes. The introduction of the potato has been the most essential benefit to the island, it is now much more used than any native vegetable. New Zealand is favored by one great natural advantage. Namely, that the inhabitants can never perish from famine. The whole country abounds with fern, and the roots of this plant, if not very palatable, yet contain much nutriment. A native can always subsist on these, and on the shellfish, which are abundant on all parts of the seacoast. The villages are chiefly conspicuous by the platforms which are raised on four posts ten or twelve feet above the ground, and on which the produce of the fields is kept secure from all accidents. On coming near one of the huts I was much amused by seeing in due form the ceremony of rubbing, or, as it ought to be called, pressing noses. The women, on our first approach, began uttering something in a most dolorous voice, they then squatted themselves down and held up their faces. My companion standing over them, one after another, placed the bridge of his nose at right angles to theirs, and commenced pressing. This lasted rather longer than a cordial shake of the hand with us, and as we vary the force of the grasp of the hand in shaking, so do they in pressing. During the process they uttered comfortable little grunts, very much in the same manner as two pigs do, when rubbing against each other. I noticed that the slave would press noses with anyone he met, indifferently either before or after his master the chief. Although among the savages, the chief has absolute power of life and death over his slave, yet there is an entire absence of ceremony between them. Mr. Birchall has remarked the same thing in southern Africa, with the rude Bacopins. Where civilization has arrived at a certain point. 
Complex formalities soon arise between the different grades of society, thus at Tahiti all were formerly obliged to uncover themselves as low as the waist in presence of the king. The ceremony of pressing noses having been duly completed with all present, we seated ourselves in a circle in the front of one of the hovels, and rested there half an hour. All the hovels have nearly the same form and dimensions, and all agree in being filthily dirty. They resemble a cowsheed with one end open, but having a partition a little way within, with a square hole in it, making a small gloomy chamber. In this the inhabitants keep all their property, and when the weather is cold they sleep there. They eat, however, and pass their time in the open part in front. My guides having finished their pipes, we continued our walk. The path led through the same undulating country, the whole uniformly clothed as before with fern. On our right hand we had a serpentine river, the banks of which were fringed with trees, and here and there on the hill sides there was a clump of wood. The whole scene, in spite of its green color, had rather a desolate aspect. The sight of so much fern impresses the mind with an idea of sterility, this, however, is not correct. For wherever the fern grows thick and breast-high, the land by tillage becomes productive. Some of the residents think that all this extensive open country originally was covered with forests, and that it has been cleared by fire. It is said, that by digging in the barest spots, lumps of the kind of resin which flows from the cowrie pine are frequently found. The natives had an evident motive in clearing the country. For the fern, formerly a staple article of food, flourishes only in the open cleared tracks. The almost entire absence of associated grasses, which forms so remarkable a feature in the vegetation of this island, may perhaps be accounted for by the land having been aboriginally covered with forest trees. The soil is volcanic, in several parts we passed over shaggy lavas, and craters could clearly be distinguished on several of the neighboring hills. Although the scenery is nowhere beautiful, and only occasionally pretty, I enjoyed my walk. I should have enjoyed it more, if my companion, the chief, had not possessed extraordinary conversational powers. I knew only three words, good, bad, and, yes, and with these I answered all his remarks, without of course having understood one word he said. This, however, was quite sufficient, I was a good listener, an agreeable person, and he never ceased talking to me. At length we reached Waimate. After having passed over so many miles of an uninhabited useless country, the sudden appearance of an English farmhouse, and its well-dressed fields, placed there as if by an enchanter's wand, was exceedingly pleasant. Mr. Williams not being at home, I received in Mr. Davies's house a cordial welcome. After drinking tea with his family party, we took a stroll about the farm. At Waimate there are three large houses, where the missionary gentlemen, Messrs. Williams, Davies, and Clark, reside, and near them are the huts of the native laborers. On an adjoining slope, fine crops of barley and wheat were standing in full ear, and in another part, fields of potatoes and clover. But I cannot attempt to describe all I saw. There were large gardens, with every fruit and vegetable which England produces, and many belonging to a warmer clime. I may instance asparagus, kidney beans, cucumbers, rhubarb, apples, pears, figs, peaches, apricots, grapes, olives, gooseberries, currants, hops, gorse for fences, and English oaks. Also many kinds of flowers. Around the farmyard there were stables, a thrashing barn with its winnowing machine, a blacksmith's forge. And on the ground plowshares and other tools, in the middle was that happy mixture of pigs and poultry, lying comfortably together, as in every English farmyard. At the distance of a few hundred yards, where the water of a little rill had been dammed up into a pool, there was a large and substantial water mill. All this is very surprising, when it is considered that five years ago nothing but the fern flourished here. Moreover, native workmanship, taught by the missionaries, has effected this change. The lesson of the missionary is the enchanter's wand. The house had been built, the windows framed, the fields ploughed, and even the trees grafted, by a New Zealander. At the mill, a New Zealander was seen powdered white with flour, like his brother Miller in England. 
When I looked at this whole scene, I thought it admirable. It was not merely that England was brought vividly before my mind. Yet, as the evening drew to a close, the domestic sounds, the fields of corn, the distant undulating country with its trees might well have been mistaken for our fatherland, nor was it the triumphant feeling at seeing what Englishmen could effect. But rather the high hopes thus inspired for the future progress of this fine island. Several young men, redeemed by the missionaries from slavery, were employed on the farm. They were dressed in a shirt, jacket, and trousers, and had a respectable appearance. Judging from one trifling anecdote, I should think they must be honest. When walking in the fields, a young laborer came up to Mr. Davies, and gave him a knife and gimlet, saying that he had found them on the road, and did not know to whom they belonged. These young men and boys appeared very merry and good-humored. In the evening I saw a party of them at cricket, when I thought of the austerity of which the missionaries have been accused. I was amused by observing one of their own sons taking an active part in the game. A more decided and pleasing change was manifested in the young women, who acted as servants within the houses. Their clean, tidy, and healthy appearance, like that of the dairymaids in England, formed a wonderful contrast with the women of the filthy hovels in Cororatica. The wives of the missionaries tried to persuade them not to be tattooed, but a famous operator having arrived from the south, they said, we really must just have a few lines on our lips. Else when we grow old, our lips will shrivel, and we shall be so very ugly. There is not nearly so much tattooing as formerly. But as it is a badge of distinction between the chief and the slave, it will probably long be practiced. So soon does any train of ideas become habitual, that the missionaries told me that even in their eyes a plain face looked mean, and not like that of a New Zealand gentleman. Late in the evening I went to Mr. Williams's house, where I passed the night. I found there a large party of children, collected together for Christmas Day, and all sitting round a table at tea. I never saw a nicer or more merry group, and to think that this was in the center of the land of cannibalism, murder, and all atrocious crimes. The cordiality and happiness so plainly pictured in the faces of the little circle, appeared equally felt by the older persons of the mission. December 24. In the morning, prayers were read in the native tongue to the whole family. After breakfast I rambled about the gardens and farm. This was a market day, when the natives of the surrounding hamlets bring their potatoes, Indian corn, or pigs, to exchange for blankets, tobacco, and sometimes. Through the persuasions of the missionaries, for soap. Mr. Davies's eldest son, who manages a farm of his own, is the man of business in the market. The children of the missionaries, who came while young to the island, understand the language better than their parents, and can get anything more readily done by the natives. A little before noon Messrs. Williams and Davies walked with me to a part of a neighboring forest, to show me the famous cowrie pine. I measured one of the noble trees, and found it thirty-one feet in circumference above the roots. There was another close by, which I did not see, thirty-three feet. And I heard of one no less than forty feet. These trees are remarkable for their smooth cylindrical boles, which run up to a height of sixty, and even ninety feet, with a nearly equal diameter, and without a single branch. The crown of branches at the summit is out of all proportion small to the trunk, and the leaves are likewise small compared with the branches. The forest was here almost composed of the cowrie. And the largest trees, from the parallelism of their sides, stood up like gigantic columns of wood. The timber of the cowrie is the most valuable production of the island. Moreover, a quantity of resin oozes from the bark, which is sold at a penny a pound to the Americans, but its use was then unknown. Some of the New Zealand forest must be impenetrable to an extraordinary degree. Mr. Matthews informed me that one forest only thirty-four miles in width, and separating two inhabited districts, had only lately, for the first time, been crossed. He and another missionary, each with a party of about fifty men, undertook to open a road, but it cost more than a fortnight's labor. In the woods I saw very few birds. With regard to animals, it is a most remarkable fact, 
that so large an island, extending over more than 700 miles in latitude, and in many parts 90 broad, with varied stations, a fine climate. And land of all heights, from 14,000 feet downwards, with the exception of a small rat, did not possess one indigenous animal. The several species of that gigantic genus of birds, the Dionornis seem here to have replaced mammiferous quadrupeds, in the same manner as the reptiles still do at the Galapagos archipelago. It is said that the common Norway rat, in the short space of two years, annihilated in this northern end of the island, the New Zealand species. In many places I noticed several sorts of weeds, which, like the rats, I was forced to own as countrymen. A leak has overrun whole districts, and will prove very troublesome, but it was imported as a favor by a French vessel. The common dock is also widely disseminated, and will, I fear, forever remain a proof of the rascality of an Englishman, who sold the seeds for those of the tobacco plant. On returning from our pleasant walk to the house, I dined with Mr. Williams, and then, a horse being lent me, I returned to the Bay of Islands. I took leave of the missionaries with thankfulness for their kind welcome, and with feelings of high respect for their gentlemanlike, useful, and upright characters. I think it would be difficult to find a body of men better adapted for the high office which they fulfill. Christmas Day In a few more days the fourth year of our absence from England will be completed. Our first Christmas Day was spent at Plymouth, the second at St. Martin's Cove, near Cape Horn. The third at Port Desire, in Patagonia, the fourth at Anchor in a wild harbor in the peninsula of Trace Montes, this fifth here, and the next, I trust in Providence, will be in England. We attended divine service in the chapel of Pahia, part of the service being read in English and part in the native language. Whilst at New Zealand we did not hear of any recent acts of cannibalism. But Mr. Stokes found burnt human bones strewed round a fireplace on a small island near the anchorage, but these remains of a comfortable banquet might have been lying there for several years. It is probable that the moral state of the people will rapidly improve. Mr. Bushby mentioned one pleasing anecdote as a proof of the sincerity of some, at least, of those who profess Christianity. One of his young men left him, who had been accustomed to read prayers to the rest of the servants. Some weeks afterwards, happening to pass late in the evening by an outhouse, he saw and heard one of his men reading the Bible with difficulty by the light of the fire, to the others. After this the party knelt and prayed, in their prayers they mentioned Mr. Bushby and his family, and the missionaries, each separately in his respective district. December 26 th, Mr. Bushby offered to take Mr. Sullivan and myself in his boat some miles up the river to Kawakawa, and proposed afterwards to walk on to the village of Wyomio, where there are some curious rocks. Following one of the arms of the bay, we enjoyed a pleasant row, and passed through pretty scenery, until we came to a village, beyond which the boat could not pass. From this place a chief and a party of men volunteered to walk with us to Wyomio, a distance of four miles. The chief was at this time rather notorious from having lately hung one of his wives and a slave for adultery. When one of the missionaries remonstrated with him he seemed surprised, and said he thought he was exactly following the English method. Old Shongi, who happened to be in England during the Queen's trial, expressed great disapprobation at the whole proceeding, he said he had five wives. And he would rather cut off all their heads than be so much troubled about one. Leaving this village, we crossed over to another, seated on a hillside at a little distance. The daughter of a chief, who was still a heathen, had died there five days before. The hovel in which she had expired had been burnt to the ground, her body being enclosed between two small canoes, was placed upright on the ground. And protected by an enclosure bearing wooden images of their gods, and the whole was painted bright red, so as to be conspicuous from afar. Her gown was fastened to the coffin, and her hair being cut off was cast at its foot. The relatives of the family had torn the flesh of their arms, bodies, and faces, so that they were covered with clotted blood, and the old women looked most filthy, disgusting objects. On the following day some of the officers visited this place, and found the women still howling and cutting themselves. We continued our walk, and soon reached Wyomio. 
Here there are some singular masses of limestone, resembling ruined castles. These rocks have long served for burial places, and in consequence are held too sacred to be approached. One of the young men, however, cried out, Let us all be brave, and ran on ahead, but when within a hundred yards, the whole party thought better of it and stopped short. With perfect indifference, however, they allowed us to examine the whole place. At this village we rested some hours, during which time there was a long discussion with Mr. Bushby, concerning the right of sale of certain lands. One old man, who appeared a perfect genealogist, illustrated the successive possessors by bits of stick driven into the ground. Before leaving the houses a little basketful of roasted sweet potatoes was given to each of our party, and we all, according to the custom, carried them away to eat on the road. I noticed that among the women employed in cooking, there was a manslave, it must be a humiliating thing for a man in this warlike country to be employed in doing that which is considered as the lowest woman's work. Slaves are not allowed to go to war, but this perhaps can hardly be considered as a hardship. I heard of one poor wretch who, during hostilities, ran away to the opposite party. Being met by two men, he was immediately seized. But as they could not agree to whom he should belong, each stood over him with a stone hatchet, and seemed determined that the other at least should not take him away alive. The poor man, almost dead with fright, was only saved by the address of a chief's wife. We afterwards enjoyed a pleasant walk back to the boat, but did not reach the ship till late in the evening. December 30th, in the afternoon we stood out of the Bay of Islands, on our course to Sydney. I believe we were all glad to leave New Zealand. It is not a pleasant place. Amongst the natives there is absent that charming simplicity which is found in Tahiti, and the greater part of the English are the very refuse of society. Neither is the country itself attractive. I look back but to one bright spot, and that is why mate, with its Christian inhabitants. Chapter 19 Australia Sydney, excursion to Bathurst, aspect of the woods, party of natives, gradual extinction of the aborigines, infection generated by associated men in health, blue mountains, view of the grand gulf-like valleys, their origin and formation, Bathurst. General civility of the lower orders, state of society, Van Diemen's Land, Hobart Town, aborigines all banished, Mount Wellington, King George's Sound, cheerless aspect of the country, bald head. Calcareous casts of branches of trees, party of natives, leave Australia. January 12, 1836, early in the morning a light air carried us towards the entrance of Port Jackson. Instead of beholding a verdant country, interspersed with fine houses, a straight line of yellowish cliff brought to our minds the coast of Patagonia. A solitary lighthouse, built of white stone, alone told us that we were near a great and populous city. Having entered the harbor, it appears fine and spacious, with cliff-formed shores of horizontally stratified sandstone. The nearly level country is covered with thin scrubby trees, bespeaking the curse of sterility. Proceeding further inland, the country improves, beautiful villas and nice cottages are here and they're scattered along the beach. In the distant stone houses, two and three stories high, and windmills standing on the edge of a bank, pointed out to us the neighborhood of the capital of Australia. At last we anchored within Sydney Cove. We found the little basin occupied by many large ships, and surrounded by warehouses. In the evening I walked through the town, and returned full of admiration at the whole scene. It is a most magnificent testimony to the power of the British nation. Here, in a less promising country, scores of years have done many more times more than an equal number of centuries have effected in South America. My first feeling was to congratulate myself that I was born an Englishman. Upon seeing more of the town afterwards, perhaps my admiration fell a little, but yet it is a fine town. The streets are regular, broad, clean, and kept in excellent order, the houses are of a good size, and the shops well furnished. It may be faithfully compared to the large suburbs which stretch out from London and a few other great towns in England. But not even near London or Birmingham is there an appearance of such rapid growth. 
The number of large houses and other buildings just finished was truly surprising. Nevertheless, everyone complained of the high rents and difficulty in procuring a house. Coming from South America, where in the towns every man of property is known, no one thing surprised me more than not being able to ascertain at once to whom this or that carriage belonged. I hired a man and two horses to take me to Bathurst, a village about 120 miles in the interior, and the center of a great pastoral district. By this means I hoped to gain a general idea of the appearance of the country. On the morning of the 16th, January, I set out on my excursion. The first stage took us to Parramatta, a small country town, next to Sydney in importance. The roads were excellent, and made upon the Macadam principle, windstone having been brought for the purpose from the distance of several miles. In all respects there was a close resemblance to England, perhaps the alehouses here were more numerous. The iron gangs, or parties of convicts who have committed here some offense, appeared the least like England, they were working in chains, under the charge of sentries with loaded arms. The power which the government possesses, by means of forced labor, of at once opening good roads throughout the country, has been, I believe, one main cause of the early prosperity of this colony. I slept at night at a very comfortable inn at Emu Ferry, thirty-five miles from Sydney, and near the ascent of the Blue Mountains. This line of road is the most frequented, and has been the longest inhabited of any in the colony. The whole land is enclosed with high railings, for the farmers have not succeeded in rearing hedges. There are many substantial houses and good cottages scattered about, but although considerable pieces of land are under cultivation, the greater part yet remains as when first discovered. The extreme uniformity of the vegetation is the most remarkable feature in the landscape of the greater part of New South Wales. Everywhere we have an open woodland, the ground being partially covered with a very thin pasture, with little appearance of verdure. The trees nearly all belong to one family, and mostly have their leaves placed in a vertical, instead of as in Europe, in a nearly horizontal position, the foliage is scanty. And of a peculiar pale green tint, without any gloss. Hence the woods appear light and shadowless, this, although a loss of comfort to the traveller under the scorching rays of summer, is of importance to the farmer. As it allows grass to grow where it otherwise would not. The leaves are not shed periodically, this character appears common to the entire southern hemisphere, namely, South America, Australia, and the Cape of Good Hope. The inhabitants of this hemisphere, and of the intertropical regions, thus lose perhaps one of the most glorious, though to our eyes common. Spectacles in the world, the first bursting into full foliage of the leafless tree. They may, however, say that we pay dearly for this by having the land covered with mere naked skeletons for so many months. This is too true but our senses thus acquire a keen relish for the exquisite green of the spring, which the eyes of those living within the tropics. Sated during the long year with the gorgeous productions of those glowing climates, can never experience. The greater number of the trees, with the exception of some of the blue gums, do not attain a large size, but they grow tall and tolerably straight, and stand well apart. The bark of some of the eucalypti falls annually, or hangs dead in long shreds which swing about with the wind, and give to the woods a desolate and untidy appearance. I cannot imagine a more complete contrast, in every respect, than between the forests of Valdivia or Chiloé, and the woods of Australia. At sunset, a party of a score of the black aborigines passed by, each carrying, in their accustomed manner, a bundle of spears and other weapons. By giving a leading young man a shilling, they were easily detained, and threw their spears for my amusement. They were all partly clothed, and several could speak a little English, their countenances were good-humoured and pleasant. And they appeared far from being such utterly degraded beings as they have usually been represented. In their own arts they are admirable. A cap being fixed at thirty yards' distance, they transfixed it with a spear, delivered by the throwing stick with the rapidity of an arrow from the bow of a practiced archer. In tracking animals or men they show most wonderful sagacity, and I heard of several of their remarks which manifested considerable acuteness. They will not, however, cultivate the ground, 
or build houses and remain stationary, or even take the trouble of tending a flock of sheep when given to them. On the whole they appear to me to stand some few degrees higher in the scale of civilization than the Fuegians. It is very curious thus to see in the midst of a civilized people, a set of harmless savages wandering about without knowing where they shall sleep at night, and gaining their livelihood by hunting in the woods. As the white man has traveled onwards, he has spread over the country belonging to several tribes. These, although thus enclosed by one common people, keep up their ancient distinctions, and sometimes go to war with each other. In an engagement which took place lately, the two parties most singularly chose the center of the village of Bathurst for the field of battle. This was of service to the defeated side, for the runaway warriors took refuge in the barracks. The number of aborigines is rapidly decreasing. In my whole ride, with the exception of some boys brought up by Englishmen, I saw only one other party. This decrease, no doubt, must be partly owing to the introduction of spirits, to European diseases, even the milder ones of which, such as the measles, 157 prove very destructive, and to the gradual extinction of the wild animals. It is said that numbers of their children invariably perish in very early infancy from the effects of their wandering life. And as the difficulty of procuring food increases, so must their wandering habits increase. And hence the population, without any apparent deaths from famine, is repressed in a manner extremely sudden compared to what happens in civilized countries, where the father, though in adding to his labor he may injure himself, does not destroy his offspring. Besides the several evident causes of destruction, there appears to be some more mysterious agency generally at work. Wherever the European has trod, death seems to pursue the aboriginal. We may look to the wide extent of the Americas, Polynesia, the Cape of Good Hope, and Australia, and we find the same result. Nor is it the white man alone that thus acts the destroyer. The Polynesian of Malay extraction has in parts of the East Indian archipelago, thus driven before him the dark-colored native. The varieties of man seem to act on each other in the same way as different species of animals, the stronger always extirpating the weaker. It was melancholy at New Zealand to hear the fine energetic natives saying that they knew the land was doomed to pass from their children. Everyone has heard of the inexplicable reduction of the population in the beautiful and healthy island of Tahiti since the date of Captain Cook's voyages, although in that case we might have expected that it would have been increased. For infanticide, which formerly prevailed to so extraordinary a degree, has ceased, profligacy has greatly diminished, and the murderous wars become less frequent. The Rev. J. Williams, in his interesting work 158 says, that the first intercourse between natives and Europeans, is invariably attended with the introduction of fever, dysentery, or some other disease. Which carries off numbers of the people. Again he affirms, it is certainly a fact, which cannot be controverted, that most of the diseases which have raged in the islands during my residence there, have been introduced by ships. 159 And what renders this fact remarkable is, that there might be no appearance of disease among the crew of the ship which conveyed this destructive importation. This statement is not quite so extraordinary as it at first appears. For several cases are on record of the most malignant fevers having broken out, although the parties themselves, who were the cause, were not affected. In the early part of the reign of George III, a prisoner who had been confined in a dungeon, was taken in a coach with four constables before a magistrate. And although the man himself was not ill, the four constables died from a short putrid fever, but the contagion extended to no others. From these facts it would almost appear as if the effluvium of one set of men shut up for some time together was poisonous when inhaled by others. And possibly more so, if the men be of different races. Mysterious as this circumstance appears to be, it is not more surprising than that the body of one's fellow creature, directly after death, and before putrefaction has commenced, should often be of so deleterious a quality, that the mere puncture from an instrument used in its dissection, should prove fatal. 17 th, early in the morning we passed the Nepean in a ferryboat. The river, although at this spot both broad and deep, had a very small body of running water. 
Having crossed a low piece of land on the opposite side, we reached the slope of the Blue Mountains. The ascent is not steep, the road having been cut with much care on the side of a sandstone cliff. On the summit an almost level plain extends, which, rising imperceptibly to the westward, at last attains a height of more than 3,000 feet. From so grand a title as Blue Mountains, and from their absolute altitude, I expected to have seen a bold chain of mountains crossing the country. But instead of this, a sloping plain presents merely an inconsiderable front to the low land near the coast. From this first slope, the view of the extensive woodland to the east was striking, and the surrounding trees grew bold and lofty. But when once on the sandstone platform, the scenery becomes exceedingly monotonous, each side of the road is bordered by scrubby trees of the never-failing eucalyptus family. And with the exception of two or three small inns, there are no houses or cultivated land, the road, moreover, is solitary. The most frequent object being a bullock wagon, piled up with bales of wool. In the middle of the day we baited our horses at a little inn, called the Weatherboard. The country here is elevated 2,800 feet above the sea. About a mile and a half from this place there is a view exceedingly well worth visiting. Following down a little valley and its tiny rill of water, an immense gulf unexpectedly opens through the trees which border the pathway, at the depth of perhaps 1,500 feet. Walking on a few yards, one stands on the brink of a vast precipice, and below one sees a grand bay or gulf, for I know not what other name to give it, thickly covered with forest. The point of view is situated as if at the head of a bay, the line of cliff diverging on each side, and showing headland behind headland, as on a bold seacoast. These cliffs are composed of horizontal strata of whitish sandstone, and are so absolutely vertical, that in many places a person standing on the edge and throwing down a stone, can see it strike the trees in the abyss below. So unbroken is the line of cliff, that in order to reach the foot of the waterfall, formed by this little stream, it is said to be necessary to go sixteen miles round. About five miles distant in front, another line of cliff extends, which thus appears completely to encircle the valley. And hence the name of bay is justified, as applied to this grand amphitheatrical depression. If we imagine a winding harbor, with its deep water surrounded by bold cliff-like shores, to be laid dry, and a forest to spring up on its sandy bottom. We should then have the appearance and structure here exhibited. This kind of view was to me quite novel, and extremely magnificent. In the evening we reached the Blackheath. The sandstone plateau has here attained the height of 3,400 feet. And is covered, as before, with the same scrubby woods. From the road, there were occasional glimpses into a profound valley, of the same character as the one described. But from the steepness and depth of its sides, the bottom was scarcely ever to be seen. The Blackheath is a very comfortable inn, kept by an old soldier. And it reminded me of the small inns in North Wales. 18th, very early in the morning, I walked about three miles to see Govett's Leap. A view of a similar character with that near the weatherboard, but perhaps even more stupendous. So early in the day the gulf was filled with a thin blue haze, which, although destroying the general effect of the view added to the apparent depth at which the forest was stretched out beneath our feet. These valleys, which so long presented an insuperable barrier to the attempts of the most enterprising of the colonists to reach the interior, are most remarkable. Great arm-like bays, expanding at their upper ends, often branch from the main valleys and penetrate the sandstone platform. On the other hand, the platform often sends promontories into the valleys, and even leaves in them great, almost insulated, masses. To descend into some of these valleys, it is necessary to go round twenty miles. And into others, the surveyors have only lately penetrated, and the colonists have not yet been able to drive in their cattle. But the most remarkable feature in their structure is, that although several miles wide at their heads, they generally contract towards their mouths to such a degree as to become impassable. The Surveyor General, Sir T. Mitchell, 160 endeavoured in vain, first walking and then by crawling between the great fallen fragments of sandstone, 
to ascend through the gorge by which the river grows joins the Nepean. Yet the valley of the grows in its upper part, as I saw, forms a magnificent level basin some miles in width, and is on all sides surrounded by cliffs. The summits of which are believed to be nowhere less than 3,000 feet above the level of the sea. When cattle are driven into the valley of the Wulgan by a path, which I descended, partly natural and partly made by the owner of the land, they cannot escape. For this valley is in every other part surrounded by perpendicular cliffs, and eight miles lower down, it contracts from an average width of half a mile, to a mere chasm, impassable to man or beast. Sir T. Mitchell states that the great valley of the Cox River with all its branches, contracts, where it unites with the Nepean, into a gorge 2,200 yards in width, and about 1,000 feet in depth. Other similar cases might have been added. The first impression, on seeing the correspondence of the horizontal strata on each side of these valleys and great amphitheatrical depressions, is that they have been hollowed out. Like other valleys, by the action of water. But when one reflects on the enormous amount of stone, which on this view must have been removed through mere gorges or chasms, one is led to ask whether these spaces may not have subsided. But considering the form of the irregularly branching valleys, and of the narrow promontories projecting into them from the platforms, we are compelled to abandon this notion. To attribute these hollows to the present alluvial action would be preposterous. Nor does the drainage from the summit level always fall, as I remarked near the weatherboard, into the head of these valleys, but into one side of their bay-like recesses. Some of the inhabitants remarked to me that they never viewed one of those bay-like recesses, with the headlands receding on both hands. Without being struck with their resemblance to a bold seacoast. This is certainly the case. Moreover, on the present coast of New South Wales, the numerous, fine, widely branching harbours, which are generally connected with the sea by a narrow mouth worn through the sandstone coast cliffs, varying from one mile in width to a quarter of a mile, present a likeness, though on a miniature scale, to the great valleys of the interior. But then immediately occurs the startling difficulty, why has the sea worn out these great, though circumscribed depressions on a wide platform, and left mere gorges at the openings? Through which the whole vast amount of triturated matter must have been carried away. The only light I can throw upon this enigma, is by remarking that banks of the most irregular forms appear to be now forming in some seas, as in parts of the West Indies and in the Red Sea. And that their sides are exceedingly steep. Such banks, I have been led to suppose, have been formed by sediment heaped by strong currents on an irregular bottom. That in some cases the sea, instead of spreading out sediment in a uniform sheet, heaps it round submarine rocks and islands, it is hardly possible to doubt. After examining the charts of the West Indies. And that the waves have power to form high and precipitous cliffs, even in landlocked harbors, I have noticed in many parts of South America. To apply these ideas to the sandstone platforms of New South Wales, I imagine that the strata were heaped by the action of strong currents, and of the undulations of an open sea. On an irregular bottom. And that the valley-like spaces thus left unfilled had their steeply sloping flanks worn into cliffs, during a slow elevation of the land. The worn-down sandstone being removed, either at the time when the narrow gorges were cut by the retreating sea, or subsequently by alluvial action. Soon after leaving the Blackheath, we descended from the sandstone platform by the pass of Mount Victoria. To effect this pass, an enormous quantity of stone has been cut through. The design, and its manner of execution, being worthy of any line of road in England. We now entered upon a country less elevated by nearly a thousand feet, and consisting of granite. With the change of rock, the vegetation improved, the trees were both finer and stood farther apart, and the pasture between them was a little greener and more plentiful. At Hassan's walls, I left the high road, and made a short detour to a farm called Wallerwang, to the superintendent of which I had a letter of introduction from the owner in Sydney. Mr. Brown had the kindness to ask me to stay the ensuing day, which I had much pleasure in doing. This place offers an example of one of the large farming, or rather sheep-grazing establishments of the colony. Cattle and horses are, however, 
in this case rather more numerous than usual, owing to some of the valleys being swampy and producing a coarser pasture. Two or three flat pieces of ground near the house were cleared and cultivated with corn, which the harvest men were now reaping, but no more wheat is sown than sufficient for the annual support of the laborers employed on the establishment. The usual number of assigned convict servants here is about forty, but at the present time there were rather more. Although the farm was well stocked with every necessary, there was an apparent absence of comfort, and not one single woman resided here. The sunset of a fine day will generally cast an air of happy contentment on any scene. But here, at this retired farmhouse, the brightest tints on the surrounding woods could not make me forget that forty hardened, profligate men were ceasing from their daily labors. Like the slaves from Africa, yet without their holy claim for compassion. Early on the next morning, Mr. Archer, the joint superintendent, had the kindness to take me out kangaroo hunting. We continued riding the greater part of the day, but had very bad sport, not seeing a kangaroo or even a wild dog. The greyhounds pursued a kangaroo rat into a hollow tree, out of which we dragged it, it is an animal as large as a rabbit, but with the figure of a kangaroo. A few years since this country abounded with wild animals, but now the emu is banished to a long distance, and the kangaroo is become scarce. To both the English greyhound has been highly destructive. It may be long before these animals are altogether exterminated, but their doom is fixed. The aborigines are always anxious to borrow the dogs from the farmhouses, the use of them, the offal when an animal is killed, and some milk from the cows, are the peace offerings of the settlers. Who push farther and farther towards the interior. The thoughtless aboriginal, blinded by these trifling advantages, is delighted at the approach of the white man, who seems predestined to inherit the country of his children. Although having poor sport, we enjoyed a pleasant ride. The woodland is generally so open that a person on horseback can gallop through it. It is traversed by a few flat-bottomed valleys, which are green and free from trees, in such spots the scenery was pretty like that of a park. In the whole country I scarcely saw a place without the marks of a fire. Whether these had been more or less recent, whether the stumps were more or less black, was the greatest change which varied the uniformity, so wearisome to the traveller's eye. In these woods there are not many birds, I saw, however, some large flocks of the white cockatoo feeding in a cornfield, and a few most beautiful parrots. Crows, like our jackdaws were not uncommon, and another bird something like the magpie. In the dusk of the evening I took a stroll along a chain of ponds, which in this dry country represented the course of a river, and had the good fortune to see several of the famous Ornithorhynchus paradoxus. They were diving and playing about the surface of the water, but showed so little of their bodies, that they might easily have been mistaken for water rats. Mr. Brown shot one, certainly it is a most extraordinary animal, a stuffed specimen does not at all give a good idea of the appearance of the head and beak when fresh. The latter becoming hard and contracted. Point one sixty one. Twenty th, a long day's ride to Bathurst. Before joining the high road we followed a mere path through the forest. And the country, with the exception of a few squatters' huts, was very solitary. We experienced this day the Sirocco-like wind of Australia, which comes from the parched deserts of the interior. Clouds of dust were traveling in every direction, and the wind felt as if it had passed over a fire. I afterwards heard that the thermometer out of doors had stood at 119 degrees, and in a closed room at 96 degrees. In the afternoon we came in view of the downs of Bathurst. These undulating but nearly smooth plains are very remarkable in this country, from being absolutely destitute of trees. They support only a thin brown pasture. We rode some miles over this country, and then reached the township of Bathurst, seated in the middle of what may be called either a very broad valley, or narrow plain. I was told at Sydney not to form too bad an opinion of Australia by judging of the country from the roadside, nor too good a one from Bathurst. In this latter respect, I did not feel myself in the least danger of being prejudiced. The season, it must be owned, had been one of great drought, and the country did not wear a favorable aspect. 
although I understand it was incomparably worse two or three months before. The secret of the rapidly growing prosperity of Bathurst is, that the brown pasture which appears to the strangers I so wretched, is excellent for sheep grazing. The town stands, at the height of 2,200 feet above the sea, on the banks of the Macquarie. This is one of the rivers flowing into the vast and scarcely known interior. The line of watershed, which divides the inland streams from those on the coast, has a height of about 3,000 feet, and runs in a north and south direction at the distance of from 80 to 100 miles from the seaside. The Macquarie figures in the map as a respectable river, and it is the largest of those draining this part of the watershed. Yet to my surprise I found it a mere chain of ponds, separated from each other by spaces almost dry. Generally a small stream is running, and sometimes there are high and impetuous floods. Scanty as the supply of the water is throughout this district, it becomes still scantier further inland. 22nd. I commenced my return, and followed a new road called Lockyer's Line, along which the country is rather more hilly and picturesque. This was a long day's ride. And the house where I wished to sleep was some way off the road, and not easily found. I met on this occasion, and indeed on all others, a very general and ready civility among the lower orders, which, when one considers what they are, and what they have been, would scarcely have been expected. The farm where I passed the night, was owned by two young men who had only lately come out, and were beginning a settler's life. The total want of almost every comfort was not attractive. But future and certain prosperity was before their eyes, and that not far distant. The next day we passed through large tracts of country in flames, volumes of smoke sweeping across the road. Before noon we joined our former road, and ascended Mount Victoria. I slept at the weatherboard, and before dark took another walk to the amphitheatre. On the road to Sydney I spent a very pleasant evening with Captain King at Dunhevd, and thus ended my little excursion in the colony of New South Wales. Before arriving here the three things which interested me most were, the state of society amongst the higher classes, the condition of the convicts, and the degree of attraction sufficient to induce persons to emigrate. Of course, after so very short a visit, one's opinion is worth scarcely anything, but it is as difficult not to form some opinion, as it is to form a correct judgment. On the whole, from what I heard, more than from what I saw, I was disappointed in the state of society. The whole community is rancorously divided into parties on almost every subject. Among those who, from their station in life, ought to be the best, many live in such open profligacy that respectable people cannot associate with them. There is much jealousy between the children of the rich emancipist and the free settlers, the former being pleased to consider honest men as interlopers. The whole population, poor and rich, are bent on acquiring wealth, amongst the higher orders, wool and sheep grazing form the constant subject of conversation. There are many serious drawbacks to the comforts of a family, the chief of which, perhaps, is being surrounded by convict servants. How thoroughly odious to every feeling, to be waited on by a man who the day before, perhaps, was flogged, from your representation, for some trifling misdemeanor. The female servants are of course, much worse, hence children learn the vilest expressions, and it is fortunate, if not equally vile ideas. On the other hand, the capital of a person, without any trouble on his part, produces him treble interest to what it will in England, and with care he is sure to grow rich. The luxuries of life are in abundance, and very little dearer than in England, and most articles of food are cheaper. The climate is splendid, and perfectly healthy. But to my mind its charms are lost by the uninviting aspect of the country. Settlers possess a great advantage in finding their sons of service when very young. At the age of from sixteen to twenty, they frequently take charge of distant farming stations. This, however, must happen at the expense of their boys associating entirely with convict servants. I am not aware that the tone of society has assumed any peculiar character, but with such habits, and without intellectual pursuits, it can hardly fail to deteriorate. My opinion is such, 
that nothing but rather sharp necessity should compel me to emigrate. The rapid prosperity and future prospects of this colony are to me, not understanding these subjects, very puzzling. The two main exports are wool and whale oil, and to both of these productions there is a limit. The country is totally unfit for canals, therefore there is a not very distant point, beyond which the land carriage of wool will not repay the expense of shearing and tending sheep. Pasture everywhere is so thin that settlers have already pushed far into the interior, moreover, the country further inland becomes extremely poor. Agriculture, on account of the droughts, can never succeed on an extended scale, therefore, so far as I can see. Australia must ultimately depend upon being the centre of commerce for the Southern Hemisphere, and perhaps on her future manufactories. Possessing coal, she always has the moving power at hand. From the habitable country extending along the coast, and from her English extraction, she is sure to be a maritime nation. I formerly imagined that Australia would rise to be as grand and powerful a country as North America but now it appears to me that such future grandeur is rather problematical. With respect to the state of the convicts, I had still fewer opportunities of judging than on other points. The first question is, whether their condition is at all one of punishment, no one will maintain that it is a very severe one. This, however, I suppose, is of little consequence as long as it continues to be an object of dread to criminals at home. The corporeal wants of the convicts are tolerably well supplied, their prospect of future liberty and comfort is not distant, and, after good conduct, certain. A ticket of leave, which, as long as a man keeps clear of suspicion as well as of crime, makes him free within a certain district, is given upon good conduct. After years proportional to the length of the sentence. Yet with all this, and overlooking the previous imprisonment and wretched passage out, I believe the years of assignment are passed away with discontent and unhappiness. As an intelligent man remarked to me, the convicts know no pleasure beyond sensuality, and in this they are not gratified. The enormous bribe which government possesses in offering free pardons, together with the deep horror of the secluded penal settlements, destroys confidence between the convicts. And so prevents crime. As to a sense of shame, such a feeling does not appear to be known, and of this I witnessed some very singular proofs. Though it is a curious fact, I was universally told that the character of the convict population is one of errant cowardice, not unfrequently some become desperate and quite indifferent as to life. Yet a plan requiring cool or continued courage is seldom put into execution. The worst feature in the whole case is, that although there exists what may be called a legal reform, and comparatively little is committed which the law can touch. Yet that any moral reform should take place appears to be quite out of the question. I was assured by well-informed people, that a man who should try to improve, could not while living with other assigned servants, his life would be one of intolerable misery and persecution. Nor must the contamination of the convict ships and prisons, both here and in England, be forgotten. On the whole, as a place of punishment, the object is scarcely gained. As a real system of reform it has failed, as perhaps would every other plan. But as a means of making men outwardly honest, of converting vagabonds, most useless in one hemisphere, into active citizens of another. And thus giving birth to a new and splendid country, a grand center of civilization, it has succeeded to a degree perhaps unparalleled in history. 30 th the Beagle sailed for Hobart Town in Van Diemen's Land. On the 5th of February, after a six days' passage, of which the first part was fine, and the latter very cold and squally, we entered the mouth of Storm Bay, the weather justified this awful name. The bay should rather be called an estuary, for it receives at its head the waters of the Derwent. Near the mouth, there are some extensive basaltic platforms. But higher up the land becomes mountainous, and is covered by a light wood. The lower parts of the hills which skirt the bay are cleared. And the bright yellow fields of corn, and dark green ones of potatoes, appear very luxuriant. Late in the evening we anchored in the snug cove, on the shores of which stands the capital of Tasmania. The first aspect of the place was very inferior to that of Sydney, the latter might be called a city, 
this is only a town. It stands at the base of Mount Wellington, a mountain 3,100 feet high, but of little picturesque beauty, from this source, however, it receives a good supply of water. Round the cove there are some fine warehouses and on one side a small fort. Coming from the Spanish settlements, where such magnificent care has generally been paid to the fortifications, the means of defense in these colonies appeared very contemptible. Comparing the town with Sydney, I was chiefly struck with the comparative fewness of the large houses, either built or building. Hobart Town, from the census of 1835, contained 13,826 inhabitants, and the whole of Tasmania 36,505. All the Aborigines have been removed to an island in Bass's Straits, so that Van Diemen's land enjoys the great advantage of being free from a native population. This most cruel step seems to have been quite unavoidable, as the only means of stopping a fearful succession of robberies, burnings, and murders, committed by the blacks and which sooner or later would have ended in their utter destruction. I fear there is no doubt, that this train of evil and its consequences, originated in the infamous conduct of some of our countrymen. Thirty years is a short period, in which to have banished the last aboriginal from his native island, and that island nearly as large as Ireland. The correspondence on this subject, which took place between the government at home and that of Van Diemen's land, is very interesting. Although numbers of natives were shot and taken prisoners in the skirmishing, which was going on at intervals for several years. Nothing seems fully to have impressed them with the idea of our overwhelming power, until the whole island, in 1830, was put under martial law. And by proclamation the whole population commanded to assist in one great attempt to secure the entire race. The plan adopted was nearly similar to that of the great hunting matches in India a line was formed reaching across the island. With the intention of driving the natives into a cul-de-sac on Tasman's peninsula. The attempt failed, the natives, having tied up their dogs, stole during one night through the lines. This is far from surprising, when their practiced senses, and usual manner of crawling after wild animals is considered. I have been assured that they can conceal themselves on almost bare ground, in a manner which until witnessed is scarcely credible. Their dusky bodies being easily mistaken for the blackened stumps which are scattered all over the country. I was told of a trial between a party of Englishmen and a native, who was to stand in full view on the side of a bare hill. If the Englishmen closed their eyes for less than a minute, he would squat down, and then they were never able to distinguish him from the surrounding stumps. But to return to the hunting match. The natives understanding this kind of warfare, were terribly alarmed, for they at once perceived the power and numbers of the whites. Shortly afterwards a party of thirteen belonging to two tribes came in, and, conscious of their unprotected condition, delivered themselves up in despair. Subsequently by the intrepid exertions of Mr. Robinson, an active and benevolent man, who fearlessly visited by himself the most hostile of the natives, the whole were induced to act in a similar manner. They were then removed to an island, where food and clothes were provided them. Count Sturzeletsky states 162 that, at the epoch of their deportation in 1835, the number of natives amounted to 210. In 1842, that is, after the interval of seven years, they mustered only 54 individuals. And, while each family of the interior of New South Wales, uncontaminated by contact with the whites, swarms with children. Those of Flinders Island had during eight years an accession of only fourteen in number. The Beagle stayed here ten days, and in this time I made several pleasant little excursions, chiefly with the object of examining the geological structure of the immediate neighborhood. The main points of interest consist, first in some highly fossiliferous strata, belonging to the Devonian or Carboniferous period. Secondly, in proofs of a late small rise of the land. And lastly, in a solitary and superficial patch of yellowish limestone or travertine, which contains numerous impressions of leaves of trees, together with land shells, not now existing. It is not improbable that this one small quarry includes the only remaining record of the vegetation of Van Diemen's land during one former epoch. 
The climate here is damper than in New South Wales, and hence the land is more fertile. Agriculture flourishes. The cultivated fields look well, and the gardens abound with thriving vegetables and fruit trees. Some of the farmhouses, situated in retired spots, had a very attractive appearance. The general aspect of the vegetation is similar to that of Australia, perhaps it is a little more green and cheerful, and the pasture between the trees rather more abundant. One day I took a long walk on the side of the bay opposite to the town, I crossed in a steamboat, two of which are constantly plying backwards and forwards. The machinery of one of these vessels was entirely manufactured in this colony, which, from its very foundation, then numbered only three and thirty years. Another day I ascended Mount Wellington. I took with me a guide, for I failed in a first attempt, from the thickness of the wood. Our guide, however, was a stupid fellow, and conducted us to the southern and damp side of the mountain, where the vegetation was very luxuriant. And where the labor of the ascent, from the number of rotten trunks, was almost as great as on a mountain in Tierra del Fuego or in Chile Way. It cost us five and a half hours of hard climbing before we reached the summit. In many parts the eucalypti grew to a great size, and composed a noble forest. In some of the dampest ravines, tree ferns flourished in an extraordinary manner. I saw one which must have been at least twenty feet high to the base of the fronds, and was in girth exactly six feet. The fronds forming the most elegant parasols, produced a gloomy shade, like that of the first hour of the night. The summit of the mountain is broad and flat, and is composed of huge angular masses of naked greenstone. Its elevation is 3,100 feet above the level of the sea. The day was splendidly clear, and we enjoyed a most extensive view. To the north, the country appeared a mass of wooded mountains, of about the same height with that on which we were standing, and with an equally tame outline, to the south the broken land and water. Forming many intricate bays, was mapped with clearness before us. After staying some hours on the summit, we found a better way to descend, but did not reach the beagle till eight o'clock, after a severe day's work. February 7. The beagle sailed from Tasmania, and, on the sixth of the ensuing month, reached King George's Sound, situated close to the S. W. corner of Australia. We stayed there eight days. And we did not during our voyage pass a more dull and uninteresting time. The country, viewed from an eminence, appears a woody plain, with here and there rounded and partly bare hills of granite protruding. One day I went out with a party, in hopes of seeing a kangaroo hunt, and walked over a good many miles of country. Everywhere we found the soil sandy, and very poor. It supported either a coarse vegetation of thin, low brushwood and wiry grass, or a forest of stunted trees. The scenery resembled that of the high sandstone platform of the Blue Mountains. The casuarina, a tree somewhat resembling a scotch fir, is, however, here in greater number, and the eucalyptus in rather less. In the open parts there were many grass trees, a plant which, in appearance, has some affinity with the palm. But, instead of being surmounted by a crown of noble fronds, it can boast merely of a tuft of very coarse grass-like leaves. The general bright green color of the brushwood and other plants, viewed from a distance, seemed to promise fertility. A single walk, however, was enough to dispel such an illusion. And he who thinks with me will never wish to walk again in so uninviting a country. One day I accompanied Captain Fitz Roy to Bald Head. The place mentioned by so many navigators, where some imagined that they saw corals, and others that they saw petrified trees, standing in the position in which they had grown. According to our view, the beds have been formed by the wind having heaped up fine sand, composed of minute rounded particles of shells and corals, during which process branches and roots of trees, together with many land shells, became enclosed. The whole then became consolidated by the percolation of calcareous matter and the cylindrical cavities left by the decaying of the wood, were thus also filled up with a hard pseudostalactical stone. The weather is now wearing away the softer parts, and in consequence the hard casts of the roots and branches of the trees project above the surface, and, in a singularly deceptive manner. 
resemble the stumps of a dead thicket. A large tribe of natives, called the White Cockatoo Men happened to pay the settlement a visit while we were there. These men, as well as those of the tribe belonging to King George's Sound, being tempted by the offer of some tubs of rice and sugar, were persuaded to hold up corroboree or great dancing party. As soon as it grew dark, small fires were lighted, and the men commenced their toilet, which consisted in painting themselves white in spots and lines. As soon as all was ready, large fires were kept blazing, round which the women and children were collected as spectators. The cockatoo and King George's men formed two distinct parties, and generally danced in answer to each other. The dancing consisted in their running either sideways or in Indian file into an open space, and stamping the ground with great force as they marched together. Their heavy footsteps were accompanied by a kind of grunt, by beating their clubs and spears together, and by various other gesticulations, such as extending their arms and wriggling their bodies. It was a most rude, barbarous scene, and, to our ideas, without any sort of meaning, but we observed that the black women and children watched it with the greatest pleasure. Perhaps these dances originally represented actions, such as wars and victories, there was one called the emu dance, in which each man extended his arm in a bent manner, like the neck of that bird. In another dance, one man imitated the movements of a kangaroo grazing in the woods, whilst a second crawled up and pretended to spear him. When both tribes mingled in the dance, the ground trembled with the heaviness of their steps, and the air resounded with their wild cries. Everyone appeared in high spirits, and the group of nearly naked figures, viewed by the light of the blazing fires, all moving in hideous harmony, formed a perfect display of a festival amongst the lowest barbarians. In Tierra del Fuego, we have beheld many curious scenes in savage life, but never, I think, one where the natives were in such high spirits, and so perfectly at their ease. After the dancing was over, the whole party formed a great circle on the ground, and the boiled rice and sugar was distributed, to the delight of all. After several tedious delays from clouded weather, on the 14th of March, we gladly stood out of King George's Sound on our course to Keeling Island. Farewell, Australia. You are a rising child, and doubtless some day will reign a great princess in the South, but you are too great and ambitious for affection, yet not great enough for respect. I leave your shores without sorrow or regret. Chapter 20 Keeling Island, Coral Formations Keeling Island, Singular Appearance, Scanty Flora, Transport of Seeds, Birds and Insects, Ebbing and Flowing Springs, Fields of Dead Coral, Stones Transported in the Roots of Trees, Great Crab, Stinging Corals, Coral-Eating Fish, Coral Formations, Lagoon Islands. Or Atolls, Depth at which reef-building corals can live, vast areas interspersed with low coral islands, subsidence of their foundations, barrier reefs, fringing reefs, conversion of fringing reefs into barrier reefs. And into atolls, evidence of changes in level, breaches in barrier reefs, Maldiva atolls. Their peculiar structure, dead and submerged reefs, areas of subsidence and elevation, distribution of volcanoes, subsidence slow, and vast in amount. April 1 is tea, we arrived in view of the Keeling or Cocos Islands, situated in the Indian Ocean, and about 600 miles distant from the coast of Sumatra. This is one of the lagoon islands, or atolls, of coral formation, similar to those in the low archipelago which we passed near. When the ship was in the channel at the entrance, Mr. Leesk, an English resident, came off in his boat. The history of the inhabitants of this place, in as few words as possible, is as follows. About nine years ago, Mr. Hare, a worthless character, brought from the East Indian archipelago a number of Malay slaves, which now including children, amount to more than a hundred. Shortly afterwards, Captain Ross, who had before visited these islands in his merchant ship, arrived from England, bringing with him his family and goods for settlement, along with him came Mr. Leesk, who had been a mate in his vessel. The Malay slaves soon ran away from the islet on which Mr. Hare was settled, and joined Captain Ross's party. Mr. 
Hare upon this was ultimately obliged to leave the place. The Malays are now nominally in a state of freedom, and certainly are so, as far as regards their personal treatment. But in most other points they are considered as slaves. From their discontented state, from the repeated removals from islet to islet, and perhaps also from a little mismanagement, things are not very prosperous. The island has no domestic quadruped, excepting the pig, and the main vegetable production is the coconut. The whole prosperity of the place depends on this tree, the only exports being oil from the nut, and the nuts themselves, which are taken to Singapore and Mauritius, where they are chiefly used. When grated, in making curries. On the coconut, also, the pigs, which are loaded with fat, almost entirely subsist, as do the ducks and poultry. Even a huge land crab is furnished by nature with the means to open and feed on this most useful production. The ring-formed reef of the lagoon island is surmounted in the greater part of its length by linear islets. On the northern or leeward side, there is an opening through which vessels can pass to the anchorage within. On entering, the scene was very curious and rather pretty. Its beauty, however, entirely depended on the brilliancy of the surrounding colors. The shallow, clear, and still water of the lagoon, resting in its greater part on white sand, is, when illumined by a vertical sun, of the most vivid green. This brilliant expanse, several miles in width, is on all sides divided, either by a line of snow-white breakers from the dark heaving waters of the ocean, or from the blue vault of heaven by the strips of land, crowned by the level tops of the coconut trees. As a white cloud here and there affords a pleasing contrast with the azure sky, so in the lagoon, bands of living coral darken the emerald green water. The next morning after anchoring, I went on shore on Direction Island. The strip of dry land is only a few hundred yards in width. On the lagoon side there is a white calcareous beach, the radiation from which under this sultry climate was very oppressive. And on the outer coast, a solid broad flat of coral rock served to break the violence of the open sea. Excepting near the lagoon, where there is some sand, the land is entirely composed of rounded fragments of coral. In such a loose, dry, stony soil, the climate of the intertropical regions alone could produce a vigorous vegetation. On some of the smaller islets, nothing could be more elegant than the manner in which the young and full-grown coconut trees, without destroying each other's symmetry, were mingled into one wood. A beach of glittering white sand formed a border to these fairy spots. I will now give a sketch of the natural history of these islands, which, from its very paucity, possesses a peculiar interest. The coconut tree, at first glance, seems to compose the whole wood, there are however, five or six other trees. One of these grows to a very large size, but from the extremes of softness of its wood, is useless, another sort affords excellent timber for shipbuilding. Besides the trees, the number of plants is exceedingly limited, and consists of insignificant weeds. In my collection, which includes, I believe, nearly the perfect flora, there are twenty species, without reckoning a moss, lichen, and fungus. To this number two trees must be added. One of which was not in flower, and the other I only heard of. The latter is a solitary tree of its kind, and grows near the beach, where, without doubt, the one seed was thrown up by the waves. A gilandina also grows on only one of the islets. I do not include in the above list the sugarcane, banana, some other vegetables, fruit trees, and imported grasses. As the islands consist entirely of coral, and at one time must have existed as mere water-washed reefs, all their terrestrial productions must have been transported here by the waves of the sea. In accordance with this, the Florula has quite the character of a refuge for the destitute, Professor Henslow informs me that of the twenty species and nineteen belong to different genera, and these again to no less than sixteen families. 163. In Holman S. 164 travels an account is given, on the authority of Mr. A. S. Keating, who resided twelve months on these islands, of the various seeds and other bodies which have been known to have been washed on shore. Seeds and plants from Sumatra and Java have been driven up by the surf on the windward side of the islands. 
Among them have been found the Kamiri, native of Sumatra and the peninsula of Malacca. The coconut of Balsai, known by its shape and size. The dadas, which is planted by the Malays with the pepper vine, the latter entwining round its trunk, and supporting itself by the prickles on its stem, the soap tree, the castor oil plant. Trunks of the sago palm, and various kinds of seeds unknown to the Malays settled on the islands. These are all supposed to have been driven by the N.W. Monsoon to the coast of New Holland, and thence to these islands by the S.E. trade wind. Large masses of java teak and yellow would have also been found, besides immense trees of red and white cedar, and the blue gumwood of New Holland, in a perfectly sound condition. All the hardy seeds, such as creepers, retain their germinating power, but the softer kinds, among which is the mangustin, are destroyed in the passage. Fishing canoes, apparently from Java, have at times been washed on shore. It is interesting thus to discover how numerous the seeds are, which, coming from several countries, are drifted over the wide ocean. Professor Henslow tells me, he believes that nearly all the plants which I brought from these islands, are common littoral species in the East Indian archipelago. From the direction, however, of the winds and currents, it seems scarcely possible that they could have come here in a direct line. If, as suggested with much probability by Mr. Keating, they were first carried towards the coast of New Holland, and thence drifted back together with the productions of that country, the seeds, before germinating, must have traveled between one. 800 and 2,400 miles. Shemiso 165 when describing the Radak archipelago, situated in the western part of the Pacific, states that, the sea brings to these islands the seeds and fruits of many trees. Most of which have yet not grown here. The greater part of these seeds appear to have not yet lost the capability of growing. It is also said that palms and bamboos from somewhere in the torrid zone, and trunks of northern firs, are washed on shore, these firs must have come from an immense distance. These facts are highly interesting. It cannot be doubted that if there were land birds to pick up the seeds when first cast on shore, and a soil better adapted for their growth than the loose blocks of coral, that the most isolated of the lagoon islands would in time possess a far more abundant flora than they now have. The list of land animals is even poorer than that of the plants. Some of the islets are inhabited by rats, which were brought in a ship from the Mauritius, wrecked here. These rats are considered by Mr. Waterhouse as identical with the English kind, but they are smaller, and more brightly colored. There are no true land birds, for a snipe and a rail, Rallus philippensis, though living entirely in the dry herbage, belong to the order of waders. Birds of this order are said to occur on several of the small low islands in the Pacific. At Ascension, where there is no land bird, a rail, Porfirio simplex, was shot near the summit of the mountain, and it was evidently a solitary straggler. At Tristan de Acunha, where, according to Carmichael, there are only two land birds, there is a coot. From these facts I believe that the waders, after the innumerable web-footed species, are generally the first colonists of small isolated islands. I may add, that whenever I noticed birds, not of oceanic species, very far out at sea, they always belonged to this order. And hence they would naturally become the earliest colonists of any remote point of land. Of reptiles I saw only one small lizard. Of insects I took pains to collect every kind. Exclusive of spiders, which were numerous, there were thirteen species.166 of these, one only was a beetle. A small ant swarmed by thousands under the loose dry blocks of coral, and was the only true insect which was abundant. Although the productions of the land are thus scanty, if we look to the waters of the surrounding sea, the number of organic beings is indeed infinite. Shimiso has described 167 the natural history of a lagoon island in the Radak archipelago, and it is remarkable how closely its inhabitants, in number and kind, resemble those of Keeling Island. There is one lizard and two waders, namely, a snipe and curlew. Of plants there are nineteen species, including a fern. And some of these are the same with those growing here, though on a spot so immensely remote, and in a different ocean. The long strips of land, 
forming the linear islets, have been raised only to that height to which the surf can throw fragments of coral, and the wind heap up calcareous sand. The solid flat of coral rock on the outside, by its breadth, breaks the first violence of the waves, which otherwise, in a day, would sweep away these islets and all their productions. The ocean and the land seem here struggling for mastery, although terra firma has obtained a footing, the denizens of the water think their claim at least equally good. In every part one meets hermit crabs of more than one species, one sixty-eight carrying on their backs the shells which they have stolen from the neighboring beach. Overhead, numerous gannets, frigate birds, and terns, rest on the trees, and the wood, from the many nests and from the smell of the atmosphere, might be called a sirookery. The gannets, sitting on their rude nests, gaze at one with a stupid yet angry air. The nodas, as their name expresses, are silly little creatures. But there is one charming bird, it is a small, snow-white tern, which smoothly hovers at the distance of a few feet above one's head, its large black eye scanning, with quiet curiosity. Your expression. Little imagination is required to fancy that so light and delicate a body must be tenanted by some wandering fairy spirit. Sunday, April 3rd. After service I accompanied Captain Fitz Roy to the settlement, situated at the distance of some miles, on the point of an islet thickly covered with tall coconut trees. Captain Ross and Mr. Leesk live in a large barn-like house open at both ends, and lined with mats made of woven bark. The houses of the Malays are arranged along the shore of the lagoon. The whole place had rather a desolate aspect, for there were no gardens to show the signs of care and cultivation. The natives belong to different islands in the East Indian archipelago, but all speak the same language, we saw the inhabitants of Borneo, Celebes, Java, and Sumatra. In color they resemble the Tahitians, from whom they do not widely differ in features. Some of the women, however, show a good deal of the Chinese character. I liked both their general expressions and the sound of their voices. They appeared poor, and their houses were destitute of furniture. But it was evident, from the plumpness of the little children, that coconuts and turtle afford no bad sustenance. On this island the wells are situated, from which ships obtain water. At first sight it appears not a little remarkable that the fresh water should regularly ebb and flow with the tides. And it has even been imagined, that sand has the power of filtering the salt from the seawater. These ebbing wells are common on some of the low islands in the West Indies. The compressed sand, or porous coral rock, is permeated like a sponge with the salt water, but the rain which falls on the surface must sink to the level of the surrounding sea, and must accumulate there, displacing an equal bulk of the salt water. As the water in the lower part of the great sponge-like coral mass rises and falls with the tides, so will the water near the surface. And this will keep fresh, if the mass be sufficiently compact to prevent much mechanical admixture. But where the land consists of great loose blocks of coral with open interstices, if a well be dug, the water, as I have seen, is brackish. After dinner we stayed to see a curious half-superstitious scene acted by the Malay women. A large wooden spoon dressed in garments, and which had been carried to the grave of a dead man, they pretend becomes inspired at the full of the moon, and will dance and jump about. After the proper preparations, the spoon, held by two women, became convulsed, and danced in good time to the song of the surrounding children and women. It was a most foolish spectacle, but Mr. Leesk maintained that many of the Malays believed in its spiritual movements. The dance did not commence till the moon had risen. And it was well worth remaining to behold her bright orb so quietly shining through the long arms of the coconut trees as they waved in the evening breeze. These scenes of the tropics are in themselves so delicious, that they almost equal those dearer ones at home, to which we are bound by each best feeling of the mind. The next day I employed myself in examining the very interesting, yet simple structure and origin of these islands. The water being unusually smooth, I waded over the outer flat of dead rock as far as the living mounds of coral, on which the swell of the open sea breaks. In some of the gullies and hollows there were beautiful green and other colored fishes, and the form and tints of many of the zoophytes were admirable. 
It is excusable to grow enthusiastic over the infinite numbers of organic beings with which the sea of the tropics, so prodigal of life, teems. Yet I must confess I think those naturalists who have described, in well-known words, the submarine grottoes decked with a thousand beauties, have indulged in rather exuberant language. April 6. I accompanied Captain Fitz Roy to an island at the head of the lagoon, the channel was exceedingly intricate, winding through fields of delicately branched corals. We saw several turtle and two boats were then employed in catching them. The water was so clear and shallow, that although at first a turtle quickly dives out of sight, yet in a canoe or boat under sail, the pursuers after no very long chase come up to it. A man standing ready in the bow, at this moment dashes through the water upon the turtle's back. Then clinging with both hands by the shell of its neck, he is carried away till the animal becomes exhausted and is secured. It was quite an interesting chase to see the two boats thus doubling about, and the men dashing head foremost into the water trying to seize their prey. Captain Moresby informs me that in the Chagos archipelago in this same ocean, the natives, by a horrible process, take the shell from the back of the living turtle. It is covered with burning charcoal, which causes the outer shell to curl upwards, it is then forced off with a knife, and before it becomes cold flattened between boards. After this barbarous process the animal is suffered to regain its native element, where, after a certain time, a new shell is formed. It is, however, too thin to be of any service, and the animal always appears languishing and sickly. When we arrived at the head of the lagoon, we crossed a narrow islet, and found a great surf breaking on the windward coast. I can hardly explain the reason, but there is to my mind much grandeur in the view of the outer shores of these lagoon islands. There is a simplicity in the barrier-like beach, the margin of green bushes and tall coconuts, the solid flat of dead coral rock, strewed here and there with great loose fragments. And the line of furious breakers, all rounding away towards either hand. The ocean throwing its waters over the broad reef appears an invincible, all-powerful enemy, yet we see it resisted, and even conquered, by means which at first seem most weak and inefficient. It is not that the ocean spares the rock of coral. The great fragments scattered over the reef, and heaped on the beach, whence the tall coconut springs, plainly bespeak the unrelenting power of the waves. Nor are any periods of repose granted. The long swell caused by the gentle but steady action of the trade wind, always blowing in one direction over a wide area, causes breakers. Almost equaling in force those during a gale of wind in the temperate regions, and which never cease to rage. It is impossible to behold these waves without feeling a conviction that an island, though built of the hardest rock, let it be porphyry, granite, or quartz would ultimately yield and be demolished by such an irresistible power. Yet these low, insignificant coral islets stand and are victorious, for here another power, as an antagonist, takes part in the contest. The organic forces separate the atoms of carbonate of lime, one by one, from the foaming breakers, and unite them into a symmetrical structure. Let the hurricane tear up its thousand huge fragments. Yet what will that tell against the accumulated labor of myriads of architects at work night and day, month after month? Thus do we see the soft and gelatinous body of a polypus, through the agency of the vital laws. Conquering the great mechanical power of the waves of an ocean which neither the art of man nor the inanimate works of nature could successfully resist. We did not return on board till late in the evening, for we stayed a long time in the lagoon, examining the fields of coral and the gigantic shells of the chama, into which. If a man were to put his hand, he would not, as long as the animal lived, be able to withdraw it. Near the head of the lagoon I was much surprised to find a wide area, considerably more than a mile square, covered with a forest of delicately branching corals, which, though standing upright, were all dead and rotten. At first I was quite at a loss to understand the cause afterwards it occurred to me that it was owing to the following rather curious combination of circumstances. It should, however, first be stated, that corals are not able to survive even a short exposure in the air to the sun's rays. So that their upward limit of growth is determined by that of lowest water at spring tides. 
It appears, from some old charts, that the Long Island to windward was formerly separated by wide channels into several islets. This fact is likewise indicated by the trees being younger on these portions. Under the former condition of the reef, a strong breeze, by throwing more water over the barrier, would tend to raise the level of the lagoon. Now it acts in a directly contrary manner. For the water within the lagoon not only is not increased by currents from the outside, but is itself blown outwards by the force of the wind. Hence it is observed, that the tide near the head of the lagoon does not rise so high during a strong breeze as it does when it is calm. This difference of level, although no doubt very small, has, I believe, caused the death of those coral groves which under the former and more open condition of the outer reef has attained the utmost possible limit of upward growth. A few miles north of Keeling there is another small atoll, the lagoon of which is nearly filled up with coral mud. Captain Ross found embedded in the conglomerate on the outer coast, a well-rounded fragment of greenstone, rather larger than a man's head, he and the men with him were so much surprised at this. That they brought it away and preserved it as a curiosity. The occurrence of this one stone, where every other particle of matter is calcareous, certainly is very puzzling. The island has scarcely ever been visited, nor is it probable that a ship had been wrecked there. From the absence of any better explanation, I came to the conclusion that it must have come entangled in the roots of some large tree, when, however, I considered the great distance from the nearest land, the combination of chances against a stone thus being entangled, the tree washed into the sea, floated so far, then landed safely. And the stone finally so embedded as to allow of its discovery, I was almost afraid of imagining a means of transport apparently so improbable. It was therefore with great interest that I found Shimiso, the justly distinguished naturalist who accompanied Kotzebue, stating that the inhabitants of the Radak Archipelago, a group of lagoon islands in the midst of the Pacific, obtained stones for sharpening their instruments by searching the roots of trees which are cast upon the beach. It will be evident that this must have happened several times, since laws have been established that such stones belong to the chief. And a punishment is inflicted on anyone who attempts to steal them. When the isolated position of these small islands in the midst of a vast ocean, their great distance from any land excepting that of coral formation, attested by the value which the inhabitants, who are such bold navigators, attached to a stone of any kind 169, and the slowness of the currents of the open sea, are all considered. The occurrence of pebbles thus transported does appear wonderful. Stones may often be thus carried. And if the island on which they are stranded is constructed of any other substance besides coral, they would scarcely attract attention, and their origin at least would never be guessed. Moreover, this agency may long escape discovery from the probability of trees, especially those loaded with stones, floating beneath the surface. In the channels of Tierra del Fuego large quantities of drift timber are cast upon the beach, yet it is extremely rare to meet a tree swimming on the water. These facts may possibly throw light on single stones, whether angular or rounded, occasionally found embedded in fine sedimentary masses. During another day I visited West Islet, on which the vegetation was perhaps more luxuriant than on any other. The coconut trees generally grow separate, but here the young ones flourished beneath their tall parents, and formed with their long and curved fronds the most shady arbors. Those alone who have tried it, know how delicious it is to be seated in such shade, and drink the cool pleasant fluid of the coconut. In this island there is a large bay-like space, composed of the finest white sand, it is quite level and is only covered by the tide at high water. From this large bay smaller creeks penetrate the surrounding woods. To see a field of glittering white sand, representing water, with the coconut trees extending their tall and waving trunks around the margin, formed a singular and very pretty view. I have before alluded to a crab which lives on the coconuts, it is very common on all parts of the dry land, and grows to a monstrous size, it is closely allied or identical with the Burgos latro. The front pair of legs terminate in very strong and heavy pincers, and the last pair are fitted with others weaker and much narrower. 
it would at first be thought quite impossible for a crab to open a strong coconut covered with the husk, but Mr. Leask assures me that he has repeatedly seen this effected. The crab begins by tearing the husk, fiber by fiber, and always from that end under which the three eye holes are situated. When this is completed, the crab commences hammering with its heavy claws on one of the eye holes till an opening is made. Then turning round its body, by the aid of its posterior and narrow pair of pincers, it extracts the white albuminous substance. I think this is as curious a case of instinct as ever I heard of, and likewise of adaptation in structure between two objects apparently so remote from each other in the scheme of nature. As a crab and a coconut tree. The Burgos is diurnal in its habits, but every night it is said to pay a visit to the sea, no doubt for the purpose of moistening its bronchi. The young are likewise hatched, and live for some time, on the coast. These crabs inhabit deep burrows, which they hollow out beneath the roots of trees. And where they accumulate surprising quantities of the picked fibers of the coconut husk, on which they rest as on a bed. The Malays sometimes take advantage of this, and collect the fibrous mass to use as junk. These crabs are very good to eat. Moreover, under the tail of the larger ones there is a mass of fat, which, when melted, sometimes yields as much as a quart bottle full of limpid oil. It has been stated by some authors that the Burgos crawls up the coconut trees for the purpose of stealing the nuts, I very much doubt the possibility of this. But with the Pandanus 170 the task would be very much easier. I was told by Mr. Leask that on these islands the Burgos lives only on the nuts which have fallen to the ground. Captain Moresby informs me that this crab inhabits the Chagos and Seychelles groups, but not the neighboring Maldiva archipelago. It formerly abounded at Mauritius, but only a few small ones are now found there. In the Pacific, this species, or one with closely allied habits, is said 171 to inhabit a single coral island, north of the society group. To show the wonderful strength of the front pair of pincers, I may mention, that Captain Moresby can find one in a strong tin box, which had held biscuits, the lid being secured with wire. But the crab turned down the edges and escaped. In turning down the edges, it actually punched many small holes quite through the tin. I was a good deal surprised by finding two species of coral of the genus Malepra, M. complanata and Alcicornis, possessed of the power of stinging. The stony branches or plates, when taken fresh from the water, have a harsh feel and are not slimy, although possessing a strong and disagreeable smell. The stinging property seems to vary in different specimens, when a piece was pressed or rubbed on the tender skin of the face or arm, a pricking sensation was usually caused, which came on after the interval of a second, and lasted only for a few minutes. One day, however, by merely touching my face with one of the branches, pain was instantaneously caused. It increased as usual after a few seconds, and remaining sharp for some minutes, was perceptible for half an hour afterwards. The sensation was as bad as that from a nettle, but more like that caused by the Fisalia or Portuguese man-of-war. Little red spots were produced on the tender skin of the arm, which appeared as if they would have formed watery pustules, but did not. M. Koi mentions this case of the Malepra and I have heard of stinging corals in the West Indies. Many marine animals seem to have this power of stinging, besides the Portuguese man-of-war, many jellyfish, and the aplysia or sea slug of the Cape de Verde Islands. It is stated in the voyage of the astrolabe, that an actinia or sea anemone, as well as a flexible coralline allied to Sertularia, both possess this means of offense or defense. In the East Indian Sea, a stinging seaweed is said to be found. Two species of fish, of the genus Scarus, which are common here, exclusively feed on coral, both are colored of a splendid bluish-green, one living invariably in the lagoon. And the other amongst the outer breakers. Mr. Leask assured us, that he had repeatedly seen whole shoals grazing with their strong bony jaws on the tops of the coral branches, I opened the intestines of several, and found them distended with yellowish calcareous sandy mud. The slimy disgusting holothurii, allied to our starfish, which the Chinese gourmands are so fond of, also feed largely, 
as I am informed by Dr. Allen, on corals. And the bony apparatus within their bodies seems well adapted for this end. These holothurii, the fish, the numerous burrowing shells, and nereidus worms, which perforate every block of dead coral, must be very efficient agents in producing the fine white mud which lies at the bottom and on the shores of the lagoon. A portion, however, of this mud, which when wet resembled pounded chalk, was found by Professor Ehrenberg to be partly composed of silicious shielded infusoria. April 12th. In the morning we stood out of the lagoon on our passage to the Isle of France. I am glad we have visited these islands, such formations surely rank high amongst the wonderful objects of this world. Captain Fitzroy found no bottom with a line 7,200 feet in length, at the distance of only 2,200 yards from the shore. Hence this island forms a lofty submarine mountain, with sides steeper even than those of the most abrupt volcanic cone. The saucer-shaped summit is nearly ten miles across. And every single atom 172 from the least particle to the largest fragment of rock, in this great pile, which however is small compared with very many other lagoon islands, bears the stamp of having been subjected to organic arrangement. We feel surprise when travelers tell us of the vast dimensions of the pyramids and other great ruins, but how utterly insignificant are the greatest of these. When compared to these mountains of stone accumulated by the agency of various minute and tender animals. This is a wonder which does not at first strike the eye of the body, but, after reflection, the eye of reason. I will now give a very brief account of the three great classes of coral reefs. Namely, atolls, barrier, and fringing reefs, and will explain my views 173 on their formation. Almost every voyager who has crossed the Pacific has expressed his unbounded astonishment at the Lagoon Islands, or as I shall for the future call them by their Indian name of atolls, and has attempted some explanation. Even as long ago as the year 1605, Pierre de Laval well exclaimed, Say un Merval de voir chacun de ces atolons, environ d'un grand banc de pierre tout autre. N.Y. Iant point d'artifice humine. The accompanying sketch of Whitsunday Island in the Pacific, copied from, Captain. Beachy's admirable voyage, gives but a faint idea of the singular aspect of an atoll, it is one of the smallest size, and has its narrow islets united together in a ring. The immensity of the ocean, the fury of the breakers, contrasted with the lowness of the land and the smoothness of the bright green water within the lagoon, can hardly be imagined without having been seen. The earlier voyagers fancied that the coral-building animals instinctively built up their great circles to afford themselves protection in the inner parts. But so far is this from the truth, that those massive kinds, to whose growth on the exposed outer shores the very existence of the reef depends, cannot live within the lagoon. Where other delicately branching kinds flourish. Moreover, on this view, many species of distinct genera and families are supposed to combine for one end, and of such a combination, not a single instance can be found in the whole of nature. The theory that has been most generally received is, that atolls are based on submarine craters. But when we consider the form and size of some, the number, proximity, and relative positions of others, this idea loses its plausible character, thus Swadiva Atoll is 44 geographical miles in diameter in one line, by 34 miles in another line. Rim Sky is 54 by 20 miles across, and it has a strangely sinuous margin, Bow Atoll is 30 miles long, and on an average only 6 in width. Menshikov Atoll consists of three atolls united or tied together. This theory, moreover, is totally inapplicable to the northern Maldiva Atolls in the Indian Ocean, one of which is 88 miles in length, and between 10 and 20 in breadth. For they are not bounded like ordinary atolls by narrow reefs, but by a vast number of separate little atolls. Other little atolls rising out of the great central lagoon-like spaces. A third and better theory was advanced by Shimiso, who thought that from the corals growing more vigorously were exposed to the open sea, as undoubtedly is the case. The outer edges would grow up from the general foundation before any other part, and that this would account for the ring or cup-shaped structure. 
But we shall immediately see, that in this, as well as in the crater theory, a most important consideration has been overlooked, namely, on what have the reef-building corals, which cannot live at a great depth, based their massive structures. Numerous soundings were carefully taken by Captain Fitzroy on the steep outside of Keeling Atoll, and it was found that within ten fathoms, the prepared tallow at the bottom of the lead invariably came up marked with the impression of living corals, but as perfectly clean as if it had been dropped on a carpet of turf. As the depth increased, the impressions became less numerous, but the adhering particles of sand more and more numerous. Until at last it was evident that the bottom consisted of a smooth sandy layer, to carry on the analogy of the turf, the blades of grass grew thinner and thinner. Till at last the soil was so sterile, that nothing sprang from it. From these observations, confirmed by many others, it may be safely inferred that the utmost depth at which corals can construct reefs is between 20 and 30 fathoms. Now there are enormous areas in the Pacific and Indian Ocean, in which every single island is of coral formation, and is raised only to that height to which the waves can throw up fragments. And the winds pile up sand. Thus Radak group of atolls is an irregular square, 520 miles long and 240 broad. The low archipelago is elliptic formed, 840 miles in its longer, and 420 in its shorter axis, there are other small groups and single low islands between these two archipelagos. Making a linear space of ocean actually more than 4,000 miles in length, in which not one single island rises above the specified height. Again, in the Indian Ocean there is a space of ocean 1,500 miles in length, including three archipelagos, in which every island is low and of coral formation. From the fact of the reef building corals and not living at great depths, it is absolutely certain that throughout these vast areas, wherever there is now an atoll, a foundation must have originally existed within a depth of from 20 to 30 fathoms from the surface. It is improbable in the highest degree that broad, lofty, isolated, steep-sided banks of sediment, arranged in groups and lines hundreds of leagues in length, could have been deposited in the central and profoundest parts of the Pacific and Indian Oceans, at an immense distance from any continent, and where the water is perfectly limpid. It is equally improbable that the elevatory forces should have uplifted throughout the above vast areas, innumerable great rocky banks within 20 to 30 fathoms, or 120 to 180 feet of the surface of the sea, and not one single point above that level. For where on the whole surface of the globe can we find a single chain of mountains, even a few hundred miles in length, with their many summits rising within a few feet of a given level, and not one pinnacle above it? If then the foundations, whence the atoll building coral sprang, were not formed of sediment, and if they were not lifted up to the required level, they must of necessity have subsided into it. And this at once solves the difficulty. For as mountain after mountain, and island after island, slowly sank beneath the water, fresh bases would be successively afforded for the growth of the corals. It is impossible here to enter into all the necessary details. But I venture to defy 174 anyone to explain in any other manner how it is possible that numerous islands should be distributed throughout vast areas, all the islands being low, all being built of corals. Absolutely requiring a foundation within a limited depth from the surface. Before explaining how atoll formed reefs acquire their peculiar structure, we must turn to the second great class, namely, barrier reefs. These either extend in straight lines in front of the shores of a continent or of a large island, or they encircle smaller islands. In both cases, being separated from the land by a broad and rather deep channel of water, analogous to the lagoon within an atoll. It is remarkable how little attention has been paid to encircling barrier reefs, yet they are truly wonderful structures. The following sketch represents part of the barrier encircling the island of Balabala in the Pacific, as seen from one of the central peaks. In this instance the whole line of reef has been converted into land. But usually a snow-white line of great breakers, with only here and there a single low islet crowned with coconut trees. Divides the dark heaving waters of the ocean from the light green expanse of the lagoon channel. 
and the quiet waters of this channel generally bathe a fringe of low alluvial soil, loaded with the most beautiful productions of the tropics, and lying at the foot of the wild, abrupt central mountains. Encircling barrier reefs are of all sizes, from 3 miles to no less than 44 miles in diameter. And that which fronts one side, and encircles both ends, of New Caledonia, is 400 miles long. Each reef includes one, two, or several rocky islands of various heights. And in one instance, even as many as 12 separate islands. The reef runs at a greater or less distance from the included land, in the Society Archipelago generally from 1 to 3 or 4 miles. But at Hogoliu the reef is 20 miles on the southern side, and 14 miles on the opposite or northern side, from the included islands. The depth within the lagoon channel also varies much. From 10 to 30 fathoms may be taken as an average, but at Vanikoro there are spaces no less than 56 fathoms or 363 feet deep. Internally the reef either slopes gently into the lagoon channel, or ends in a perpendicular wall sometimes between 2 and 300 feet underwater in height, externally the reef rises. Like an atoll, with extreme abruptness out of the profound depths of the ocean. What can be more singular than these structures? We see an island, which may be compared to a castle situated on the summit of a lofty submarine mountain, protected by a great wall of coral rock, always steep externally and sometimes internally. With a broad level summit, here and there breached by a narrow gateway, through which the largest ships can enter the wide and deep encircling moat. As far as the actual reef of coral is concerned, there is not the smallest difference, in general size, outline, grouping, and even in quite trifling details of structure. Between a barrier and an atoll. The geographer Balbi has well remarked, that an encircled island is an atoll with high land rising out of its lagoon, remove the land from within, and a perfect atoll is left. But what has caused these reefs to spring up at such great distances from the shores of the included islands? It cannot be that the corals will not grow close to the land. For the shores within the lagoon channel, when not surrounded by alluvial soil, are often fringed by living reefs. And we shall presently see that there is a whole class, which I have called fringing reefs from their close attachment to the shores both of continents and of islands. Again, on what have the reef-building corals, which cannot live at great depths, based their encircling structures? This is a great apparent difficulty, analogous to that in the case of atolls, which has generally been overlooked. It will be perceived more clearly by inspecting the following sections which are real ones, taken in north and south lines, through the islands with their barrier reefs, of Vanikoro, Gambir, and Marua. And they are laid down, both vertically and horizontally, on the same scale of a quarter of an inch to a mile. 1. Vanikoro. 2. Gambir Islands. 3. Marua. The horizontal shading shows the barrier reefs and lagoon channels. The inclined shading above the level of the sea, A, shows the actual form of the land. The inclined shading below this line shows its probable prolongation under water. It should be observed that the sections might have been taken in any direction through these islands, or through many other encircled islands, and the general features would have been the same. Now, bearing in mind that reef-building coral cannot live at a greater depth than from 20 to 30 fathoms, and that the scale is so small that the plummets on the right hand show a depth of 200 fathoms, on what are these barrier reefs based? Are we to suppose that each island is surrounded by a collar-like submarine ledge of rock, or by a great bank of sediment, ending abruptly where the reef ends? If the sea had formerly eaten deeply into the islands, before they were protected by the reefs, thus having left a shallow ledge round them underwater, the present shores would have been invariably bounded by great precipices, but this is most rarely the case. Moreover, on this notion, it is not possible to explain why the corals should have sprung up, like a wall, from the extreme outer margin of the ledge, often leaving a broad space of water within. Too deep for the growth of corals. The accumulation of a wide bank of sediment all round these islands, and generally widest ere the included islands are smallest, is highly improbable. 
considering their exposed positions in the central and deepest parts of the ocean. In the case of the barrier reef of New Caledonia, which extends for 150 miles beyond the northern point of the islands, in the same straight line with which it fronts the west coast. It is hardly possible to believe that a bank of sediment could thus have been straightly deposited in front of a lofty island, and so far beyond its termination in the open sea. Finally, if we look to other oceanic islands of about the same height and of similar geological constitution, but not encircled by coral reefs. We may in vain search for so trifling a circumambient depth as thirty fathoms, except quite near to their shores. For usually land that rises abruptly out of water, as do most of the encircled and non-encircled oceanic islands, plunges abruptly under it. On what then, I repeat, are these barrier reefs based? Why, with their wide and deep moat-like channels, do they stand so far from the included land? We shall soon see how easily these difficulties disappear. We come now to our third class of fringing reefs, which will require a very short notice. Where the land slopes abruptly under water, these reefs are only a few yards in width. Forming a mere ribbon or fringe round the shores, where the land slopes gently under the water the reef extends further, sometimes even as much as a mile from the land. But in such cases the soundings outside the reef always show that the submarine prolongation of the land is gently inclined. In fact, the reefs extend only to that distance from the shore, at which a foundation within the requisite depth from twenty to thirty fathoms is found. As far as the actual reef is concerned, there is no essential difference between it and that forming a barrier or an atoll, it is, however, generally of less width and consequently few islets have been formed on it. From the corals growing more vigorously on the outside, and from the noxious effect of the sediment washed inwards, the outer edge of the reef is the highest part. And between it and the land there is generally a shallow sandy channel a few feet in depth. Where banks or sediments have accumulated near to the surface, as in parts of the West Indies, they sometimes become fringed with corals, and hence in some degree resemble lagoon islands or atolls. In the same manner as fringing reefs, surrounding gently sloping islands, in some degree resemble barrier reefs. A. A. Outer edges of the fringing reef, at the level of the sea. B. B. The shores of the fringed island. A. A. Outer edges of the reef, after its upward growth during a period of subsidence, now converted into a barrier, with islets on it. B. B. The shores of the now encircled island. C. C. Lagoon Channel. N. B. In this and the following woodcut, the subsidence of the land could be represented only by an apparent rise in the level of the sea. No theory on the formation of coral reefs can be considered satisfactory which does not include the three great classes. We have seen that we are driven to believe in the subsidence of those vast areas, interspersed with low islands. Of which not one rises above the height to which the wind and waves can throw up matter, and yet are constructed by animals requiring a foundation, and that foundation to lie at no great depth. Let us then take an island surrounded by fringing reefs, which offer no difficulty in their structure. And let this island with its reefs, represented by the unbroken lines in the woodcut, slowly subside. Now, as the island sinks down, either a few feet at a time or quite insensibly, we may safely infer, from what is known of the conditions favorable to the growth of coral, that the living masses, bathed by the surf on the margin of the reef, will soon regain the surface. The water, however, will encroach little by little on the shore, the island becoming lower and smaller, and the space between the inner edge of the reef and the beach proportionately broader. A section of the reef and island in this state, after a subsidence of several hundred feet, is given by the dotted lines. Coral islets are supposed to have been formed on the reef. And a ship is anchored in the lagoon channel. This channel will be more or less deep, according to the rate of subsidence, to the amount of sediment accumulated in it, and to the growth of the delicately branched corals which can live there. The section in this state resembles in every respect one drawn through an encircled island, in fact, it is a real section, on the scale of 0.517 of an inch to a mile, through Bolabola in the Pacific. 
We can now at once see why encircling barrier reefs stand so far from the shores which they front. We can also perceive, that a line drawn perpendicularly down from the outer edge of the new reef, to the foundation of solid rock beneath the old fringing reef, will exceed by as many feet as there have been feet of subsidence, that small limit of depth at which the effective corals can live, the little architects having built up their great wall-like mass. As the whole sank down, upon a basis formed of other corals and their consolidated fragments. Thus the difficulty on this head, which appeared so great, disappears. If, instead of an island, we had taken the shore of a continent fringed with reefs, and had imagined it to have subsided, a great straight barrier, like that of Australia or New Caledonia, separated from the land by a wide and deep channel, would evidently have been the result. A. A. Outer edges of the barrier reef at the level of the sea, with islets on it. B. B. The shores of the included island. C. C. The lagoon channel. A. A. Outer edges of the reef, now converted into an atoll. C. The lagoon of the new atoll. N. B. According to the true scale, the depths of the lagoon channel and lagoon are much exaggerated. Let us take our new encircling barrier reef, of which the section is now represented by unbroken lines, and which, as I have said, is a real section through Balabala, and let it go on subsiding. As the barrier reef slowly sinks down, the corals will go on vigorously growing upwards. But as the island sinks, the water will gain inch by inch on the shore, the separate mountains first forming separate islands within one great reef, and finally, the last and highest pinnacle disappearing. The instant this takes place, a perfect atoll is formed, I have said, remove the high land from within an encircling barrier reef, and an atoll is left, and the land has been removed. We can now perceive how it comes that atolls, having sprung from encircling barrier reefs, resemble them in general size, form, in the manner in which they are grouped together, and in their arrangement in single or double lines. For they may be called rude outline charts of the sunken islands over which they stand. We can further see how it arises that the atolls in the Pacific and Indian Oceans extend in lines parallel to the generally prevailing strike of the high islands and great coastlines of those oceans. I venture, therefore, to affirm, that on the theory of the upward growth of the corals during the sinking of the land 175 all the leading features in those wonderful structures. The lagoon islands or atolls, which have so long excited the attention of voyagers, as well as in the no less wonderful barrier reefs. Whether encircling small islands or stretching for hundreds of miles along the shores of a continent, are simply explained. It may be asked, whether I can offer any direct evidence of the subsidence of barrier reefs or atolls. But it must be borne in mind how difficult it must ever be to detect a movement, the tendency of which is to hide under water the part affected. Nevertheless, at Keeling Atoll I observed on all sides of the lagoon old coconut trees undermined and falling. And in one place the foundation posts of a shed, which the inhabitants asserted had stood seven years before just above high water mark. But now was daily washed by every tide, on inquiry I found that three earthquakes, one of them severe, had been felt here during the last ten years. At Vanikoro, the lagoon channel is remarkably deep, scarcely any alluvial soil has accumulated at the foot of the lofty included mountains. And remarkably few islets have been formed by the heaping of fragments and sand on the wall-like barrier reef. These facts, and some analogous ones, led me to believe that this island must lately have subsided and the reef grown upwards, here again earthquakes are frequent and very severe. In the Society Archipelago, on the other hand, where the lagoon channels are almost choked up, where much low alluvial land has accumulated, and where in some cases long islets have been formed on the barrier reefs, facts all showing that the islands have not very lately subsided, only feeble shocks are most rarely felt. In these coral formations, where the land and water seem struggling for mastery, it must be ever difficult to decide between the effects of a change in the set of the tides and of a slight subsidence, that many of these reefs and atolls are subject to changes of some kind is certain. 
On some atolls the islets appear to have increased greatly within a late period, on others they have been partially or wholly washed away. The inhabitants of parts of the Maldiva archipelago know the date of the first formation of some islets. In other parts, the corals are now flourishing on water-washed reefs, where holes made for graves attest the former existence of inhabited land. It is difficult to believe in frequent changes in the tidal currents of an open ocean. Whereas, we have in the earthquakes recorded by the natives on some atolls, and in the great fissures observed on other atolls. Plain evidence of changes and disturbances in progress in the subterranean regions. It is evident, on our theory, that coasts merely fringed by reefs cannot have subsided to any perceptible amount. And therefore they must, since the growth of their corals, either have remained stationary or have been upheaved. Now, it is remarkable how generally it can be shown, by the presence of upraised organic remains, that the fringed islands have been elevated, and so far. This is indirect evidence in favor of our theory. I was particularly struck with this fact, when I found, to my surprise, that the descriptions given by M. M. Quoi and Gaymard were applicable, not to reefs in general as implied by them, but only to those of the fringing class. My surprise, however, ceased when I afterwards found that, by a strange chance, all the several islands visited by these eminent naturalists could be shown by their own statements to have been elevated within a recent geological era. Not only the grand features in the structure of barrier reefs and of atolls, and to their likeness to each other in form, size, and other characters, are explained on the theory of subsidence, which theory we are independently forced to admit in the very areas in question. From the necessity of finding bases for the corals within the requisite depth, but many details in structure and exceptional cases can thus also be simply explained. I will give only a few instances. In barrier reefs it has long been remarked with surprise, that the passages through the reef exactly face valleys in the included land. Even in cases where the reef is separated from the land by a lagoon channel so wide and so much deeper than the actual passage itself that it seems hardly possible that the very small quantity of water or sediment brought down could injure the corals on the reef. Now, every reef of the fringing class is breached by a narrow gateway in front of the smallest rivulet, even if dry during the greater part of the year, for the mud, sand, or gravel. Occasionally washed down kills the corals on which it is deposited. Consequently, when an island thus fringed subsides, though most of the narrow gateways will probably become closed by the outward and upward growth of the corals. Yet any that are not closed, and some must always be kept open by the sediment and impure water flowing out of the lagoon channel, will still continue to front exactly the upper parts of those valleys, at the mouths of which the original basal fringing reef was breached. We can easily see how an island fronted only on one side, or on one side with one end or both ends encircled by barrier reefs, might after long continued subsidence be converted either into a single wall like reef, or into an atoll with a great straight spur projecting from it, or into two or three atolls tied together by straight reefs, all of which exceptional cases actually occur. As the reef building corals require food, are preyed upon by other animals, are killed by sediment, cannot adhere to a loose bottom and may be easily carried down to a depth whence they cannot spring up again, we need feel no surprise at the reefs both of atolls and barriers becoming in parts imperfect. The great barrier of New Caledonia is thus imperfect and broken in many parts. Hence, after long subsidence, this great reef would not produce one great atoll 400 miles in length, but a chain or archipelago of atolls of very nearly the same dimension with those in the Maldiva archipelago. Moreover, in an atoll once breached on opposite sides, from the likelihood of the oceanic and tidal currents passing straight through the breaches, it is extremely improbable that the corals, especially during continued subsidence, would ever be able again to unite the rim. If they did not, as the whole sank downwards, one atoll would be divided into two or more. In the Maldiva archipelago there are distinct atolls so related to each other in position, and separated by channels either unfathomable or very deep, 
the channel between Ross and Ari Atolls is 150 fathoms, and that between the North and South Nilandu Atolls is 200 fathoms in depth. That it is impossible to look at a map of them without believing that they were once more intimately related. And in this same archipelago, Malos Madu Atoll is divided by a bifurcating channel from 100 to 132 fathoms in depth, in such a manner that it is scarcely possible to say whether it ought strictly to be called three separate atolls, or one great atoll not yet finally divided. I will not enter on many more details. But I must remark that the curious structure of the northern Maldiva atolls receives, taking into consideration the free entrance of the sea through their broken margins, a simple explanation in the upward and outward growth of the corals. Originally based both on small detached reefs in their lagoons, such as occur in common atolls, and on broken portions of the linear marginal reef, such as bounds every atoll of the ordinary form. I cannot refrain from once again remarking on the singularity of these complex structures, a great sandy and generally concave disk rises abruptly from the unfathomable ocean. With its central expanse studded, and its edge symmetrically bordered with oval basins of coral rock just lipping the surface of the sea, sometimes clothed with vegetation and each containing a lake of clear water. One more point in detail, as in the two neighboring archipelagos corals flourish in one and not in the other, and as so many conditions before enumerated must affect their existence. It would be an inexplicable fact if, during the changes to which earth, air, and water are subjected, the reef-building corals were to keep alive for perpetuity on any one spot or area. And as by our theory the areas including atolls and barrier reefs are subsiding, we ought occasionally to find reefs both dead and submerged. In all reefs, owing to the sediment being washed out of the lagoon channel to leeward, that side is least favorable to the long-continued vigorous growth of the corals. Hence dead portions of reef not unfrequently occur on the leeward side. And these, though still retaining their proper wall-like form, are now in several instances sunk several fathoms beneath the surface. The Chagos group appears from some cause, possibly from the subsidence having been too rapid. At present to be much less favorably circumstanced for the growth of reefs than formerly, one atoll has a portion of its marginal reef, nine miles in length, dead and submerged. A second has only a few quite small living points which rise to the surface, a third and fourth are entirely dead and submerged a fifth is a mere wreck, with its structure almost obliterated. It is remarkable that in all these cases, the dead reefs and portions of reef lie at nearly the same depth, namely, from six to eight fathoms beneath the surface. As if they had been carried down by one uniform movement. One of these, half-drowned atolls, so called by Captain. Moresby, to whom I am indebted for much invaluable information, is of vast size, namely, 90 nautical miles across in one direction, and 70 miles in another line. And is in many respects eminently curious. As by our theory it follows that new atolls will generally be formed in each new area of subsidence, two weighty objections might have been raised, namely. That atolls must be increasing indefinitely in number. And secondly, that in old areas of subsidence each separate atoll must be increasing indefinitely in thickness, if proofs of their occasional destruction could not have been adduced. Thus have we traced the history of these great rings of coral rock, from their first origin through their normal changes, and through the occasional accidents of their existence. To their death and final obliteration. In my volume on coral formations I have published a map, in which I have colored all the atolls dark blue, the barrier reefs pale blue, and the fringing reefs red. These latter reefs have been formed whilst the land has been stationary, or, as appears from the frequent presence of upraised organic remains. Whilst it has been slowly rising, atolls and barrier reefs, on the other hand, have grown up during the directly opposite movement of subsidence, which movement must have been very gradual. And in the case of atolls so vast in amount as to have buried every mountain summit over wide ocean spaces. Now in this map we see that the reefs tinted pale and dark blue, which have been produced by the same order of movement, as a general rule manifestly stand near each other. Again we see, that the areas with the two blue tints are of wide extent. 
and that they lie separate from extensive lines of coast-colored red, both of which circumstances might naturally have been inferred. On the theory of the nature of the reefs having been governed by the nature of the Earth's movement. It deserves notice that in more than one instance where single red and blue circles approach near each other, I can show that there have been oscillations of level. For in such cases the red or fringed circles consist of atolls, originally by our theory formed during subsidence, but subsequently upheaved. And on the other hand, some of the pale blue or encircled islands are composed of coral rock, which must have been uplifted to its present height before that subsidence took place. During which the existing barrier reefs grew upwards. Authors have noticed with surprise, that although atolls are the commonest coral structures throughout some enormous oceanic tracts, they are entirely absent in other seas. As in the West Indies, we can now at once perceive the cause, for where there has not been subsidence, atolls cannot have been formed. And in the case of the West Indies and parts of the East Indies, these tracts are known to have been rising within the recent period. The larger areas, colored red and blue, are all elongated. And between the two colors there is a degree of rude alternation, as if the rising of one had balanced the sinking of the other. Taking into consideration the proofs of recent elevation both on the fringed coasts and on some others, for instance, in South America, where there are no reefs. We are led to conclude that the great continents are for the most part rising areas, and from the nature of the coral reefs, that the central parts of the great oceans are sinking areas. The East Indian archipelago, the most broken land in the world, is in most parts an area of elevation, but surrounded and penetrated, probably in more lines than one, by narrow areas of subsidence. I have marked with vermilion spots all the many known active volcanoes within the limits of this same map. Their entire absence from every one of the great subsiding areas, colored either pale or dark blue, is most striking and not less so is the coincidence of the chief volcanic chains with the parts colored red, which we are led to conclude have either long remained stationary, or more generally have been recently appraised. Although a few of the vermilion spots occur within no great distance of single circles tinted blue, yet not one single active volcano is situated within several hundred miles of an archipelago, or even small group of atolls. It is, therefore, a striking fact that in the friendly archipelago, which consists of a group of atolls upheaved and since partially worn down, two volcanoes, and perhaps more, are historically known to have been in action. On the other hand, although most of the islands in the Pacific which are encircled by barrier reefs, are of volcanic origin, often with the remnants of craters still distinguishable. Not one of them is known to have ever been in eruption. Hence in these cases it would appear, that volcanoes burst forth into action and become extinguished on the same spots, accordingly as elevatory or subsiding movements prevail there. Numberless facts could be adduced to prove that appraised organic remains are common wherever there are active volcanoes. But until it could be shown that in areas of subsidence, volcanoes were either absent or inactive, the inference, however probable in itself, that their distribution depended on the rising or falling of the Earth's surface, would have been hazardous. But now, I think, we may freely admit this important deduction. Taking a final view of the map, and bearing in mind the statements made with respect to the upraised organic remains, we must feel astonished at the vastness of the areas, which have suffered changes in level either downwards or upwards, within a period not geologically remote. It would appear also, that the elevatory and subsiding movements follow nearly the same laws. Throughout the spaces interspersed with atolls, where not a single peak of high land has been left above the level of the sea, the sinking must have been immense in amount. The sinking, moreover, whether continuous, or recurrent with intervals sufficiently long for the corals again to bring up their living edifices to the surface, must necessarily have been extremely slow. This conclusion is probably the most important one which can be deduced from the study of coral formations. And it is one which it is difficult to imagine how otherwise could ever have been arrived at. Nor can I quite pass over the probability of the former existence of large archipelagos of lofty islands, where now only rings of coral rock scarcely break the open expanse of the sea. 
throwing some light on the distribution of the inhabitants of the other high islands, now left standing so immensely remote from each other in the midst of the great oceans. The reef-constructing corals have indeed reared and preserved wonderful memorials of the subterranean oscillations of level. We see in each barrier reef a proof that the land has there subsided, and in each atoll a monument over an island now lost. We may thus, like unto a geologist who had lived his ten thousand years and kept a record of the passing changes, gain some insight into the great system by which the surface of this globe has been broken up, and land and water interchanged. Chapter 21 Mauritius to England Mauritius, beautiful appearance of, great crateriform ring of mountains, Hindus, St. Helena, history of the changes in the vegetation, cause of the extinction of land shells, ascension, variation in the imported rats, volcanic bombs, beds of infusoria, Bahia, Brazil, splendor of tropical scenery, Pernambuco, singular reef, slavery, return to England, retrospect on our voyage. April 29 th, in the morning we passed round the northern end of Mauritius, or the Isle of France. From this point of view the aspect of the island equaled the expectations raised by the many well-known descriptions of its beautiful scenery. The sloping plain of the Pamplemousses, interspersed with houses, and colored by the large fields of sugarcane of a bright green, composed the foreground. The brilliancy of the green was the more remarkable because it is a color which generally is conspicuous only from a very short distance. Towards the center of the island groups of wooded mountains rose out of this highly cultivated plain. Their summits, as so commonly happens with ancient volcanic rocks, being jagged into the sharpest points. Masses of white clouds were collected around these pinnacles, as if for the sake of pleasing the stranger's eye. The whole island, with its sloping border and central mountains, was adorned with an air of perfect elegance, the scenery, if I may use such an expression, appeared to the sight harmonious. I spent the greater part of the next day in walking about the town and visiting different people. The town is of considerable size, and is said to contain twenty thousand inhabitants. The streets are very clean and regular. Although the island has been so many years under the English government, the general character of the place is quite French, Englishmen speak to their servants in French. And the shops are all French. Indeed, I should think that Calais or Boulogne was much more Anglified. There is a very pretty little theatre, in which operas are excellently performed. We were also surprised at seeing large booksellers' shops, with well-stored shelves, music and reading bespeak our approach to the old world of civilization. For in truth both Australia and America are new worlds. The various races of men walking in the streets afford the most interesting spectacle in Port Louis. Convicts from India are banished here for life, at present there are about 800, and they are employed in various public works. Before seeing these people, I had no idea that the inhabitants of India were such noble-looking figures. Their skin is extremely dark, and many of the older men had large mustaches and beards of a snow-white color, this, together with the fire of their expression, gave them quite an imposing aspect. The greater number had been banished for murder and the worst crimes. Others for causes which can scarcely be considered as moral faults, such as for not obeying, from superstitious motives, the English laws. These men are generally quiet and well-conducted. From their outward conduct, their cleanliness, and faithful observance of their strange religious rites. It was impossible to look at them with the same eyes as on our wretched convicts in New South Wales. May 1 St. Sunday. I took a quiet walk along the seacoast to the north of the town. The plain in this part is quite uncultivated. It consists of a field of black lava, smoothed over with coarse grass and bushes, the latter being chiefly mimosas. The scenery may be described as intermediate in character between that of the Galapagos and of Tahiti, but this will convey a definite idea to very few persons. It is a very pleasant country, but it has not the charms of Tahiti, or the grandeur of Brazil. The next day I ascended La Pousse, a mountain so called from a thumb-like projection, which rises close behind the town to a height of 2,600 feet. 
The center of the island consists of a great platform, surrounded by old broken basaltic mountains, with their strata dipping seawards. The central platform, formed of comparatively recent streams of lava, is of an oval shape, 13 geographical miles across, in the line of its shorter axis. The exterior bounding mountains come into that class of structures called craters of elevation, which are supposed to have been formed not like ordinary craters, but by a great and sudden upheaval. There appears to me to be insuperable objections to this view, on the other hand, I can hardly believe, in this and in some other cases, that these marginal crateriform mountains are merely the basal remnants of immense volcanoes, of which the summits either have been blown off, or swallowed up in subterranean abysses. From our elevated position we enjoyed an excellent view over the island. The country on this side appears pretty well cultivated, being divided into fields and studded with farmhouses. I was, however, assured that of the whole land, not more than half is yet in a productive state. If such be the case, considering the present large export of sugar, this island, at some future period when thickly peopled, will be of great value. Since England has taken possession of it, a period of only twenty-five years, the export of sugar is said to have increased seventy-five-fold. One great cause of its prosperity is the excellent state of the roads. In the neighboring Isle of Bourbon, which remains under the French government, the roads are still in the same miserable state as they were here only a few years ago. Although the French residents must have largely profited by the increased prosperity of their island, yet the English government is far from popular. Third. In the evening Captain Lloyd, the surveyor-general, so well known from his examination of the Isthmus of Panama, invited Mr. Stokes and myself to his country house, which is situated on the edge of Wilhelm Plains, and about six miles from the port. We stayed at this delightful place two days. Standing nearly eight hundred feet above the sea, the air was cool and fresh, and on every side there were delightful walks. Close by, a grand ravine has been worn to a depth of about five hundred feet through the slightly inclined streams of lava, which have flowed from the central platform. Fifth. Captain Lloyd took us to the Riviere Noire, which is several miles to the southward, that I might examine some rocks of elevated coral. We passed through pleasant gardens, and fine fields of sugarcane growing amidst huge blocks of lava. The roads were bordered by hedges of mimosa, and near many of the houses there were avenues of the mango. Some of the views, where the peaked hills and the cultivated farms were seen together, were exceedingly picturesque. And we were constantly tempted to exclaim, how pleasant it would be to pass one's life in such quiet abodes. Captain Lloyd possessed an elephant, and he sent it halfway with us, that we might enjoy a ride in true Indian fashion. The circumstance which surprised me most was its quite noiseless step. This elephant is the only one at present on the island, but it is said others will be sent for. May 9th. We sailed from Port Louis, and, calling at the Cape of Good Hope, on the 8th of July, we arrived off St. Helena. This island, the forbidding aspect of which has been so often described, rises abruptly like a huge black castle from the ocean. Near the town, as if to complete nature's defense, small forts and guns fill up every gap in the rugged rocks. The town runs up a flat and narrow valley. The houses look respectable, and are interspersed with a very few green trees. When approaching the anchorage there was one striking view, an irregular castle perched on the summit of a lofty hill, and surrounded by a few scattered fir trees, boldly projected against the sky. The next day I obtained lodgings within a stone's throw of Napoleon's tomb, 176 It was a capital central situation, whence I could make excursions in every direction. During the four days I stayed here, I wandered over the island from morning to night, and examined its geological history. My lodgings were situated at a height of about 2,000 feet. Here the weather was cold and boisterous, with constant showers of rain, and every now and then the whole scene was veiled in thick clouds. Near the coast the rough lava is quite bare, in the central and higher parts, feldspathic rocks by their decomposition have produced a clayey soil, which, were not covered by vegetation, is stained in broad bands of many bright colors. At this season, 
the land moistened by constant showers, produces a singularly bright green pasture, which lower and lower down, gradually fades away and at last disappears. In latitude 16 degrees, and at the trifling elevation of 1,500 feet, it is surprising to behold a vegetation possessing a character decidedly British. The hills are crowned with irregular plantations of Scotch firs, and the sloping banks are thickly scattered over with thickets of gorse, covered with its bright yellow flowers. Weeping willows are common on the banks of the rivulets, and the hedges are made of the blackberry, producing its well-known fruit. When we consider that the number of plants now found on the island is 746, and that out of these 52 alone are indigenous species, the rest having been imported, and most of them from England. We see the reason of the British character of the vegetation. Many of these English plants appear to flourish better than in their native country, some also from the opposite quarter of Australia succeed remarkably well. The many imported species must have destroyed some of the native kinds, and it is only on the highest and steepest ridges that the indigenous flora is now predominant. The English, or rather Welsh character of the scenery, is kept up by the numerous cottages and small white houses. Some buried at the bottom of the deepest valleys, and others mounted on the crests of the lofty hills. Some of the views are striking, for instance that from near Sir W. Dufton's house, where the bold peak called Lot is seen over a dark wood of firs, the whole being backed by the red water-worn mountains of the southern coast. On viewing the island from an eminence, the first circumstance which strikes one, is the number of the roads and forts, the labor bestowed on the public works. If one forgets its character as a prison, seems out of all proportion to its extent or value. There is so little level or useful land, that it seems surprising how so many people, about five thousand, can subsist here. The lower orders, or the emancipated slaves, are I believe extremely poor, they complain of the want of work. From the reduction in the number of public servants owing to the island having been given up by the East Indian Company, and the consequent emigration of many of the richer people. The poverty probably will increase. The chief food of the working class is rice with a little salt meat. As neither of these articles are the products of the island, but must be purchased with money, the low wages tell heavily on the poor people. Now that the people are blessed with freedom, a right which I believe they value fully, it seems probable that their numbers will quickly increase, if so, what is to become of the little state of St. Helena? My guide was an elderly man, who had been a goatherd when a boy, and knew every step amongst the rocks. He was of a race many times crossed, and although with a dusky skin, he had not the disagreeable expression of a mulatto. He was a very civil, quiet old man, and such appears the character of the greater number of the lower classes. It was strange to my ears to hear a man, nearly white and respectably dressed, talking with indifference of the times when he was a slave. With my companion, who carried our dinners in a horn of water, which is quite necessary, as all the water in the lower valleys is saline, I every day took long walks. Beneath the upper and central green circle, the wild valleys are quite desolate and untenanted. Here, to the geologist, there were scenes of high interest, showing successive changes and complicated disturbances. According to my views, St. Helena has existed as an island from a very remote epoch, some obscure proofs, however, of the elevation of the land are still extant. I believe that the central and highest peaks form parts of the rim of a great crater, the southern half of which has been entirely removed by the waves of the sea, there is, moreover, an external wall of black basaltic rocks, like the coast mountains of Mauritius, which are older than the central volcanic streams. On the higher parts of the island, considerable numbers of a shell, long thought to be a marine species occur embedded in the soil. It proved to be a coclagena, or land shell of a very peculiar form, 177 with it I found six other kinds, and in another spot an eighth species. It is remarkable that none of them are now found living. Their extinction has probably been caused by the entire destruction of the woods, and the consequent loss of food and shelter, which occurred during the early part of the last century. The history of the changes, which the elevated plains of Longwood and Deadwood have undergone, 
as given in General Beetson's account of the island, is extremely curious. Both plains, it is said in former times were covered with wood, and were therefore called the Great Wood. So late as the year 1716 there were many trees, but in 1724 the old trees had mostly fallen. And as goats and hogs had been suffered to range about, all the young trees had been killed. It appears also from the official records, that the trees were unexpectedly, some years afterwards, succeeded by a wire grass which spread over the whole surface. 178 General Beetson adds that now this plain is covered with fine sward, and is become the finest piece of pasture on the island. The extent of surface, probably covered by wood at a former period, is estimated at no less than 2,000 acres, at the present day scarcely a single tree can be found there. It is also said that in 1709 there were quantities of dead trees in Sandy Bay. This place is now so utterly desert, that nothing but so well attested an account could have made me believe that they could ever have grown there. The fact, that the goats and hogs destroyed all the young trees as they sprang up, and that in the course of time the old ones, which were safe from their attacks, perished from age. Seems clearly made out. Goats were introduced in the year 1502, 86 years afterwards, in the time of Cavendish, it is known that they were exceedingly numerous. More than a century afterwards, in 1731, when the evil was complete and irretrievable, an order was issued that all stray animals should be destroyed. It is very interesting thus to find, that the arrival of animals at Asti. Helena in 1501, did not change the whole aspect of the island, until a period of 220 years had elapsed, for the goats were introduced in 1502. And in 1724 it is said, the old trees had mostly fallen. There can be little doubt that this great change in the vegetation affected not only the land shells, causing eight species to become extinct, but likewise a multitude of insects. St. Helena, situated so remote from any continent, in the midst of a great ocean, and possessing a unique flora, excites our curiosity. The eight land shells, though now extinct, and one living succinia, are peculiar species found nowhere else. Mr. Cumming, however, informs me that an English helix is common here, its eggs no doubt having been imported in some of the many introduced plants. Mr. Cumming collected on the coast sixteen species of seashells, of which seven, as far as he knows, are confined to this island. Birds and insects, 179 as might have been expected, are very few in number. Indeed I believe all the birds have been introduced within late years. Partridges and pheasants are tolerably abundant, the island is much too English not to be subject to strict game laws. I was told of a more unjust sacrifice to such ordinances than I ever heard of even in England. The poor people formerly used to burn a plant, which grows on the coast rocks, and export the soda from its ashes. But a peremptory order came out prohibiting this practice, and giving as a reason that the partridges would have nowhere to build. In my walks I passed more than once over the grassy plain bounded by deep valleys, on which Longwood stands. Viewed from a short distance, it appears like a respectable gentleman's country seat. In front there are a few cultivated fields, and beyond them the smooth hill of colored rocks called the flagstaff, and the rugged square black mass of the barn. On the whole the view was rather bleak and uninteresting. The only inconvenience I suffered during my walks was from the impetuous winds. One day I noticed a curious circumstance. Standing on the edge of a plain, terminated by a great cliff of about a thousand feet in depth, I saw at the distance of a few yards right to windward, some turn. Struggling against a very strong breeze, whilst, where I stood, the air was quite calm. Approaching close to the brink, where the current seemed to be deflected upwards from the face of the cliff, I stretched out my arm. And immediately felt the full force of the wind, an invisible barrier, two yards in width, separated perfectly calm air from a strong blast. I so much enjoyed my rambles among the rocks and mountains of St. Helena, that I felt almost sorry on the morning of the 14th to descend to the town. Before noon I was on board, and the Beagle made sail. On the 19th of July we reached Ascension. 
those who have beheld a volcanic island, situated under an arid climate, will at once be able to picture to themselves the appearance of ascension. They will imagine smooth conical hills of a bright red color, with their summits generally truncated, rising separately out of a level surface of black rugged lava. A principal mound in the center of the island, seems the father of the lesser cones. It is called Green Hill, its name being taken from the faintest tinge of that color, which at this time of the year is barely perceptible from the anchorage. To complete the desolate scene, the black rocks on the coast are lashed by a wild and turbulent sea. The settlement is near the beach. It consists of several houses and barracks placed irregularly, but well built of white freestone. The only inhabitants are marines, and some negroes liberated from slave ships, who are paid and victualled by government. There is not a private person on the island. Many of the marines appeared well contented with their situation, they think it better to serve their one and twenty years on shore, let it be what it may, than in a ship. In this choice, if I were a marine, should most heartily agree. The next morning I ascended Green Hill, 2,840 feet high, and thence walked across the island to the windward point. A good cart road leads from the coast settlement to the houses, gardens, and fields, placed near the summit of the central mountain. On the roadside there are milestones, and likewise cisterns, where each thirsty passerby can drink some good water. Similar care is displayed in each part of the establishment, and especially in the management of the springs. So that a single drop of water may not be lost, indeed the whole island may be compared to a huge ship kept in first-rate order. I could not help, when admiring the active industry, which had created such effects out of such means, at the same time regretting that it had been wasted on so poor and trifling an end. M. Lesson has remarked with justice, that the English nation would have thought of making the island of Ascension a productive spot, any other people would have held it as a mere fortress in the ocean. Near this coast nothing grows, further inland, an occasional green castor oil plant, and a few grasshoppers, true friends of the desert, may be met with. Some grass is scattered over the surface of the central elevated region, and the whole much resembles the worst parts of the Welsh mountains. But scanty as the pasture appears, about six hundred sheep, many goats, a few cows and horses, all thrive well on it. Of native animals, land crabs and rats swarm in numbers. Whether the rat is really indigenous, may well be doubted, there are two varieties as described by Mr. Waterhouse. One is of a black color, with fine glossy fur, and lives on the grassy summit, the other is brown-colored and less glossy, with longer hairs, and lives near the settlement on the coast. Both these varieties are one-third smaller than the common black rat, M. ratus, and they differ from it both in the color and character of their fur, but in no other essential respect. I can hardly doubt that these rats, like the common mouse, which has also run wild, have been imported, and, as at the Galapagos, have varied from the effect of the new conditions to which they have been exposed, hence the variety on the summit of the island differs from that on the coast. Of native birds there are none, but the guinea fowl, imported from the Cape de Verde Islands, is abundant, and the common fowl has likewise run wild. Some cats, which were originally turned out to destroy the rats and mice, have increased, so as to become a great plague. The island is entirely without trees, in which, and in every other respect, it is very far inferior to St. Helena. One of my excursions took me towards the S.W. extremity of the island. The day was clear and hot, and I saw the island, not smiling with beauty, but staring with naked hideousness. The lava streams are covered with hummocks, and are rugged to a degree which, geologically speaking, is not of easy explanation. The intervening spaces are concealed with layers of pumice, ashes and volcanic tuff. Whilst passing this end of the island at sea, I could not imagine what the white patches were with which the whole plain was mottled. I now found that they were sea fowl, sleeping in such full confidence, that even in midday a man could walk up and seize hold of them. These birds were the only living creatures I saw during the whole day. On the beach a great surf, although the breeze was light, came tumbling over the broken lava rocks. 
The geology of this island is in many respects interesting. In several places I noticed volcanic bombs, that is, masses of lava which have been shot through the air whilst fluid, and have consequently assumed a spherical or pear shape. Not only their external form, but, in several cases, their internal structure shows in a very curious manner that they have revolved in their aerial course. The internal structure of one of these bombs, when broken, is represented very accurately in the woodcut. The central part is coarsely cellular, the cells decreasing in size towards the exterior. Where there is a shell-like case about the third of an inch in thickness, of compact stone, which again is overlaid by the outside crust of finely cellular lava. I think there can be little doubt, first that the external crust cooled rapidly in the state in which we now see it. Secondly, that the still fluid lava within, was packed by the centrifugal force, generated by the revolving of the bomb, against the external cooled crust, and so produced the solid shell of stone. And lastly, that the centrifugal force, by relieving the pressure in the more central parts of the bomb, allowed the heated vapors to expand their cells. Thus forming the coarse cellular mass of the center. A hill, formed of the older series of volcanic rocks, and which has been incorrectly considered as the crater of a volcano, is remarkable from its broad, slightly hollowed, and circular summit having been filled up with many successive layers of ashes and fine scoriae. These saucer-shaped layers crop out on the margin, forming perfect rings of many different colors, giving to the summit a most fantastic appearance. One of these rings is white and broad, and resembles a course round which horses have been exercised, hence the hill has been called the Devil's Riding School. I brought away specimens of one of the tefacious layers of a pinkish color and it is a most extraordinary fact. That Professor Ehrenberg 180 finds it almost wholly composed of matter which has been organized, he detects in it some silicious shielded freshwater infusoria. And no less than 25 different kinds of the silicious tissue of plants, chiefly of grasses. From the absence of all carbonaceous matter, Professor Ehrenberg believes that these organic bodies have passed through the volcanic fire, and have been erupted in the state in which we now see them. The appearance of the layers induced me to believe that they had been deposited under water, though from the extreme dryness of the climate I was forced to imagine. That torrents of rain had probably fallen during some great eruption, and that thus a temporary lake had been formed into which the ashes fell. But it may now be suspected that the lake was not a temporary one. Anyhow, we may feel sure, that at some former epoch the climate and productions of ascension were very different from what they now are. Where on the face of the earth can we find a spot, on which close investigation will not discover signs of that endless cycle of change, to which this earth has been, is, and will be subjected? On leaving Ascension, we sailed for Bahia, on the coast of Brazil, in order to complete the chronometrical measurement of the world. We arrived there on August 1, and stayed four days, during which I took several long walks. I was glad to find my enjoyment in tropical scenery had not decreased from the want of novelty, even in the slightest degree. The elements of the scenery are so simple, that they are worth mentioning, as a proof on what trifling circumstances exquisite natural beauty depends. The country may be described as a level plain of about 300 feet in elevation, which in all parts has been worn into flat-bottomed valleys. This structure is remarkable in a granitic land, but is nearly universal in all those softer formations of which plains are usually composed. The whole surface is covered by various kinds of stately trees, interspersed with patches of cultivated ground, out of which houses, convents, and chapels arise. It must be remembered that within the tropics, the wild luxuriance of nature is not lost even in the vicinity of large cities, for the natural vegetation of the hedges and hillsides overpowers in picturesque effect the artificial labor of man. Hence, there are only a few spots where the bright red soil affords a strong contrast with the universal clothing of green. From the edges of the plain there are distant views either of the ocean, or of the great bay with its low wooded shores, and on which numerous boats and canoes show their white sails. Excepting from these points, the scene is extremely limited, following the level pathways, on each hand, only glimpses into the wooded valleys below can be obtained. 
The houses I may add, and especially the sacred edifices, are built in a peculiar and rather fantastic style of architecture. They are all whitewashed. So that when illumined by the brilliant sun of midday, and as seen against the pale blue sky of the horizon, they stand out more like shadows than real buildings. Such are the elements of the scenery, but it is a hopeless attempt to paint the general effect. Learned naturalists describe these scenes of the tropics by naming a multitude of objects and mentioning some characteristic feature of each. To a learned traveler this possibly may communicate some definite ideas, but who else from seeing a plant in an herbarium can imagine its appearance when growing in its native soil? Who from seeing choice plants in a hothouse, can magnify some into the dimensions of forest trees, and crowd others into an entangled jungle? Who when examining in the cabinet of the entomologist the gay exotic butterflies, and singular cicadas, will associate with these lifeless objects, the ceaseless harsh music of the latter. And the lazy flight of the former, the sure accompaniments of the still, glowing noonday of the tropics? It is when the sun has attained its greatest height, that such scenes should be viewed, then the dense splendid foliage of the mango hides the ground with its darkest shade. Whilst the upper branches are rendered from the profusion of light of the most brilliant green. In the temperate zones the case is different, the vegetation there is not so dark or so rich, and hence the rays of the declining sun, tinged of a red, purple, or bright yellow color. Add most to the beauties of those climes. When quietly walking along the shady pathways, and admiring each successive view, I wish to find language to express my ideas. Epithet after epithet was found too weak to convey to those who have not visited the intertropical regions, the sensation of delight which the mind experiences. I have said that the plants in a hothouse fail to communicate a just idea of the vegetation, yet I must recur to it. The land is one great wild, untidy, luxuriant hothouse, made by nature for herself, but taken possession of by man, who has studded it with gay houses and formal gardens. How great would be the desire in every admirer of nature to behold, if such were possible, the scenery of another planet. Yet to every person in Europe, it may be truly said, that at the distance of only a few degrees from his native soil, the glories of another world are open to him. In my last walk I stopped again and again to gaze on these beauties, and endeavored to fix in my mind forever, an impression which at the time I knew sooner or later must fail. The form of the orange tree, the coconut, the palm, the mango, the tree fern, the banana, will remain clear and separate. But the thousand beauties which unite these into one perfect scene must fade away, yet they will leave, like a tale heard in childhood, a picture full of indistinct, but most beautiful figures. August 60th, in the afternoon we stood out to sea, with the intention of making a direct course to the Cape de Verde Islands. Unfavorable winds, however, delayed us, and on the 12th we ran into Pernambuco, a large city on the coast of Brazil, in latitude 8 degrees south. We anchored outside the reef. But in a short time a pilot came on board and took us into the inner harbor, where we lay close to the town. Pernambuco is built on some narrow and low sandbanks, which are separated from each other by shoal channels of salt water. The three parts of the town are connected together by two long bridges built on wooden piles. The town is in all parts disgusting, the streets being narrow, ill-paved, and filthy. The houses, tall and gloomy. The season of heavy rains had hardly come to an end, and hence the surrounding country, which is scarcely raised above the level of the sea, was flooded with water. And I failed in all my attempts to take walks. The flat swampy land on which Pernambuco stands is surrounded, at the distance of a few miles, by a semicircle of low hills. Or rather by the edge of a country elevated perhaps 200 feet above the sea. The old city of Olinda stands on one extremity of this range. One day I took a canoe, and proceeded up one of the channels to visit it. I found the old town from its situation both sweeter and cleaner than that of Pernambuco. I must here commemorate what happened for the first time during our nearly five years wandering, namely, having met with a want of politeness. I was refused in a sullen manner at two different houses, and obtained with difficulty from a third, 
permission to pass through their gardens to an uncultivated hill. For the purpose of viewing the country. I feel glad that this happened in the land of the Brazilians, for I bear them no good will, a land also of slavery, and therefore of moral debasement. A Spaniard would have felt ashamed at the very thought of refusing such a request, or of behaving to a stranger with rudeness. The channel by which we went to and returned from Olinda, was bordered on each side by mangroves, which sprang like a miniature forest out of the greasy mud banks. The bright green color of these bushes always reminded me of the rank grass in a churchyard, both are nourished by putrid exhalations. The one speaks of death past, and the other too often of death to come. The most curious object which I saw in this neighborhood, was the reef that forms the harbor. I doubt whether in the whole world any other natural structure has so artificial an appearance. 181 It runs for a length of several miles in an absolutely straight line, parallel to, and not far distant from, the shore. It varies in width from 30 to 60 yards, and its surface is level and smooth, it is composed of obscurely stratified hard sandstone. At high water the waves break over it. At low water its summit is left dry, and it might then be mistaken for a breakwater erected by Cyclopean workmen. On this coast the currents of the sea tend to throw up in front of the land, long spits and bars of loose sand, and on one of these, part of the town of Pernambuco stands. In former times a long spit of this nature seems to have become consolidated by the percolation of calcareous matter, and afterwards to have been gradually upheaved. The outer and loose parts during this process having been worn away by the action of the sea, and the solid nucleus left as we now see it. Although night and day the waves of the open Atlantic, turbid with sediment, are driven against the steep outside edges of this wall of stone. Yet the oldest pilots know of no tradition of any change in its appearance. This durability is much the most curious fact in its history, it is due to a tough layer, a few inches thick, of calcareous matter. Wholly formed by the successive growth and death of the small shells of serpuli, together with some few barnacles and nulliperi. These nulliperi, which are hard, very simply organized sea plants, play an analogous and important part in protecting the upper surfaces of coral reefs, behind and within the breakers. Where the true corals, during the outward growth of the mass, become killed by exposure to the sun and air. These insignificant organic beings, especially the serpuli, have done good service to the people of Pernambuco. For without their protective aid the bar of sandstone would inevitably have been long ago worn away and without the bar, there would have been no harbor. On the 19th of August we finally left the shores of Brazil. I thank God, I shall never again visit a slave country. To this day, if I hear a distant scream, it recalls with painful vividness my feelings, when passing a house near Pernambuco, I heard the most pitiable moans. And could not but suspect that some poor slave was being tortured, yet knew that I was as powerless as a child even to remonstrate. I suspected that these moans were from a tortured slave, for I was told that this was the case in another instance. Near Rio de Janeiro I lived opposite to an old lady, who kept screws to crush the fingers of her female slaves. I have stayed in a house where a young household mulatto, daily and hourly, was reviled, beaten, and persecuted enough to break the spirit of the lowest animal. I have seen a little boy, six or seven years old, struck thrice with a horsewhip, before I could interfere, on his naked head, for having handed me a glass of water not quite clean. I saw his father tremble at a mere glance from his master's eye. These latter cruelties were witnessed by me in a Spanish colony, in which it has always been said, that slaves are better treated than by the Portuguese, English or other European nations. I have seen at Rio de Janeiro a powerful negro afraid to ward off a blow directed, as he thought, at his face. I was present when a kind-hearted man was on the point of separating forever the men, women, and little children of a large number of families who had long lived together. I will not even allude to the many heart-sickening atrocities which I authentically heard of. Nor would I have mentioned the above revolting details, had I not met with several people, so blinded by the constitutional gaiety of the Negro as to speak of slavery as a tolerable evil. 
Such people have generally visited at the houses of the upper classes, where the domestic slaves are usually well treated, and they have not, like myself, lived amongst the lower classes. Such inquirers will ask slaves about their condition, they forget that the slave must indeed be dull, who does not calculate on the chance of his answer reaching his master's ears. It is argued that self-interest will prevent excessive cruelty. As if self-interest protected our domestic animals, which are far less likely than degraded slaves, to stir up the rage of their savage masters. It is an argument long since protested against with noble feeling, and strikingly exemplified, by the ever-illustrious Humboldt. It is often attempted to palliate slavery by comparing the state of slaves with our poorer countrymen, if the misery of our poor be caused not by the laws of nature, but by our institutions. Great is our sin. But how this bears on slavery, I cannot see, as well might the use of the thumbscrew be defended in one land, by showing that men in another land suffered from some dreadful disease. Those who look tenderly at the slave owner, and with a cold heart at the slave, never seem to put themselves into the position of the latter. What a cheerless prospect, with not even a hope of change. Picture to yourself the chance, ever hanging over you. Of your wife and your little children, those objects which nature urges even the slave to call his own, being torn from you and sold like beasts to the first bidder. And these deeds are done and palliated by men, who profess to love their neighbors as themselves, who believe in God, and pray that his will be done on earth. It makes one's blood boil, yet heart tremble, to think that we Englishmen and our American descendants, with their boastful cry of liberty, have been and are so guilty, but it is a consolation to reflect, that we at least have made a greater sacrifice, than ever made by any nation, to expiate our sin. On the last day of August we anchored for the second time at Porto Praia in the Cape de Verde archipelago, thence we proceeded to the Azores, where we stayed six days. On the 2nd of October we made the shore, of England, and at Falmouth I left the Beagle, having lived on board the good little vessel nearly five years. Our voyage having come to an end, I will take a short retrospect of the advantages and disadvantages, the pains and pleasures, of our circumnavigation of the world. If a person asked my advice, before undertaking a long voyage, my answer would depend upon his possessing a decided taste for some branch of knowledge, which could by this means be advanced. No doubt it is a high satisfaction to behold various countries and the many races of mankind, but the pleasures gained at the time do not counterbalance the evils. It is necessary to look forward to a harvest, however distant that may be, when some fruit will be reaped, some good effected. Many of the losses which must be experienced are obvious. Such as that of the society of every old friend, and of the sight of those places with which every dearest remembrance is so intimately connected. These losses, however, are at the time partly relieved by the exhaustless delight of anticipating the long-wished-for day of return. If, as poets say, life is a dream, I am sure in a voyage these are the visions which best serve to pass away the long night. Other losses, although not at first felt, tell heavily after a period, these are the want of room, of seclusion, of rest, the jading feeling of constant hurry. The privation of small luxuries, the loss of domestic society and even of music and the other pleasures of imagination. When such trifles are mentioned, it is evident that the real grievances, excepting from accidents, of a sea life are at an end. The short space of sixty years has made an astonishing difference in the facility of distant navigation. Even in the time of Cook, a man who left his fireside for such expeditions underwent severe privations. A yacht now, with every luxury of life, can circumnavigate the globe. Besides the vast improvements in ships and naval resources, the whole western shores of America are thrown open, and Australia has become the capital of a rising continent. How different are the circumstances to a man shipwrecked at the present day in the Pacific, to what they were in the time of Cook? Since his voyage a hemisphere has been added to the civilized world. If a person suffer much from seasickness, let him weigh it heavily in the balance. I speak from experience, it is no trifling evil, cured in a week. If, on the other hand, he take pleasure in naval tactics, he will assuredly have full scope for his taste. 
but it must be borne in mind, how large a proportion of the time, during a long voyage, is spent on the water, as compared with the days in harbor. And what are the boasted glories of the illimitable ocean? A tedious waste, a desert of water, as the Arabian calls it. No doubt there are some delightful scenes. A moonlight night, with the clear heavens and the dark glittering sea, and the white sails filled by the soft air of a gently blowing trade wind, a dead calm. With the heaving surface polished like a mirror, and all still except the occasional flapping of the canvas. It is well once to behold a squall with its rising arch and coming fury, or the heavy gale of wind and mountainous waves. I confess, however, my imagination had painted something more grand, more terrific in the full-grown storm. It is an incomparably finer spectacle when beheld on shore, where the waving trees, the wild flight of the birds, the dark shadows and bright lights. The rushing of the torrents all proclaim the strife of the unloosed elements. At sea the albatross and little petrel fly as if the storm were their proper sphere, the water rises and sinks as if fulfilling its usual task. The ship alone and its inhabitants seem the objects of wrath. On a forlorn and weather-beaten coast, the scene is indeed different, but the feelings partake more of horror than of wild delight. Let us now look at the brighter side of the pastime. The pleasure derived from beholding the scenery and the general aspect of the various countries we have visited, has decidedly been the most constant and highest source of enjoyment. It is probable that the picturesque beauty of many parts of Europe exceeds anything which we beheld. But there is a growing pleasure in comparing the character of the scenery in different countries, which to a certain degree is distinct from merely admiring its beauty. It depends chiefly on an acquaintance with the individual parts of each view. I am strongly induced to believe that as in music, the person who understands every note will, if he also possesses a proper taste, more thoroughly enjoy the whole. So he who examines each part of a fine view, may also thoroughly comprehend the full and combined effect. Hence, a traveler should be a botanist, for in all views plants form the chief embellishment. Group masses of naked rock, even in the wildest forms, and they may for a time afford a sublime spectacle, but they will soon grow monotonous. Paint them with bright and varied colors, as in northern Chile, they will become fantastic, clothe them with vegetation, they must form a decent, if not a beautiful picture. When I say that the scenery of parts of Europe is probably superior to anything which we beheld, I accept, as a class by itself, that of the intertropical zones. The two classes cannot be compared together, but I have already often enlarged on the grandeur of those regions. As the force of impressions generally depends on preconceived ideas, I may add, that mine were taken from the vivid descriptions in the personal narrative of Humboldt which far exceed in merit anything else which I have read. Yet with these high-wrought ideas, my feelings were far from partaking of a tinge of disappointment on my first and final landing on the shores of Brazil. Among the scenes which are deeply impressed on my mind, none exceed in sublimity the primeval forests undefaced by the hand of man. Whether those of Brazil, where the powers of life are predominant, or those of Tierra del Fuego, where death and decay prevail. Both are temples filled with the varied productions of the God of nature, no one can stand in these solitudes unmoved, and not feel that there is more in man than the mere breath of his body. In calling up images of the past, I find that the plains of Patagonia frequently cross before my eyes, yet these plains are pronounced by all wretched and useless. They can be described only by negative characters, without habitations, without water, without trees, without mountains, they support merely a few dwarf plants. Why, then, and the case is not peculiar to myself, have these arid wastes taken so firm a hold on my memory? Why have not the still more level, the greener and more fertile pampas, which are serviceable to mankind, produced an equal impression? I can scarcely analyze these feelings, but it must be partly owing to the free scope given to the imagination. The plains of Patagonia are boundless, for they are scarcely passable, and hence unknown, they bear the stamp of having lasted, as they are now, for ages. And there appears no limit to their duration through future time. If, as the ancients supposed, the flat earth was surrounded by an impassable breadth of water, 
or by deserts heated to an intolerable excess. Who would not look at these last boundaries to man's knowledge with deep but ill-defined sensations? Lastly, of natural scenery, the views from lofty mountains, through certainly in one sense not beautiful, are very memorable. When looking down from the highest crest of the Cordillera, the mind, undisturbed by minute details, was filled with the stupendous dimensions of the surrounding masses. Of individual objects, perhaps nothing is more certain to create astonishment than the first sight in his native haunt of a barbarian, of man in his lowest and most savage state. One's mind hurries back over past centuries, and then asks, could our progenitors have been men like these? Men, whose very signs and expressions are less intelligible to us than those of the domesticated animals. Men, who do not possess the instinct of those animals, nor yet appear to boast of human reason, or at least of arts consequent on that reason. I do not believe it is possible to describe or paint the difference between savage and civilized man. It is the difference between a wild and tame animal, and part of the interest in beholding a savage, is the same which would lead everyone to desire to see the lion in his desert. The tiger tearing his prey in the jungle, or the rhinoceros wandering over the wild plains of Africa. Among the other most remarkable spectacles which we have beheld, may be ranked, the Southern Cross, the Cloud of Magellan. And the other constellations of the Southern Hemisphere, the waterspout, the glacier leading its blue stream of ice. Overhanging the sea in a bold precipice, a lagoon island raised by the reef-building corals, an active volcano, and the overwhelming effects of a violent earthquake. These latter phenomena, perhaps, possess for me a peculiar interest, from their intimate connection with the geological structure of the world. The earthquake, however, must be to everyone a most impressive event, the earth, considered from our earliest childhood as the type of solidity, has oscillated like a thin crust beneath our feet. And in seeing the labored works of man in a moment overthrown, we feel the insignificance of his boasted power. It has been said, that the love of the chase is an inherent delight in man, a relic of an instinctive passion. If so, I am sure the pleasure of living in the open air, with the sky for a roof and the ground for a table, is part of the same feeling, it is the savage returning to his wild and native habits. I always look back to our boat cruises, and my land journeys, when through unfrequented countries, with an extreme delight, which no scenes of civilization could have created. I do not doubt that every traveler must remember the glowing sense of happiness which he experienced, when he first breathed in a foreign clime, where the civilized man had seldom or never trod. There are several other sources of enjoyment in a long voyage, which are of a more reasonable nature. The map of the world ceases to be a blank. It becomes a picture full of the most varied and animated figures. Each part assumes its proper dimensions, continents are not looked at in the light of islands, or islands considered as mere specks, which are, in truth, larger than many kingdoms of Europe. Africa, or North and South America, are well-sounding names, and easily pronounced. But it is not until having sailed for weeks along small portions of their shores, that one is thoroughly convinced what vast spaces on our immense world these names imply. From seeing the present state, it is impossible not to look forward with high expectations to the future progress of nearly an entire hemisphere. The march of improvement, consequent on the introduction of Christianity throughout the South Sea, probably stands by itself in the records of history. It is the more striking when we remember that only sixty years since, Cook, whose excellent judgment none will dispute, could foresee no prospect of a change. Yet these changes have now been effected by the philanthropic spirit of the British nation. In the same quarter of the globe Australia is rising, or indeed may be said to have risen, into a grand centre of civilization, which, at some not very remote period, will rule as empress over the southern hemisphere. It is impossible for an Englishman to behold these distant colonies, without a high pride and satisfaction. To hoist the British flag, seems to draw with it as a certain consequence, wealth, prosperity, and civilization. In conclusion, it appears to me that nothing can be more improving to a young naturalist, than a journey in distant countries. It both sharpens, and partly allays that want and craving, 
which, as Sir J. Herschel remarks, a man experiences although every corporeal sense be fully satisfied. The excitement from the novelty of objects, and the chance of success, stimulate him to increased activity. Moreover, as a number of isolated facts soon become uninteresting, the habit of comparison leads to generalization. On the other hand, as the traveler stays but a short time in each place, his descriptions must generally consist of mere sketches, instead of detailed observations. Hence arises, as I have found to my cost, a constant tendency to fill up the wide gaps of knowledge, by inaccurate and superficial hypotheses. But I have too deeply enjoyed the voyage, not to recommend any naturalist, although he must not expect to be so fortunate in his companions as I have been, to take all chances, and to start. On travels by land if possible, if otherwise, on a long voyage. He may feel assured, he will meet with no difficulties or dangers, excepting in rare cases, nearly so bad as he beforehand anticipates. In a moral point of view, the effect ought to be, to teach him good-humored patience, freedom from selfishness, the habit of acting for himself, and of making the best of every occurrence. In short, he ought to partake of the characteristic qualities of most sailors. Traveling ought also to teach him distrust. But at the same time he will discover, how many truly kind-hearted people there are, with whom he never before had, or ever again will have any further communication. Who yet are ready to offer him the most disinterested assistance?